Section 1 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story A History of the World in Story, Song, and Art. Volume 15 The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 1 The Cathedral at Reims. Photograph Frontispiece. Next to the invasion of Belgium and the sinking of the Lusitania, no single act of the Germans has so aroused the world as the bombardments of the cathedral at Reims, one of the noblest monuments of civilization. Its state in 1917, after nearly three years of bombardment, was thus described by Grace Ellery Channing in the Boston Transcript. I had never seen the cathedral itself and it so swept over me in its battered beauty and the glory of its soaring façade that for an instant it blotted the german out there then it stood the thing of wonder the thing which had stood through centuries and their wars untouched unharmed hands of many dead masters had lifted it up into the air and wrought upon it until it had become one of the most eloquent expressions of the dumb soul of man of that wonderful animal man the touching witness to that in man which no other animal has history religion art all were inscribed here it was one of the sacred stone books of the world and seven centuries think of it had so held it had passed over it with all their tumults their conflicts their crimes and left it still sacred and then think that to-day in the twentieth century in an age which abhors war as an idea in times grown humane, a country more than most enlightened, whose banner word is culture, has fired upon Reims Cathedral, not once, not through some passionate and desperate and desperately disavowed error of an underling, but again and again, and yet again, and is firing still. Nothing but the formidable strength of its masonry has kept the great monument standing till now all about it are the ruins of walls only a little less massive shells have struck and dented and broken the cathedral but it still stands how much more it can stand architects perhaps know there must be a limit of resistance apparently there is none of bombardment the very day after our visit reims was shelled again it has been shelled every few days since end of section one this recording is in the public domain Section 2 of The World War. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The World War, Part 1. The Origin of the War. Historical Note. It is easy to state the main facts concerning the immediate occasions of the war and describe the actual events which led to it, but the question of premeditated causes is complicated and difficult. A Bosnian student assassinated the heir to the throne of Austria Hungary, June 28th. 1914 at sarajevo bosnia austria sent a series of demands to serbia july twenty third and these demands were met as fully as possible by serbia austria was not prepared to accept any reply short of absolute surrender and was apparently awaiting a pretext to make war accordingly war was declared july twenty eighth and hostilities began at once on the face of it the war was merely local but it immediately enlarged from a contest between a large nation and a small one into the greatest conflict between leading european nations which history has seen the apparently simple origin of the war is complicated by any number of official documents which throw light on the action of the nations which so swiftly mobilized opinions on the significance of these official communications will long differ the first need is intelligent reading of the main facts showing how the austro-serbian war began what efforts were made to limit hostilities to the two countries most directly concerned how and why belgium was invaded why england declared war and why the war took precisely the course it followed it will then be possible to pass from the question of the mere cause of the war to an interpretation of the motives involved in the international conflict one cannot correctly explain the origin of the war without also judging the nations in the light of actual methods pursued and deeds done the results may then show more plainly than the actual occasions 
what nation or nations originated the war as the war has gone on from year to year it has become more evident to all that some of the nations were not only poorly prepared but without desire for war it has become no less clear that in other quarters plans for such a war had been long in process End of section two. This recording is in the public domain. Section three of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume fifteen. The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section three. The Outbreak of Hostilities by Major F. E. Wheaton To every foreign office in Europe, that portion of the continent, known by the general title of the Balkans, had long been the subject of uneasy speculation. It had gained for itself such appellations as Thundercloud, Volcano, Danger Spot, and Magazine, and one fraction of it, Bosnia, was to show that such reputation was not undeserved. That state had been handed over to Austria for administration after the Russo-Turkish War, and in 1908 was definitely annexed, the action of Austria being theatrically supported by Germany in the face of the joint protests of England, France and Russia. Six years later, the spark was lit in Bosnia, which set all Europe ablaze. The population of Bosnia is overwhelmingly Slav both in race and in sympathy, but by a regrettable imprudence, the visit of the Archduke was allowed to coincide with the celebration of an anniversary sacred to Slav national feeling. Whether it was this blunder that cost the heir apparent his life is not certain, but at any rate, the Archduke and his wife who had accompanied him, were within a few hours assassinated by a Bosnian student. The thrill of horror which ran through Europe soon subsided, and at first the tragedy seemed destined to be but a nine days' wonder. But in the weeks which followed, Austria, convinced that the outrage was the outcome of anti-Austrian intrigue in Serbia, was busily formulating her demands and presented them on July the 23rd. The terms of the ultimatum were harsh in the extreme, and in her distress Serbia had recourse to Russia, the traditional protector of Slav peoples. On the advice of her ally, Serbia forwarded her reply within the 48 hours allowed, accepting the demands with but two reservations, Austria's answer was to recall her ambassador, and two days later, she declared war on Serbia. The fact that Europe was grouped by treaties into what were practically two armed camps was sufficient to set the machinery of diplomacy working at full pressure throughout the continent and to cause the other powers to stand at once on the alert. Russia was disinclined to stand aside and witness the humiliation of her protégé by Austria and France was bound to stand by Russia, although her direct interests in Serbia were infinitesimal. On the other side, Germany and Italy were leagued with Austria by the terms of the Triple Alliance. Five great powers were thus immediately confronted with the possibility of war. England was bound to neither side, but she did not fail to take an important precautionary step which circumstances rendered possible. A test mobilization of the Third Fleet had been carried out on July the 15th, and a few days later the First, Second and Third Fleets had assembled at Spithead for inspection by the King. Thence, the various squadrons proceeded to sea for tactical exercises which terminated on July the 24th. It had been arranged that manoeuvre leave should now be granted to the First Fleet. But at midnight, 26th, 27th, this was cancelled by the Admiralty, and the Navy was ordered to stand fast, and England was thus enabled to watch the course of events in comparative security. 
On Wednesday, the 29th of July, the political tension of Europe had almost reached breaking point. Austria was, indeed, actually at war with Serbia and was bombarding the Serbian capital, Belgrade. England had dispatched part of her navy to sea while holding all her squadrons in home waters in a state of instant readiness. But there was nothing aggressive in her action, for her foreign secretary was making superhuman efforts to induce the great powers to summon a conference to mediate in the Austro-Serbian quarrel. Belgium, unfortunately caught in the middle of army reorganization, was hurriedly preparing herself for eventualities by mobilization. Germany had recalled her high seas fleet. German troops in Metz had been pushed forward to the frontier. And the German people were withdrawing their deposits from the savings banks in considerable haste. Russia had ordered the mobilization of her southern armies. France was anxiously inquiring of England what the action of the latter would be in case of a general conflagration. On the following day, the British Foreign Secretary made fresh proposals for a European Council, but war loomed appreciably nearer every hour. Germany demanded that Russia should stop the mobilization of her forces, to which Russia replied that such step was technically impossible, and therein the German emperor proclaimed a period of national danger. In England, it was recognized that the gravity of the situation demanded every military precaution. All officers and men of the regular army who were absent from their units were recalled by telegraph, while units in training areas were directed to return at once to their mobilization centers. On the 31st of July, the Foreign Secretary telegraphed to the French and German governments asking whether they would respect the neutrality of Belgium, provided it were not violated by another power. France gave the required assurance. Germany did not reply. Austria had now issued orders for general mobilization. Belgium followed suit. The general anxiety had by this reached Holland and a complete mobilization of her forces was decreed. Switzerland was preparing to resist any violation of her neutrality. These were happenings ominous enough for one day, but graver news was yet to follow. Late in the evening, the French ambassador was informed by his government that French territory had been penetrated by German patrols. These were, however, but the warnings of the tempest. The storm burst on the evening of Saturday, August the 1st. About five o'clock, Germany declared war on Russia. Orders were issued for a general mobilization of the German army, and similar instructions were promulgated in France. Money, always sensitive to political shock, reflected the magnitude of the disaster. In England, the markets went to pieces, the bank rate rose to 10%, and the London Stock Exchange was closed. On Sunday, the 2nd of August, a German force, comprised chiefly of some of the covering troops from Koblenz, advanced on Luxembourg. This Grand Duchy, about the size of an English county, had been declared neutral territory by a treaty of 1867. The object of the movement was to seize the railways running through the state toward France and to utilize them for the movement of German troops. At the same time, three German army corps were moved toward the frontier at Aix-la-Chapelle, ready for an advance through Belgium. There, the war office was laboring in frantic haste to place the country in a state of defense, and 30,000 navies had all day been digging trenches round Liège. About seven o'clock in the evening, a note was presented by Germany. If German troops were allowed to pass through Belgium without molestation, her independence would be guaranteed by Germany, and the latter country would indemnify Belgium for all damage. The German government asked for an answer within 12 hours. Some hours before this demand was made, England had assured France that, 
Should the German fleet undertake hostile operations against the French coast or shipping, the British Navy would render France every assistance in its power. The naval reserves were called up in the United Kingdom, and orders were issued by the military authorities for the precautionary period to begin. Troops were dispatched to supplement the garrisons of coast defences, important bridges, tunnels, etc., upon the lines of railway were placed under guard, and the cable offices of the kingdom were submitted to military censorship and control. During the day, German troops definitely invaded France, for bodies of troops larger than mere reconnoitring patrols entered the country and penetrated several miles into the interior. These forces entered at seven different places between Longvie and the Vosges. The French had withdrawn all troops ten kilometers from the frontiers in order to render it clear that Germany was the aggressor. On the eastern front, Germany had followed up her declaration of war with Russia by moving troops across the Polish frontier and seizing three towns on a front of a hundred miles, while at sea a German cruiser ineffectually bombarded the Russian port of Libau. At 4 a.m. on Monday, the 3rd of August, the Belgian government issued a dispatch refusing the German offer, and during the day, the King of the Belgians appealed to England for assistance. In Belgium, the bulk of the armed forces received orders to concentrate on Liège. That afternoon, the Foreign Secretary of England, in a stirring speech in the House of Commons, insisted upon the impossibility of England remaining inactive should the neutrality of Belgium be violated. Later in the evening, German troops crossed the Belgian frontier en route for the attack of the fortress of Liège, and before the day closed, the French and German ambassadors had left Berlin and Paris respectively, and England was now faced with choice between peace or war. The 4th of August brought matters to a crisis so far as she was concerned. Early in the day, information was received of Germany's offer to Belgium, and of the categorical refusal by the latter country. Later came the news that German troops had crossed the Belgian frontier. Instructions were at once telegraphed to the British ambassador in Berlin, directing him to obtain from the German government an assurance that Belgium's wishes would be respected. In the event of this guarantee not being given, the ambassador was to return home forthwith. Midnight was the time fixed for the reply. But about 11 p.m., the ambassador received his passports, and England and Germany were at war. Hostilities had, indeed, already begun. That very night, the Hamburg American liner, Koenig in Louise, was busily employed in laying mines off the eastern coast of Great Britain. End of section 3 this recording is in the public domain. Read by Iswa in Belgium in May 2021. Section 4 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15. The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 4. Why did Germany invade Belgium? By S.S. McClure. It would have seemed to a detached and well-informed observer on August 1, 1914, that the invasion of Belgium by Germany would surely cause England to go to war. The negotiations of 1912, in which Lord Haldale was so active, revealed very definitely England's views as to the neutrality of Belgium. Also, when the Franco-Prussian War broke out in 1870, Her Majesty Queen Victoria's government sent an identical question to the Emperor of France and to the King of Prussia as to whether or not either would violate the neutrality of Belgium. Later, the British government made an identical treaty with each of the two belligerents. All the world 
knew that it would be very difficult for the most pacific government to keep England out of a war that involved the violation of Belgium's neutrality. But could Britain keep out of the war, even if Belgium were not in question? Hardly. War breaks out. Great Britain, during the years of naval competition with Germany, had massed nearly all her navy in the North Sea. France had undertaken to make good in the Mediterranean the withdrawal of England's warships from thence, and, in return, England had agreed to protect the northern coasts of France, which France had denuded when she massed her naval armaments in the Mediterranean. Further, public opinion in England would not let England stand aside while France was being crushed. The moment that war should break out, Germany would endeavor to hinder France's export and import trade. In a month or two, England must have come in. No one can doubt this, who remembers the diplomatic events of the last two years and a half between the United States and Germany. If England were sure to enter the war in any event, what would be the chances of her coming in early if Belgium were invaded? And even if she came in immediately, would not the advantages of attacking France through Belgium greatly outweigh the benefit to France of Britons immediately entering the war? The genuine surprise of von bettmann holweg and in fact of the masses of the German people, shows that Germany did not count on the immediate entrance of Great Britain into the war. Civil war in Ireland seemed certain. Further, even should England immediately enter the war, it could make but slight difference. From a military standpoint, England was almost as negligible as the United States. What would a hundred thousand troops signify in a contest in which millions would be engaged on each side? The advantages to Germany, on the other hand, of an advance through Belgium would be incalculable. First, she could probably in less than six weeks envelope the armies of France and capture Paris. With her knowledge of the military situation and of the armaments of Germany and France, nothing was more absolutely certain to Germany than that her armies would be in Paris by the middle of September. And any student of the war today, with the knowledge then available to the Germans, would regard their belief as absolutely sound. The great plan of the German general staff was simplicity itself. Germany's military forces would be placed on the Franco-German frontier in sufficient numbers to protect against invasion and occupy the bulk of the French military forces. Meanwhile, an overwhelming army of over a million of the best equipped soldiers in the world would sweep through Belgium, drive the French forces west and south, envelope them, achieve a cedon on a colossal scale, and take Paris at its leisure. But by invading France through Belgium, Germany did more than win in battle. Modern warfare requires munitions on a gigantic scale. Modern war is a war of metallurgy. Nearly all the iron and coal mines of France and three-fourths of her steel mills are in the northeast. When Germany entrenched after the Battle of the Marne, she controlled most of the mineral resources, and hence most of the raw materials, of France. The war was won if France could not get materials by sea, and there was the submarine. The enormous increase in Germany's resources and the starvation of France's industries rendered France absolutely unable to manufacture munitions, the more so as more than a third of all her manufacturing plants were in Germany's possession. Further, the crops raised in the part of France occupied by the German armies are not applied to the needs of the inhabitants. They are taken by the German government. When I was in Mannheim in April 1916, I was told by Herr Hirsch, president of the Corn Exchange, that he had a day or two before dealt with 1,000 tons of wheat shipped from French territory occupied by the Germans. Iron ore from the French mines 
his mind far in excess of the consumption of the mills, and is stored up in Germany. The forests are cut down, and the lumber shipped to Germany. It is estimated by the French government that it will require two and a half billion dollars to restore the parts of France occupied by the German army. This does not include the loss to France from the exploitation of her mines of iron ore and coal, nor from the destruction of her forests. The eastern frontier of France runs through the middle of the Lorraine iron deposits, and nine-tenths of the metallurgical industries of the whole of France are concentrated in the Brie Basin, just across the frontier from Germany. If, the Germans argued, the Brie Basin was seized at the beginning of the war, the French would have lost more than a battle, because they would be deprived of the means of recuperation, and the Germans, on their part, would have gained a victory without a morrow. By invading Belgium, Germany secured immeasurable advantages, incalculable because she at once increased her coal and iron resources so that her production was enormously increased, and most important of all, she crippled France at the very source for the manufacture of munitions. But this was not all. She stripped the Belgian and French mills and factories of all raw materials as well as of all useful machinery. Belgium and occupied France have thus been a source of great strength to Germany, at less than no expense. End of section 4. This recording is in the public domain. Read by Ezwa in Belgium in July 2021. Section 5 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War, edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 5, Belgium's Part, 1914, by Emil Verhaeren. Attention centered upon Belgium soon after Germany declared war on Russia, for the country's neutrality had been guaranteed by treaty, and Belgium's part, for or against, was sure to have much to do with the development of the war as a whole. Preparation to meet any contingency began very early within Belgium itself. The forts were provisioned July the 30th. The export of horses and vehicles was prohibited, and presently the movements of trains on the railways to Germany came to a standstill. Parliament was summoned, and King Albert was ready to meet with courage and decision the inducements offered by Germany, whose plans to secure the immediate passage of troops were destined to meet a serious setback by the stout resistance offered at Liège. Belgium's resistance exasperated Germany beyond all precedent and led the way to the long list of atrocities inflicted upon the Belgians the destruction of Louvain, the imposing of huge fines upon Brussels, and finally to the heart-rending deportations of a later date. The following selection by Belgium's patriot poet gives an inner view of some of the matters in question. The Editor The fury felt against us by the German officers dates from the very day of the war's beginning. We barred their road to France, the act had no meaning, no honesty to them. True to their traditions, they sought to buy us off. Calling our government, as it were, into the room behind the shop, they asked, For how much? And waited for the answer they expected, For thirty pieces of silver. But the answer was given by Liège, and Liège infuriated them. They lost thousands of men. By no means were they able to force the instant passage which was so essential to them. Behind our defense was France mobilizing. For England and for Russia, we gained a precious respite. The world jumped immediately to the conclusion that the fate of the war was already settling against Germany. Even this first check, given by a tiny nation in the cause of honor, was regarded as the death blow. 
Certainly there was talk of peace. Three separate times did Germany approach us with proposals. The first occasion was in August, 1914. Mr. Davignon, Belgian Minister of Foreign Affairs, received through our minister at The Hague a long telegram which contained the following sentence. The German government is ready to take any steps in order to have Belgium on her side in the war with France. Belgium's reply was prompt and definite. True to her international duties, Belgium can only repeat her answer to the ultimatum of August the 2nd. And this especially as, since that time, her territory has been violated, a terrible war has been carried into her lands, and the guarantors of her integrity have promptly and loyally responded to her appeal for help. Germany's second attempt was through political channels in Belgium, but it failed as ignominiously as the first. The third of the peace proposals was made by Mr. Aitchen, a politician of Luxembourg, who told the neutral states, persuading them to issue a joint appeal for peace between us and Germany. Such a scheme could not have any result. Belgium, first of all, met it with point-blank refusal. In times before the war, those of us who dreamt of a greater Belgium had no visions of territorial expansion in Europe nor of a colonial empire in Africa. What we pictured was a rebirth of Belgium, a rebirth essentially of the mind and spirit. We pictured certainly an ever-growing activity of trade and industry, but our desire was even more for a greater modernity and vitality of thought. We sought for Belgium the power of influence rather than of conquest. And now we see the influence of Belgium stronger than it has ever been. It is true that for the moment our factories are silent, apparently deprived of the panting breath which is their life. But no one really thinks them dead. As soon as the war is over, they will spring to life again. As ever, we Belgians shall be young and keen. Until today, our nation has known no danger. We were too sure of the morrow. We lived like rich people who had no knowledge of want. War, we thought, was the business of others. But war has come upon us, fierce and terrible, when we least expected it. We were alone. We were few. Into the old forts of Liège, we threw ourselves in desperate haste. We had, as it were, to invent courage and resource for ourselves. We had to manufacture a tragic spirit of resistance. All that we did in a day, an hour, a moment. These early triumphs of Liège and those that followed at Haarlem and the Eiser have won for Belgium the eternal honor, respect and admiration of all. For three months, we have held the vast German armies in our country, the armies that allotted to us three days. With the most convincing arguments of all, we have challenged the dogma of their invincibility. We have caused them their first losses. The force of our resistance gave time to France and to England to arm themselves to perfect their organization. Our handful of soldiers at Liège and at Haarlem represented, unconsciously of course, a great past of cultured civilization. That is why this simple act of courage is so great. We need not dread comparing them to the deeds of Thermopylae. At Liège, as in Sparta, a handful of men saved the world. End of section 5. This recording is in the public domain. Read by Ezwa in Belgium in July 2021. Section 6 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War. 
Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 6. The Real Causes of the War, 1914. By Charles W. Eliot. In the early months of the war, ex-president Eliot of Harvard University contributed to the New York Times a series of letters on the causes of the war, which aroused an extensive controversy. In summarizing his part of the controversy, Dr. Eliot expressed himself as follows concerning the German desire for world empire. The Editor Each one of the principal combatants in Europe seems to be anxious to prove that it is not responsible for this cruelest, most extensive, and most destructive of all wars. Each government involved has published the correspondence between its chief executive and other chief executives, and between its chancellery, or foreign office, and the equivalent bodies in the other nations that have gone to war, and has been at pains to give a wide circulation to these documents. To be sure, none of these government publications seems to be absolutely complete. There seems to be in all of them suppressions or omissions, which only the future historian will be able to report, perhaps after many years. They reveal, however, the dilapidated state of the Concert of Europe in July 1914, and the flurry in the European chancelleries which the ultimatum sent by Austria-Hungary to Serbia produced. They also testify to the existence of a new and influential public opinion about war and peace, to which nations that go to war think it desirable to appeal for justification or moral support. These publications have been read with intense interest by impartial observers in all parts of the world, and have in many cases determined the direction of the reader's sympathy and goodwill and yet none of them discloses or deals with the real sources of the unprecedented calamity. They relate chiefly to the question who struck the match, and not to the questions who provided the magazine that exploded, and why did he provide it. Grave responsibility, of course, attaches to the person who gives the order to mobilize a national army or to invade a neighbor's territory. But the real source of the resulting horrors is not in such an order but in the governmental institutions, political philosophy, and long-nurtured passions and purposes of the nation or nations concerned. The prime source of the present immense disaster in Europe is the desire on the part of Germany for world empire, a desire which one European nation after another has made its supreme motive, and which none that has once adopted it has ever completely eradicated. Germany arrived late at this desire, being prevented until 1870 from indulging it, because of her lack of unity, or rather because of being divided since the Thirty Years' War into a large number of separate, more or less independent, states. When this disease, which has attacked one nation after another through all historic times, struck Germany, it exhibited in her case a remarkable malignity, moving her to expansion in Europe by force of arms, and to the seizure of areas for colonization in many parts of the world. Prussia, indeed, had long believed in making her way in Europe by fighting, and had repeatedly acted on that belief. Shortly before the achievement of German unity by Bismarck, she had obtained by war in 1864 and 1866 important accessions of territory and leadership in all Germany. With this desire for world empire, went the belief that it was only to be obtained by force of arms. Therefore, United Germany has labored with utmost intelligence and energy to prepare the most powerful army in the world, and to equip it for instant action in the most perfect manner which science and eager invasion could contrive. To develop this supreme military machine, universal conscription, an outgrowth of the conception of the citizens' army of France during the Revolution, was necessary so that every young man in Germany, physically competent to bear arms, might receive the training of a soldier, whether he wished it or not, and remain at the call of the government for military duty during all his years of competency, even if he were the only son of a widow, or a widower with little children, or the sole support of a family or other dependents. In order to the completeness of this military ideal, the army became the nation, and the nation became the army, 
to a degree which had never before been realized in either the savage or the civilized world. This army could be summoned and put in play by the chief executive of the German nation with no preliminaries except the consent of the hereditary heads of the several states, which united to form the empire in 1870 to 1871 under the domination of Prussia, the Prussian king, become German emperor, being commander-in-chief of the German army. At the word of the emperor, this army can be summoned, collected, clothed, equipped, and armed, and set in motion toward any frontier in a day. The German army was thus made the largest in proportion to population, the best equipped, and the most mobile in the world. The German general staff studied incessantly and thoroughly plans for campaigns against all the other principal states of Europe, and promptly utilized, secretly, whenever secrecy was possible, all promising inventions in explosives, ordnance, munitions, transportation, and sanitation. At the opening of 1914, the general staff believed that the German army was ready for war on the instant, and that it possessed some significant advantages in fighting, such as better implements and better discipline, over the armies of the neighboring nations. The army could do its part towards the attainment of world empire. It would prove invincible. The intense desire for colonies, and for the spread of German commerce throughout the world, instigated the creation of a great German navy, and started the race with England in navy building. The increase of German wealth, and the rapid development of manufactures and commercial sea power after 1870 to 1871, made it possible for the empire to devote immense sums of money to the quick construction of a powerful navy in which the experience and skill of all other shipbuilding nations would be appropriated and improved on. In thus pushing her colonization and sea power policy, Germany encountered the wide domination of Great Britain on the oceans, and this encounter bred jealousy, suspicion, and distrust on both sides. That Germany should have been belated in the quest for foreign possessions was annoying, but that England and France should have acquired early, ample, and rich territories on other continents, and then should resist or obstruct Germany when she aspired to make up for lost time, was intensely exasperating. Hence chronic resentments, and, when the day came, probably war. In respect to its navy, however, Germany was not ready for war at the opening of 1914 and therefore she did not mean to get into war with Great Britain in that year. Indeed, she believed, on incorrect information, that England could not go to war in the summer of 1914. Neither the government nor the educated class in Germany comprehends the peculiar features of party government as it exists in England, France, and the United States. And therefore, the German leaders were surprised and grievously disappointed at the sudden popular determination of Great Britain and Ireland to lay aside party strife and take strenuous part in the general European conflict. The complete preparation of the German army for sudden war, the authority to make war always ready in the hands of the German emperor, and the thorough studies of the German staff into the most advantageous plans of campaign against every neighbor, conspired to develop a new doctrine of military necessity, as the all-sufficient excuse for disregarding and violating the contracts or agreements into which Prussia or the new Germany had entered with other nations. This German view of the worthlessness of international agreements was not a cause of the present war, because it was not fully evident to Europe, although familiar and of long standing in Germany. But it is a potent reason for the continuance of the war by the Allies until Germany is defeated because it is plain to all the nations of the world, except Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Turkey at the moment, that the hopes of mankind for the gradual development of international order and peace rest on the sanctity of contracts between nations, and on the development of adequate sanctions in the administration of international law. The new doctrine of military necessity affronts all law, and is completely and hopelessly barbarous. United Germany has for forty years been putting into practice, at home and abroad, the doctrine of force as the source of all personal and national greatness, and all worthy human achievements. 
In the support of this doctrine, educated Germany has developed and accepted the religion of valor and the dogma that might makes right. In so doing, it has rejected with scorn the Christian teachings concerning humility and meekness, justice and mercy, brotherhood and love. The objects of its adoration have become strength, courage, and ruthless willpower. Let the weak perish and help them to perish. Let the gentle, meek, and humble submit to the harsh and proud. Let the shiftless and incapable die. The world is for the strong, and the strongest shall be ruler. This is a religion capable of inspiring its followers with zeal and sustained enthusiasm in promoting the national welfare at whatever cost to the individual of life, liberty, or happiness, and also of lending a religious sanction to the extremes of cruelty, greed, and hate. To this ideal state, every German owes duty, obedience, and complete devotion. The trouble with this supplement to the religion of valor is that it dwells too much on submission, self-sacrifice, and discipline, and not enough on individual liberty and self-control in liberty. Accordingly, when the valiant men got control of the government and carried the nation into a ferocious war, they swept away with them all the devotees of this romantic and spiritual state. The present war is the inevitable result of lust of empire, autocratic government, sudden wealth, and the religion of valor. What German domination would mean to any that should resist it, the experience of Belgium and North France during the past three months aptly demonstrates. The civilized world can now see where the new German morality, be efficient, be virile, be hard, be bloody, be rulers, would land it. To maintain that the power which has adopted in practice that new morality, and in accordance with its precepts, promised Austria its support against Serbia, and invaded Belgium and France in hot haste, is not the responsible author of the European war, is to throw away memory, reason, and common sense in judging the human agencies in current events. The real cause of the war is this gradually developed barbaric state of the German mind and will. All other causes, such as the assassination of the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, the sympathy of Russia with the Balkan states, the French desire for the recovery of Alsace-Lorraine, and Great Britain's jealousy of German aggrandizement, are secondary and incidental causes, contributory indeed, but not primary and fundamental. If anyone ask who brought the ruling class in Germany to this barbaric frame of mind, the answer must be Bismarck, Moltke, Treitschke, Nietzsche, Bernhardi, the German emperor, their like, their disciples, and the military caste. End of section 6 Section 7 of The World War This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Wayne Cook the World Story, Volume 15, The World War, edited by Horatio W. Drescher, Section 7, Germany's Military Masters, 1917, by Woodrow Wilson. Time enables those who understand the international situation to speak with more confidence. President Wilson, in an address delivered at Washington, June 14, 1917, at a Flag Day celebration, set forth in detail the reasons why the United States entered the war, and made the following summary of the causes of the war as a whole. The Editor The war was begun by the military masters of Germany, who proved to be also the masters of Austria-Hungary. These men have never regarded nations as peoples, men, women, and children of like blood and frame as themselves, for whom governments exist, and in whom governments had their life. They have regarded them merely as serviceable organizations which they could, by force or intrigue, bend or corrupt to their own purposes. They have regarded the smaller states in particular 
and the peoples who could be overwhelmed by force as their natural tools and instruments of domination. Their purpose has long been avowed. The statesmen of other nations, to whom that purpose was incredible, paid little attention, regarded what German professors expounded in their classrooms and German writers set forth to the world as the goal of German policy, as rather the dream of minds detached from practical affairs, as preposterous private conceptions of German destiny, than as the actual plans of responsible rulers. But the rulers of Germany themselves knew all the while what concrete plans, what well-advanced intrigues, lay back of what the professors and the writers were saying, and were glad to go forward unmolested, filling the thrones of Balkan states with German princes, putting German officers at the service of Turkey to drill her armies and make interest with her government, developing plans of sedition in India and Egypt, setting their fires in Persia. The demands made by Austria upon Serbia were a mere single step in a plan which compassed Europe and Asia, from Berlin to Baghdad. They hoped those demands might not arouse Europe, but they meant to press them whether they did or not, for they thought themselves ready for the final issue of arms. Their plan was to throw a broad belt of German military power and political control across the very center of Europe and beyond the Mediterranean into the heart of Asia, and Austria-Hungary was to be as much their tool and pawn as Serbia or Bulgaria, or Turkey, or the ponderous states of the East. Austria-Hungary, indeed, was to become a part of the central German Empire, absorbed and dominated by the same forces and influences that had originally cemented the German states themselves. The dream had its heart in Berlin. It could have had a heart nowhere else. It rejected the idea of solidarity of race entirely. The choice of peoples played no part in it at all. It contemplated binding together racial and political units which could be kept together only by force. Czechs, Magyars, Croats, Serbs, Romanians, Turks, Armenians, the proud states of Bohemia and Hungary, the stout little commonwealths of the Balkans, the innominable Turks, the subtle peoples of the East. These people did not wish to be united. They ardently desired to direct their own affairs, would be satisfied only by undisputed independence. They could be kept quiet only by the presence of the constant threat of armed men. They would live under a common power only by sheer compulsion and await the day of revolution. But the German military statesmen had reckoned with all that, and were ready to deal with it in their own way. And they have actually carried the greater part of that amazing plan into execution. Austria is at their mercy. It has acted not upon its own initiative or upon the choice of its own people, but at Berlin's dictate ever since the war began. The so-called central powers are in fact but a single power. Serbia is at its mercy, should its hands be but for a moment freed. Bulgaria has consented to its will, and Romania is overrun. The Turkish armies, which Germany trained, are serving Germany, certainly not themselves, and the guns of German warships lying in the harbor of Constantinople remind Turkish statesmen every day that they have no choice but to take their orders from Berlin. End of Section 7 Section 8 of The World War Read for LibriVox.org by Wayne Cook The World War, Part 2 The Gathering of the Armies Historical Note Events followed thick and fast after the Austrian and Serbian troops were called out, and Russia began to mobilize forces preparatory to the invasion of Austria. July 30, 1914, 
the Kaiser gave Russia 24 hours in which to halt mobilization and explain why forces were massed on the frontier. Then, as the answer was not forthcoming, the Kaiser signed the order for mobilization. When war was declared, Germany and Austria were ready with huge armies which had long been in training for war on a vast scale, with guns and ammunition, and with every kind of equipment needed for a prolonged conflict. Russia possessed a large army, but without the system and the resources, without the guns and ammunition, required for such a war. France, too, was in a measure, prepared, and able to put a large army into the field. But in England, the forces were relatively small. Hence, England naturally enlists our attention, if we would know how a great nation may meet the demands of a sudden and unexpected war, taxing all resources to the limit. In August 1914, England had only 750,000 men, including the territorials and partly trained men, those liable for foreign service and those available for home defense. The regular army, with reserves and special reserves, numbered but 450,000. The remainder were supposed to need six months' training before they should become first-line troops. For the moment, about 100,000 were serving in India and other distant stations. Lord Kitchener immediately called for 100,000 men, from 19 to 30 years of age, to be enrolled in new formations as service battalions, and to constitute the first expeditionary force when properly trained. These men were found within a fortnight. More were forthcoming when the call went out. 30,000 came in in one day, 175,000 in one week, the fifth of the war. Within a month, the total became one million, and in due time England had five million men under arms. The unprepared England of 1914 became the England ready to make war in earnest in 1916. This achievement is without a parallel in history. End of Section 6 This recording is in the public domain. Section 9 of The World War This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 15 The World War Edited by Horatio W. Dresser Section 9 The Training of Kitchener's Mob, 1914 By James Norman Hall Kitchener's Mob They were called in the early days of August 1914, when London hoardings were clamorous with the first calls for volunteers. The seasoned regulars of the first British expeditionary force said it patronizingly, the great British public hopefully, the world at large doubtfully. Kitchener's mob, when there were but a scant sixty thousand under arms, with millions yet to come. Kitchener's mob, it remains today, fighting in hundreds of thousands in France, Belgium, Africa, the Balkans, and who, tomorrow, when the war is ended, will come marching home again. Old campaigners, war-worn remnants of once mighty armies? Kitchener's Mob It is not a pleasing name for the greatest volunteer army in the history of the world, for more than three millions of toughened, disciplined fighting men united under one flag, all parts of one magnificent military organization. And yet Kitchener's own Tommies are responsible for it. The rank and file, with their inherent love of ridicule, even at their own expense, and their intense dislike of swank, they fastened the name upon themselves, lest the world at large should think they regarded themselves too highly. There it hangs. There it will hang for all time. It was on the 18th of August, 1914, that the mob spirit gained its mastery over me. 
After three weeks solitary tramping in the mountains of North Wales, I walked suddenly into news of the Great War and went at once to London with a longing for home which seemed strong enough to carry me through the week of idleness until my boat should sail for America. But in a spirit of adventure, I suppose, I tempted myself with the possibility of assuming the increasingly popular alias Atkins. On two successive mornings, I joined the long line of prospective recruits before the offices at Great Scotland Yard, withdrawing each time. After moving a convenient distance toward the desk of the recruiting sergeant, disregarding the proven fatality of third times, I joined in on another morning, dangerously near to the head of the procession. I was frank with the recruiting officers. I admitted, rather boasted, of my American citizenship, but expressed my entire willingness to serve in the British Army in case this should not expatriate me. I had, in fact, delayed, hoping that an American legion would be formed in London, as had been done in Paris. The announcement was received with some surprise, during which there was much vigorous shaking of heads. Three years or the duration of the war were the terms of the enlistment contract. I had visions of bloody engagements, of feverish nights in hospital, of endless years in a home for disabled soldiers. The conference was over, and the recruiting officer returned to his desk, smiling broadly. We'll take you, my lad, if you want to join. You'll just say you are an Englishman, won't you, as a matter of formality? The remainder of the week I spent mingling with the crowds of enlisted men at the horse guards parade, watching the bulletin boards for the appearance of my name, which would mean that I was to report at the regimental depot at Hunslow. My first impression of the men with whom I was to live for three years, or the duration of the war, was anything but favorable. The newspapers had been asserting that the new army was being recruited from the flower of England's young manhood. The throng at the horse guards parade resembled an army of the unemployed, and I thought it likely that most of them were misfits out of works, the kind of men who join the army because they can do nothing else. There were, in fact, a good many of these. I soon learned, however, that the general out-at-elbows appearance was due to another cause. A mob is genuinely descriptive of the array of would-be soldiers which crowded the parade ground at Hoonslow Barracks during the memorable last week in August. We herded together like so many sheep. We had lost our individuality, and it was to be months before we regained it in a new aspect, a collective individuality of which we became increasingly proud. We squeak squawked across the barrack square in boots which felt large enough for an entire family of feet. Our khaki service dress uniforms were strange and uncomfortable. Our hands hung limply along the seams of our pocketless trousers. We had come to Hounslow, believing that, within a few weeks' time, we should be fighting in France, side by side with the men of the first British Expeditionary Force. Lord Kitchener had said that six months of training at the least was essential. This statement was regarded as intentionally misleading. Lord Kitchener was too shrewd a soldier to announce his plans. But England needed men badly, immediately. After a week of training, we should be proficient in the use of our rifles. In addition to this, all that was needed was the ability to form fours and march, in column of route, to the station where we would entrain for Folkestone or Southampton and France. As soon as the battalion was up to strength, we were given a day of preliminary drill before proceeding to our future training area in Essex. It was a disillusioning experience. Equally disappointing was the undignified display of our little skill at Charing Cross Station, where we performed before a large and amused London audience. For my own part, I could scarcely wait until we were safely hidden within the train. Although mine was a London regiment, 
we had men in the ranks from all parts of the united kingdom there were north countrymen a few welsh scotch and irish men from the midlands and from the south of england but for the most part we were cockneys born within the sound of bow-bells being an american it was very hard at first to understand the class distinctions of british army life and having understood them it was more difficult yet to endure them i learned that a ranker or private soldier is a socially inferior being from the officer's point of view the officer class and the ranker class are east and west and never the twain shall meet except in their respective places on the parade ground this does not hold good to the same extent upon active service hardships and dangers shared in common tend to break down artificial barriers but even then although there was good will and friendliness between officers and men i saw nothing of genuine comradeship this seemed to me a great pity it was a loss for the officers fully as much as for the men we declined to accept the responsibility for the seeming slowness of our progress we threw upon the war office which had not equipped us in a manner befitting our station in life although we were recruited immediately after the outbreak of war less than half of our number had been provided with uniforms our arms and equipment were of an equally nondescript character we might easily have been mistaken for a mob of vagrants which had pillaged a seventeenth-century arsenal our housing accommodations throughout the autumn and winter of nineteen fourteen nineteen fifteen when england was in such urgent need of shelter for her rapidly increasing armies were also of the makeshift order we slept in leaky tents or in hastily constructed wooden shelters many of which were afterward condemned by the medical inspectors st martin's plain shorncliffe was an ideal camping site for pleasant summer weather but when the autumnal rains set in the green pasture land became a quagmire mud was the great reality of our lives the malignant deity which we fell down in and propitiated with profane rites it was a thin watery mud or a thick viscous mud as a steady downpour increased or diminished late in november we were moved to a city of wooden huts at sandling junction to make room for newly recruited units the dwellings were but half finished the drains were open ditches and the rains descended and the floods came as usual we lived an amphibious and wretched existence until january when to our great joy we were transferred to billets in the metropole one of folkestone's most fashionable hotels meanwhile our rigorous training continued from week to week in all weathers even the most inclement reveille sounded at daybreak for an hour before breakfast we did swedish drill two hours daily were given to musketry practice after musketry practice the remainder of the day was given to an extended order company and battalion drill twice weekly we route marched from ten to fifteen miles and at night after the parades of the day were finished boxing and wrestling contests arranged and encouraged by the officers kept the red blood pounding through our bodies until lights out sounded at nine o'clock plenty of hard work in the open air brought great and welcome changes the men talked of their food anticipated it with a zest which came from realizing for the first time the joy of being genuinely hungry they watched their muscles harden with a satisfaction known to every normal man when he is becoming physically efficient food exercise and rest taken in wholesome quantities and at regular intervals were having the usual excellent results for my own part i never before had been in such splendid health i wished that it might at all times be possible for democracies to exercise a beneficent paternalism over the lives of their citizenry at least in matters of health it seems a great pity that the principle of personal freedom should be responsible for so many ill-shaped and ill-sorted physical incompetence 
my fellow Tommies were living, really living, for the first time. They had never before known what it means to be radiantly, buoyantly healthy. There were, as well, more profound and subtle changes in thoughts and habits. The restraints of discipline and the very exacting character of military life and training gave them self-control, mental alertness. At the beginning they were individuals, no more cohesive than so many grains of wet sand. After nine months of training they acted as a unit, obeying orders with the instinctive promptness of action, which is so essential on the field of battle when men think scarcely at all. End of section 9 this recording is in the public domain. Section 10 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15. The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 10. The First Hundred Thousand in Training, 1914, by Ian Hay. At a quarter to nine, the battalion parades for a route march. This, strange as it may appear, is a comparative rest. Once you have got your company safely decanted from column of platoons into column of route, your labors are at an end. All you have to do is march, and that is no great hardship when you are as hard as nails, as we are fast becoming. On the march, the mental gymnastics involved by the formation of advanced guard or the disposition of a picket line are removed to a safe distance. There is no need to wonder guiltily whether you have sent out a connecting file between the vanguard and the main guard, or if you remember to instruct your sentry groups as to the position of the enemy and the extent of their own front. Second Lieutenant Little heaves a contented sigh and steps out manfully along the dusty road. Behind him tramp his men. We have no pipers as yet, but melody is supplied by Tipperary, sung in ragged chorus varied by martial interludes upon the mouth organ. The spy is not the mouth organ. Ours has been a constant boon. It has kept sixty men in line for miles on end. Fortunately, the weather is glorious. Day after day, after a sharp and frosty dawn, the sun swings up into a cloudless sky, and hundred thousand troops that swarm like ants upon the undulating plains of Hampshire can march, sit, lie, or sleep on hard, sun-baked earth. A wet autumn would have thrown our training back months. The men, as yet, possess nothing but the fatigue uniforms they stand up in, so it is imperative that they keep them dry. Tramp, tramp, tramp. Tipperary has died away. The owner of the mouth organ is temporarily deflated. Here is an opportunity for individual enterprise. It is soon seized. A husky soloist breaks into one of the deathless ditties of the new Scottish laureate. His comrades take up the air with ready response, and presently we are all swinging to the strains of Isla Velassi, roaming in the glooming, and it is just like being at home, being rendered as encores. Tramp, tramp, tramp. Now we are passing through the village. The inhabitants line a pavement and smile cheerfully upon us. They are always kindly disposed towards Scotchies. But the united gaze of the rank and file wanders instinctively from the pavement toward upper windows and kitchen entrances where the domestic staff may be discerned, but bunched together and giggling. Now we are out on the road again, silent, dusty. Suddenly, far in the rear, a voice of singular sweetness strikes up the banks of Loch Lamond. Man after man joins in until the swelling chorus runs from end to end of the long column. Half of the battalion hail from the Loch Lamond district, and of the rest there is hardly a man who has not indulged during some trade's holiday or in a pleasure trip upon its historic but inexpensive waters. You'll talk the high road and I'll talk the low road. A shrill whistle sounds far ahead. It means march at attention. Loch Lamond dies away with uncanny suddenness. Discipline waxing stronger every day. And tunics are buttoned and rifles are unslung. Three minutes later, we swing demurely on the barrack square, across which a pleasant aroma of stewed onions is wafting and deploy a creditable precision into the formation known as mass. Then comes much dressing of ranks and adjusting of distances. The colonel is very particular about a clean finish to any piece of work. Presently, the four companies are aligned. The battalion stands rigid, facing a motionless figure upon a horseback. The figure stirs. Fall out, the officers. They come trooping, stand fast and salute, very smartly. We must act an example to the men. Besides, we are hungry too. 
Battalion, slope arms, dismiss. Every man, with one or two incurable exceptions, turns sharply to his right and cheerfully smacks the butt of his rifle with his disengaged hand. The colonel gravely returns the salute, and we stream away, all the thousand of us, in the direction of the savory smell. Two o'clock will come around all too soon, and with it company drill and tiresome musketry exercises. But by that time we shall have dined, and fate cannot touch us for another twenty-four hours. We have our little worries, of course. Last week we were all vaccinated and we did not like it. There are other rifts within the military loot. At home we are persons of some consequence, with very definite notions about the dignity of labor. We have employers who tremble at our frown. We have trades union officials who are at constant pains to impress upon us our own omnipotence in the industrial world in which we live. We have at our beck and call a radical MP who, in return for our vote and suffrage, informs us that we are the backbone of the nation, and that we must go on no account permit ourselves to be trampled upon by the effete and tyrannical upper classes. Finally, we are Scotsmen, with all a Scotsman's curious reserve and contempt for social airs and graces. But in the army, we appear to be nobody. We are expected to stand stiffly at attention when addressed by an officer, even to call him Sir, an honor to which our previous employer has been a stranger. At home, if we happened to meet the head of the firm in the street, and none of our colleagues was looking, we touched a cap fervently. Now we have no opinion in the matter. We are expected to degrade ourselves by meaningless and humiliating gestures. If you answer a sergeant as you would a foreman, you are impertinent. If you argue with him, as all good Scotsmen must, you are insubordinate. If you endeavor to drive a collective bargain with him, you are mutinous and you are reminded that upon active service, mutiny is punishable by death. It is all very unusual and upsetting. Still, one can get used to anything. Our lot is mitigated too by the knowledge that we are all in the same boat. Even the colonel was seen one day to salute an old gentleman who rode on the parade ground during morning drill, wearing a red band around his hat. Noting this, we realize the army is not, after all, as we first suspected, divided into two classes, oppressors and the oppressed. We all have to go through it. Presently fresh air, hard training, and clean living begin to weave their spell. Incredulous at first, we found ourselves slowly recognizing the fact that it is possible to treat an officer deferentially, or carry out an order smartly, without losing one's self-respect as a man and a trades unionist. The insidious habit of cleanliness once acquired takes despotic position of its victims. We find ourselves looking askance at roommates who have not yielded to such predilections. The swimming bath, where once we flapped unwillingly and ingloriously at the shallow end, becomes a desirable resort, and we look forward to our weekly visit with something approaching eagerness. We begin, too, to take our profession seriously. Formerly, we regarded outpost exercises, advanced guards, and the like as a rather fatuous form of play-acting, designed to amuse those officers who carry maps and notebooks. Now we begin to consider those diversions on their merits and seriously criticize the second Lieutenant Little for having last night posted one of his sentry groups upon the skyline. Thus is the soul of a soldier born. We are getting less individualistic too. We are beginning to think more of our regiment and less of ourselves. At first, loyalty takes the form of criticizing other regiments because their marching is slovenly or their accoutrements dirty or most significant sign of all, their discipline is bad. We are especially critical of our own 8th Battalion, which is fully three weeks younger than we are and is not in the first hundred thousand at all. In their presence, we are war-worn veterans. We express it as our own opinion, as the officers of some of these battalions must be a poor lot. From this, it suddenly comes home to us that our officers are a good lot and that we find ourselves taking a queer pride in our company commander's homely strictures and severe sentences in the morning after pay night. Here is another step in the quickening life of the regiment. Esprit de corps is raising its head, class prejudice and dour independence notwithstanding. Again, a timely hint dropped by the colonel on the battalion parade this morning, and it set us thinking. We begin to wonder how we shall compare with the first-time regiments when we find ourselves out there. Silently, we resolve that when we, the first of the service battalions, take our place in trench or firing line alongside of the old regiment, no one shall be found to draw unfavorable comparisons between parent and offspring. We intend to show ourselves chips of the old block. No one who knows the old regiment can ask more of a young battalion than that. End of section 10. This recording is in the public domain. Read by Quia Carrot, April 26th.
Section 11 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 15. The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 27. En route with Kitchener's Mob. 1915. By James Norman Hall. One Sunday morning in May, we assembled on the barrack square at Aldershot for the last time. Every man was in full marching order. His rifle was the short Lee Einfeld Mark VI, his bayonet, the long single-edged blade in general use throughout the British Army. In addition to his arms, he carried one hundred and twenty rounds of three hundred three caliber munition an entrenching tool, water bottle, haversack, containing both emergency and the day's rations, and his pack, strapped to his shoulders and waist in such a way that the weight of it was equally distributed. His pack contained the following articles, a great coat, a woolen shirt, two or three pairs of socks, a change of underclothing, a housewife, the soldier's sewing kit, a towel, a cake of soap, and a hold-all, in which were a knife, fork, spoon, razor, shaving brush, toothbrush, and comb. All of these were useful, and sometimes essential articles, particularly the toothbrush, which Tommy regarded as the best instrument for cleaning the mechanism of a rifle ever invented. Strapped on top of the pack was the blanket roll wrapped in a waterproof ground sheet, and hanging beneath it, the canteen in its khaki-colored cover. Each man wore an identification disc on a cord about his neck. It was stamped with his name, regimental number, regiment, and religion. A first-aid field dressing, consisting of an antiseptic gauze pad and bandage and a small vial of iodine, sewn in the lining of his tunic, completed the equipment. Physically, the men were in the pink. As Tommy says, they were clear-eyed, vigorous, alert, and as hard as nails. With their caps on, they looked the well-trained soldiers, which they were. But with caps removed, they resembled so many uniformed convicts, less the prison pallor. Oversee haircuts were the last tonsorial cry. And for several days previous to our departure, the army hairdressers had been busily wielding the close-cutting clippers. Each of us had received a copy of Lord Kittinger's letter to the troops ordered abroad, a brief soldier-like statement of the standard of conduct which England expected of her fighting men. It was an effective appeal, and a constant reminder to the men of the glorious traditions of the British Army. In the months that followed, I had opportunity to learn how deep and lasting was the impression made upon them by Lord Kitchener's first, and, I believe his only, letter to his soldiers. The machinery for moving troops in England works without the slightest friction. The men transport horses, commissura, medical stores, and supplies of a battalion are entrained in less than half an hour. Everything is timed to the minute. Battalion after battalion and train after train we moved out of Aldershot at half-hour intervals. Each train arrived at the port of embarkation on scheduled time and pulled up on the docks by the side of a troop transport. Great slate-colored liners taken out of the merchant service. Not a moment was lost. The last man was aboard and the last wagon on the crane swinging up over the ship's side as the next train came in. Ship by ship we moved down the harbor in the twilight, the boys crowding the rail on both sides, taking their farewell look at England, home. It was the last farewell for many of them, but there was no martial music, no waving of flags, no tearful goodbyes. Our farewell was as prosaic as our long period of training had been. We were each one a very small part of a tremendous organization, which works without any of the display considered so essential in the old days. We left England without a cheer. 
there was not so much as a wave of the hand from the wharf for there was no one on the wharf to wave with the exception of a few dock laborers and they had seen too many soldiers off to the front to be sentimental about it it was a tense moment for the men but trust tommy to relieve a tense situation as we steamed away from the slip we passed a barge loaded to the water's edge with coal tommy has a song pat to every occasion he enjoys above all things giving a ludicrous twist to a weepy ballad when we were within hailing distance of the coal barge he began one of this variety keep the home fires burning to those smutty-faced barge hands every one joined in heartily forgetting all about the solemnity of the leave-taking tommy is a prosaic chap this was never more apparent to me than upon that pleasant evening in may when we said good-bye to england the lights of home were twinkling their farewells far in the distance every moment brought us nearer to the great adventure we were off to the wars to take our places in the far-flung battlefields here was romance lavishly offering gifts dearest to the hearts of youth offering them to clerks tradesmen drapers as assistants men who had never known an adventure more thrilling than a holiday excursion to the isle of man or a week of cycling in kent and they accepted them with all the solidity native to the englishman the eyes of the world were upon them they had become the knights errant of every schoolgirl they were figures of heroic proportions to every one but themselves there was however one burst of enthusiasm as we started on our journey which struck me as being spontaneous and splendid and thoroughly english outside the harbor we were met by our guardians a fleet of destroyers which was to give us safe convoy across the channel the moment they saw them the men broke forth into prolonged cheering and there were glad shouts of there they are me lads there's some o the little old watchdog what's keepin em bottled up good old navy that's where we got em by the throat let's give em sons of the sea and they did they sang with a spirit of exaltation which englishmen rarely betray and which convinced me how nearly the sea and england's position as mistress of the seas touch the englishmen's heart of hearts sons of the sea all british born sailing the ocean laughing foes to scorn they may build their ships my lad and think they know the game but they can't beat the boys of the bulldog breed who made old england's name it was a confession of faith on the sea england can't be beaten tommy believes that with his whole soul and on this occasion he sang with all the warmth of religious conviction our channel voyage was uneventful each transport was guarded by two destroyers one on either side the three vessels keeping abreast and about fifty yards apart during the entire journey the submarine menace was then at its height and we were prepared for an emergency the boats were swung ready for immediate launching and all of the men were provided with life preservers. But England had been transporting troops and supplies to the firing line for so many months without accident that none of us were at all concerned about the possibility of danger. Furthermore, the men were too busy studying Tommy Atkins's French manual to think about submarines. They were putting the final polish on their accent in preparation for tomorrow's landing. The following day we crowded into the typical French army troop train and started on a leisurely journey to the firing line. We traveled all day, at eight or ten miles an hour, through Normandy. We passed through pleasant towns and villages lying silent in the afternoon sunshine, and seemingly almost deserted, and through the open country fragrant with the scent of apple blossoms. Now and then children waved to us from a cottage window and in the field old men and women and girls leaned silently on their hoes or their rakes and watched us pass occasionally an old reservist guarding the railway line would lift his cap and shout viva l'angleterre but more often he would lean on his rifle and smile nodding his head courteously but silently to our salutations tommy for all his stolid dogged cheeriness 
since the tragedy of france it was a land swept bare of all its fine young manhood there was no pleasant stir and bustle of civilian life those who were left went about their work silently and joylessly when we asked of the men we received always the same quiet courteous reply a la guerre monsieur the boys soon learned the meaning of the phrase a la guerre it became a war cry a slogan it was shouted back and forth from car to car and from train to train you can imagine how eager we all were how we strained our ears whenever the train stopped for the sound of the guns but not until the following morning when we reached the little village at the end of our railway journey did we hear them a low muttering like the sound of thunder beyond the horizon how we cheered at the first faint sound which was to become so deafening so terrible to us later it was music to us then for we were like the others who had gone that way we knew nothing of war we thought it must be something adventurous and fine something to make the blood leap and the heart sing we marched through the village and down the poplar lined road surprised almost disappointed to see the neat well-kept houses and the pleasant level fields green with the spring crops we had expected that everything would be in ruins at this stage of the journey however we were still some twenty-five miles from the firing line during all the journey from the coast we have seen on every side evidences of that wonderfully organized branch of the british military system the army service corps from the village at which we detrained everything was english long lines of motor transport lorries were parked along the sides of the roads there were great ammunition bases commissariat supply depots motor repair shops wheelwright and blacksmith shops where one saw none but the khaki-clad soldiers engaged in all the non-combatant business essential to the maintenance of large armies there were long lines of transport wagons loaded with supplies travelling field kitchens with chimneys smoking and kettles steaming as they bumped over the cobbled roads water carts red cross carts motor ambulances batteries of artillery london omnibuses painted slate gray filled with troops seemingly endless columns of infantry on foot all moving with us along parallel roads toward the firing line and most of these troops and supply columns belonged to my own division one small cog in the british fighting machine we advanced toward the war zone in easy stages it was intensely hot and the rough cobbled roads greatly increased the difficulty of the marching in england we had frequently tramped from fifteen to twenty-five miles in a day without fatigue but the roads were excellent and the climate moist and cool upon our first day's march in france a journey of only nine miles scores of men were overcome by the heat and several died the suffering of the men was so great in fact that a halt was made earlier than had been planned and we bivouacked for the night in the fields life with a battalion on the march proceeds with the same orderly routine as when in the barracks every man has his own particular employment within a few moments the level pasture land was converted into a busy community of a thousand inhabitants we made serviceable little dwellings by lacing together two or three waterproof ground sheets and erecting them on sticks or tying them to the wires of the fences the sick were cared for and justice dispensed with the same thoroughness as in england the day's offenders against discipline were punished with what seemed to us unusual severity but we were now on active service and offences which were trivial in england were looked upon for this reason in the light of serious crimes daily we approached a little nearer to our goal sleeping at night in the open fields or in the lofts of great rambling farm buildings most of these places had been used for soldiers billets scores of times before the walls were covered with the names of men and regiments and there were many penciled suggestions as to the best place to go for a basin of cafe au lait 
as Tommy called it. Every roadside cottage was, in fact, Tommy's tavern. The thrifty French peasant women kept open houses for soldiers. They served us with delicious coffee and thick slices of French bread, for the very reasonable sum of twopence. They were always friendly and hospitable, and the men, in turn, treated them with courteous and kindly respect. Tommy was a great favorite with the French children. They climbed on his lap and rifled his pockets, and they delighted him by talking in his own vernacular, for they were quick to pick up English words and phrases. They sang, Tipperary, and Rule Britannia, and God Save the King, so quaintly and prettily that the men kept them at it for hours at a time. And so, during a week of stifling heat, we moved slowly forward. The sound of the guns grew in intensity, from a faint rumbling to a subdued roar, until one evening, sitting in the open windows of a stable loft, we saw the far-off lightnings of bursting shells and the trench rockets soaring skyward. And we heard bursts of rifle and machine-gun fire, very faintly, like the sound of chestnuts popping in an oven. End of section 11. This recording is in the public domain. Section 12 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Atello. The World Story, Volume 15. The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 12. The Second German Mobilization, 1914. By Jeffrey Pike. The following description of the movement of German troops is by a correspondent of the London Chronicle, who succeeded in reaching Berlin a few weeks after the war was declared. The Editor I had reckoned that the Russian advance would necessitate a large calling out of reserves and a great transfer of troops, in fact, a new mobilization. Now the main artery to the west from Berlin runs through the suburbs of Charlottenburg, and just beyond Charlottenburg are the Charlottenburg woods, and somewhat to the north, runs the railway. So on Sunday I took a train to Charlottenburg, and so did the whole of Berlin. Knowing that this was its habit, I knew I should be safe. And as I walked through the woods I heard a great rumble, and then the silence that was great beside it. A long pause, and then another rumble, and I realized I was drawing nearer to it, but it died away before I reached the spot whence it came. And then I came to the edge of the wood, and over the clearing that confronted me was the railway line, and far down the line was the great iron bridge that crossed the Havel. Keeping well within the shadow of the trees, I looked hard at the bridge and saw what I had expected. Five Landsturm, guardsmen, two at each end, and an Unterofficier. Thus far and no farther, thought I. It was from here that the rumble had come. I took out my pocket of lunch and sat down just inside the trees. I also took out two bottles of Pilsner beer. I looked a perfect Berliner. Suddenly came the rumble again. It could not have been more than seven or eight minutes after the last one had died away. In a few minutes a long train of forty-four luggage trucks had dashed past. At the rear were two ordinary carriages. The sliding doors of the vans were pushed back, and inside I saw were packed row after row of soldiers. They stood at the door leaning out over one another's shoulders, singing cheerfully and sturdily these wonderful German marching songs that make one's very breathing keep time to them. Each truck sang the same, and right down the train more than a quarter of a mile long, rose and fell the words of the Wacht am Rhein, God, with what fervor they shouted it, and yet it was still music. Next would come the prayer for Franz Joseph, and next, Die beide grandier, and then again, Die Wacht am Rhein, and again, and again, and it was the last notes that I can still hear singing in my ears when the next train comes rushing along, and the last that I can hear from them, and so on. And it remains a vista, those trucks decorated with green branches, and those jolly-looking men, leaning out of them, singing, 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 and all day long those trainloads of men passed and passed, and when I came back the next day, they were still passing. Every ten minutes they came, and they never varied by more than twenty seconds. But the place where all this was being worked from was miles away, in a room in the Kriegsministerium, war office of Berlin, 
and there at any moment they knew where every train ought to be, or actually was, which was generally the same thing. It was as long as 1903 that the plans for mobilization were last altered on a large scale, and it was then that they were finally molded to their present shape. One of the fundamental necessities for the smooth working organization to the Teutonic mentality is not merely shape-like docility, combined with the technical ability bred of the latest continuation school and the polytechnics, but also the fact that the whole thing or something like it has been done before. It is generally considered safer by superiors in government services in Prussia that inferiors should be able to recognize as an old friend or tormentor any order that should be given them. It saves them the trouble of understanding it. This was the case of the Prussian mobilization. Every summer for the last 12 years, every station master, the head of every locomotive depot, and every inspector in every district, every station in the empire, received three large official envelopes, which he had already received instructions were to be put into his safe, and there kept until they should be necessary. The first of these envelopes that disappeared behind lock and key had inscribed on the cover in large printed capitals, to be opened in the event of war with France. On the second of these documents was printed, to be opened in the event of war with Russia, and the third, to be opened in the event of war with France and Russia. There was no fourth. No envelope with, to be opened in the event of war with France, Russia, and Great Britain. Every year, a gold-laced official would come round to collect these envelopes and carefully scrutinize them, to see that they were untampered with. Year after year, the serious formality would be gone through. Then came the day. You will do this and that. Trains will pass through your station at the following times. Signalmen to be instructed to lower their signals so many minutes before each train. It is in this manner that all of the three great efforts were prepared for months beforehand. For the last effort that cleared Galatia, it was probably March that saw a whole staff of the ablest and stiffest young men, straight from staff colleges and full of ambition, sit down under the direction of a snow-white-haired old general or so, and carefully plot out with huge diagrams the exact times at which each train and each wagon was to leave its position, from where it was to be gathered in, and where it was to be concentrated, and whether it was to go. It is largely to these young men in spectacles sitting in Berlin that General von Mackensen owes his victories. At any rate, he could not possibly accomplish them without. End of section 12. This recording is in the public domain. Section 13 of The World War Read for LibriVox.org by Devorah Allen The World War Part 3 on the Western Front, 1914 to 1915. Historical Note To understand the campaign on the Western Front from its beginning, it is necessary to take account of the expectations of Germany and France, and the disappointments of the first month of the war. The Germans, avoiding the strongly fortified French frontier, swiftly moved large forces toward Belgium, with the hope that Belgium would yield passage to Paris. The first setback came with Belgium's refusal, and the stout resistance of Liège, against which 30,000 men were moved under General von Emich. Presently, three armies of about one million men pressed forward. One marched on Brussels, another crossed the Meuse and marched against Namur, and a third swept through the Ardennes. Meantime, the French, eager to win their lost province, massed forces to capture Alsace, but were compelled to alter their plan of campaign to meet the German armies as they swept south. While Belgium's brave resistance gave England time to transport the first forces to France, the combined armies were not large or efficient enough to stem the advancing Teutonic tide. The British in the vicinity of Mons were overwhelmed. The fall of Namur, August 22nd, was a great blow to the Allies. In the battles about Mons and Charleroi, there were only 300,000 Allied troops to meet the German onslaught of 750,000 men. The Germans were now apparently in a position to sweep everything before them, march rapidly on Paris, and repeat the triumphs of 1870 on a greater scale. It was then that General Joffre, rising to the occasion, brought the Allied armies together for the first decisive battle of the war. 
it is estimated that more than three million men were engaged in this battle, and that the losses were not less than five hundred thousand. This great victory for the Allies effectually put a stop to Germany's plan to annihilate the French army, and then turned to meet Russia before anything important should happen on the Eastern Front. Germany's tactics were forthwith changed, and the war became a struggle for trenches and minor positions, taken, lost, retaken. End of section 13. This recording is in the public domain. Section 14 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 15, The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 14. The Retreat from Mons, 1914, by a British Staff Officer. The first British expeditionary force left England for France during the early weeks of August in command of Sir John French. By August 22nd, the forces were gathered for action, and on the 23rd, three army corps extended along a 25-mile front east and west of Mons, a Belgian town of 25,000 inhabitants. The battle began that day and continued until it became clear that the British were greatly outnumbered and must retreat to escape annihilation. The retreat lasted 12 days, during which there were constant forced marches day and night and incessant rearguard actions. The Editor The general situation in this region, as it was known at the moment to the leaders of the Allies, may be briefly stated. It was at last plain, after much uncertainty, that the first great shock and collision of forces was destined to take place in this northern area. It was plain, also, that Belgium, for some time to come, was out of the scheme. Liège had fallen, and with it how many hopes and predictions of the engineer. Brussels was occupied, and the Belgian field army was retiring to shelter under the ramparts of Antwerp. Except for Namur, there was nothing in Belgium north of the Allied line to stop the German advance. Von Kluck and von Bülow, with the first and second German armies, were marching without opposition toward the French frontier von Kluck toward the southwest and von Bülow toward the crossings of the Sambre. By the evening of the 20th, von Bülow's guns were bombarding Namur. So much was known to the leaders of the Allies. Of the strength of the advancing armies, they knew little. The line occupied by the British ran due east from the neighborhood of Condé along the strait of the Condé-Mons Canal, round the loop which the canal makes north of Mons, and then, with a break, patrolled by cavalry, turned back at almost a right angle toward the southeast of the direction of the Mons-Beaumont Road. The whole of the canal line, including the loop round Mons, a front of nearly 20 miles, was held by the 2nd Army Corps, and the 1st Army Corps lay off to its right, holding the southeastern line to a point about 9 miles from Mons. There being no infantry reserves available in this small force, General Allenby's cavalry division was employed to act on the flank, or in support of any threatened part of the line. Throughout the Saturday, our men entrenched themselves, the North Countrymen among them finding in the chimney stacks and slag heaps of this mining district much to remind them of home. The line they held was clearly not an easy line to defend. No salient ever is, and a glance at the map will show that this was no common salient. To the sharp apex of Mons was added, as an aggravation, the loop of the canal. It was, nevertheless, the best line available, and once adopted, had been occupied with that double view, both to defense and to attack, which a good commander has always before him. The attack had most certainly begun, and it began, as was expected, at the weakest and most critical point of the line, the canal loop, which was held by the 3rd Division. This division had the heaviest share of the fighting throughout the day, maintaining, longer than seemed humanly possible, a hopeless position against hopeless odds, the 2nd Royal Irish and 4th Middlesex of the 8th Brigade, and the 4th Royal Fusiliers of the 9th Brigade, particularly distinguishing themselves. The bridges over the canal, which our men held, after some preliminary shelling, 
were attacked by infantry debouching from the low woods, which at this point came down to within 300 or 400 yards of the canal. These woods were of great assistance to the enemy, both here and at other points of the canal, in providing cover for their infantry and machine guns. The odds were very heavy. One company of the Royal Fusiliers, holding the Nimi Bridge, was attacked at one time by as many as four battalions. The enemy at first came on in masses and suffered severely in consequence. It was their first experience of the British 15 rounds a minute, and it told. They went down in bundles, our men delighting in a form of musketry never contemplated in the regulations. To men accustomed to hitting bobbing heads at 800 yards, there was something monstrous and incredible in the German advance. They could scarcely believe their eyes. Such targets had never appeared to them, even in their dreams, nor were our machine guns idle. In this, as in many other actions that day and in the days that followed, our machine guns were handled with a skill and devotion which no one appreciated more than the enemy. The attack had now spread along the whole line of the canal, but except at the loop, the enemy could make no impression. There, however, numbers told at last, and about the middle of the afternoon, the 3rd Division was ordered to retire from the salient, and the 5th Division on its left directed to conform. Bridges were blown up, the Royal Engineers vying with the other services in the race for glory, and by the night of the 23rd, after various vicissitudes, the 2nd Army Corps had fallen back as far as the line montreuil vaz paturage Frameries. That the retirement, though successful, was expensive is not to be wondered at, when it is remembered that throughout this action, as we now know, the Second Army Corps was outnumbered by three to one. All ranks, however, were in excellent spirits. Allowing for handicaps, they felt that they had proved themselves the better men. It was a feeling which was to be severely tried in the next few days. At 5 p.m. on Sunday the 23rd, as the Second Corps was withdrawing from the canal, the British Commander-in-Chief received a most unexpected telegraph from General Joffre the Generalissimo of the Allied armies, to the effect that at least three German army corps were moving forward against the British front and that a fourth corps was endeavoring to outflank him from the west. He was also informed that the Germans had on the previous day captured the crossings of the Sambre between Charleroi and Nemours and that the French on his right were retiring. In other words, Nemours, the defensive pivot of the Anglo-French line, on the resistance of which, if only for a few days, the Allied strategy had depended, had fallen almost at a blow. By Saturday, the Germans had left Namor behind, and in numbers far exceeding French predictions, had seized the crossings of the Sambre and Middle Meuse, and were hammering at the junction of the 5th and 4th French armies in the River Fork. The junction was pierced, and the French, unexpectedly and overwhelmingly assaulted both in front and flank, could do nothing but retire. By 5 p.m. on the Sunday, when the message was received at British headquarters, the French had been retiring for anywhere from 10 to 12 hours. The British Army was, for the moment, isolated. Standing forward a day's march from the French on its right, faced and engaged by three German corps in front, and already threatened by a fourth corps on its left, it seemed a force marked out for destruction. In the British higher command, however, there was no flurry. There is a thing called British phlegm. The facts of the case, though unwelcome, were laconically accepted. Over general headquarters brooded a clubroom calm. Airmen were sent up to confirm the French report in the usual manner, and arrangements were quietly and methodically made for a retirement toward the prearranged Maubuge Valenciennes line. It had been intended by the British commander in chief to make a stand on the Maubuge line, and if the first calculations of the enemy's strength and intentions had proved correct, it is possible that a great battle might have been fought here and continued by the French armies along the whole fortress line of northern France. Even as it was, the temptation to linger at Maubuge must have been strong. It offered such an inviting buttress to our right flank and filled so comfortably that dangerous gap between our line and the French. The temptation to which a weaker commander might have succumbed was resisted. Early on the 25th, accordingly, the whole British army set out on the next stage of its retreat. Its function in the general Allied strategy was now becoming clear. It was not merely fighting its own battles. Situated as it was on the left flank of the retiring French armies, 
It had become, in effect, the left flank guard of the Allied line, committed to its retirement and to the protection of that retirement to the end. The turning movement from the West, at first local and partial, had suddenly acquired a strategic significance. It threatened not merely the British Army, but the whole Allied strategy of retreat. Could the British resist it? Could they, at the least, delay it? These were the questions which the French leaders asked themselves with some anxiety. As they retired with their armies from day to day and waited for the counterturn which was to come. For, as we now know, behind the retiring and still intact French armies, to the south and east of Paris, movements were shaping, forces were forming, which were to change the face of things in this western corner. The crisis of the retreat was now approaching. There's a limit to what men can do, and it seemed for a moment as if this limit might be reached too soon. The commander-in-chief, seriously considering the accumulating strength of the enemy, the continued retirement of the French, his exposed left flank, the tendency of the enemy's western corps to envelop him, and above all the exhausted and dispersed condition of his troops, decided to abandon the Le Cateau position and to press on the retreat till he could put some substantial obstacle, such as the Somme or the Oise, between his men and the enemy, behind which they might reorganize and rest. He therefore ordered his corps commanders to break off whatever action they might have in hand and continued their retreat as soon as possible toward the new San Quentin line. The first corps was by this time terribly exhausted, but on receiving the order, set out from its scattered halting places in the early hours of the 26th. That the day was critical, that it was all or nothing, was realized by all ranks. Everything was thrown into the scale. Nothing was held back. Regiments and batteries with complete self-abandonment faced hopeless duels at impossible ranges. Brigades of cavalry on the flanks boldly threatened divisions, and in the half-shelter of their trenches, the infantry, withering but never budging, grimly dwindled before the German guns. It was our first experience on a large scale of modern artillery in mass. For the first six hours, the guns never stopped. To our infantry, it was a time of stubborn and almost stupefied endurance, broken by lucid intervals of that deadly musketry, which had played such havoc with the Germans at Mons. To our artillery, it was a duel, and perhaps of all the displays of constancy and devotion in a battle where every man and every arm of the service did his best, the display of the gunners was the finest, for they accepted the duel quite cheerfully and made such sport with the enemy's infantry that even their masses shivered and recoiled. By midday, however, many of our batteries were out of action, and the enemy infantry had advanced almost to the main cambrai le Cateau road, behind which our men, in their pathetic civilian trenches, were quietly waiting. End of section 14. This recording is in the public domain. Section 15 of The World War, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. A Gas Attack, Photograph, page 62. Poisonous gas was first used by the Germans at the Second Battle of Ypres in April 1915. The French colonial troops, completely surprised by this new and terrifying weapon, suffered heavily and were compelled to give ground. The battle is memorable for the heroism of the Canadians, who, outflanked and nearly surrounded, held on at fearful cost and kept the Germans from breaking through. Gas attacks are made either by clouds or by shells containing a quantity of gas which is released when the shells burst. In cloud attacks, the gas cylinders, which are very similar to those used in a soda fountain, are buried in the front trench, one to a yard, with pipes extending a few feet into no man's land. Then, when conditions are just right and a gentle wind is blowing toward the enemy's trenches, the gas is released on its deadly mission. So powerful are the fumes that they have been known to kill at a distance of nine miles in the rear. At the first intimation of a gas attack, a gong is rung in the trenches as a signal for the instant donning of gas masks. The artillery is also notified, and a curtain of fire dropped fifty yards before the trenches in order to prevent an enemy attack, which is always to be expected in connection with the release of gas, and also in the hope that the exploding shells may break up the gas cloud. 
The photograph from which this remarkable illustration was made was taken above the lines by a Russian aviator. It shows the start of a poison gas attack by the Teutons. Great clouds of chlorine gas are seen rolling toward the Russians, released from cylinders operated by men in the first line. Behind these men three lines of troops are visible, waiting to follow up the attack when the fumes have got in their deadly work. The strange black lines that might almost be taken for gas cylinders are the shadows of the waiting soldiers. Evidently the attack was made shortly after sunrise. End of section 15. This recording is in the public domain. Section 16 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 15, The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 16. The Battle of the Marne, 1914, by Major F. E. Witten. According to the report of Sir John French, commanding the British forces, General Geoffre, commander-in-chief of the Allied armies, announced his intention on September 5th to take the offensive, and on Sunday the 6th at sunrise the combined movements of the armies began. The great battlefront extended from Hermionville through Lise on the Marne, Montpertuy, Courtecon, to Esternay and Charleville, the left of the Ninth Army under General Foch and so on to a point north of the fortress of Verdun. The battle continued until the evening of September 10th, when the Germans had been driven back to the line of soissons rems with the loss of thousands of prisoners, many guns, and great masses of transport. The Editor The position of the five German armies concerned in the pursuit of the Franco-British left and center was, on the evening of the 4th, generally speaking, a line in close touch with the Allied front. The Fifth Army, under the Crown Prince, after its successful engagement at Longueville, had thrown its right wing across the Meuse below Verdun and had moved against the fortress, which was then partially invested. In touch with this army, and to the west of it was the Fourth Army, under the Duke of Württemberg, which, after its victory near Sedan, was pushed on past Chalons, where it was sharply attacked by the retiring French Fourth Army. Working still westward was the German Third Army. Then came a gap to where lay the first army of General von Kluck, which had been chiefly charged with the shepherding of the British force and of sweeping the country wide to the west. The right columns of this army had stretched to Amiens and Beauvais, while cavalry detachments had penetrated almost as far as Rouen. On the 3rd of September, its main body was on the line creil saint lys nantuil and it had begun to close in on its left, for by that date Lille, Arras, Douai, Bethune, and Lens were reported to be clear of Germans. On that day there occurred an event which was to change the whole aspect of the war. The direction of the march of the German First Army was altered. Hitherto an advance on Paris had been regarded as almost certain, but just after midnight on the night of the 3rd and 4th of September, a dispatch was published in Paris to the effect that contact with the Germans on the line creil nantuil had been lost. Some unexpected movement was clearly foreshadowed, and early in the morning of the 4th, aeroplanes rose from the city to solve the mystery. During the forenoon, they were able to report to General Galliani, the military governor of Paris, that cavalry scouts followed by large bodies of infantry were moving in a southeasterly direction across the British front, and further air reconnaissances, in which the British aviators did splendid service, placed it beyond all doubt that all day long on the 4th the German First Army was moving generally east of a line drawn from Antuil to Lise on the River Ourcq, a consideration as to the probable reasons which induced General von Kluck to accept the hazard of attempting a flank march across the face of an enemy in position and in the immediate vicinity of a large fortress, may with advantage be reserved. The plan was apparently conceived with the object of making a vigorous effort to break the Allies' line at some point of supposed weakness. But whatever may have been its cause or its ultimate object, the French commanders were quick to realize that such changes do not often occur in war, 
and to grasp the fact that this flank march offered them an exceptionally favorable opportunity for attack. The project of a further retirement behind the Seine was at once abandoned. It was General Galliani who took the first step, for on the morning of the 4th of September he conceived the idea of launching the 6th Army against the German forces moving southeast. At 9 a.m. he thus wrote to General Monori, I shall give you your marching orders so soon as I know the direction of the march of the British Army. Meanwhile, be ready to march this afternoon so as to make an attack tomorrow, the 5th of September, east of Paris. He then telephoned his action to the Generalissimo, who approved of the course taken, and General Joffre in the evening issued the necessary orders to his troops. General Joffre's orders for attack, with special reference to the risky situation of the German First Army, were forthwith sent to the various generals in command of the French and British forces, and all the available forces were to be ready for the offensive on the morning of the 6th. The arrival of the 4th Corps from the neighborhood of Verdun was delayed, also two reserve divisions too exhausted to take their places in line at the appointed time. But by a brilliant move later, the military governor of Paris harried portions of these troops to the firing line by commandeering thousands of motor cars, taxi cabs, and motor omnibuses. The area on which the battle was about to be contested may be delineated as follows. A line drawn east and west through Compiègne forms the northern boundary, and a similar line through Cézanne and vitry le françois will mark the southern edge, the sides of the battlefield being marked by north and south lines drawn through Verdun and slightly to the west of Compiègne, respectively. A rectangle is thus formed, inside of which took place all the fighting of the Battle of the Marne, and it includes the entrenched positions on the right bank of the Aisne, back to which the Germans retired after their defeat. The length of the rectangle from east to west is roughly 120 miles, and the distance from the southern to the northern edge is 50 miles, so that the battlefield may be said to cover an area of some 6,000 square miles. The eastern strip is, generally speaking, a large cultivated plain, in which the Marne, flowing through a well-marked valley, receives as tributaries the Orc and the two Morins. Speaking generally, the roads within the area forming the battlefield are good, and this applies to the lesser by-roads as well as to the main routes. In many cases, the latter are fringed with the tall trees so characteristic of French roads, a factor which was not without military importance in view of the excellent ranging marks thus afforded for military fire. The woods with which the country abounds have mostly a thick undergrowth, which renders them a distinct obstacle to attacking troops, but such undergrowth is not to be found to quite the same extent in the larger forests. A marked distinction between the battlefield and the corresponding area of English country is the almost total absence of the hedgerows so distinctive in rural England. This factor gave great freedom of movement and was on the whole in favor of the attacking side. Such was the setting for the great struggle which was now to open. The field was worthy of such a contest. It had witnessed the most brilliant efforts of Napoleon's strategy and had been the scene of two decisive battles of the world. At Valmy in 1792, the elder Kellermann had stemmed the tide of invasion on the very day when France first declared herself a republic. Thirteen centuries earlier at Chalons, the Roman general Aetius had driven back the Huns when, under Attila, the torrent of their arms was directed west and south, and their myriads marched under the guidance of one mastermind to the overthrow of the new and old powers of the world. It is difficult to tell the actual numbers arrayed for battle, because the two sides have withheld the exact lists of casualties since the war began, and the exact composition of the reserve corps on the German side is unknown. Exclusive of the garrisons at Verdun and Paris, General Joffre had at least 700,000 men at his disposal. Major Witten states, it is generally believed, except by the German public, that the Germans were superior in numbers along the battlefront. The total estimate of the armies engaged is put by some authorities as high as 3 million men. Both sides fully realized the importance of the battle which was now opening, and, by proclamations circulated among the troops, the higher commands strove to bring the urgency of the issue clearly before the rank and file. 
The order of the day, drawn up by the French Generalissimo, is couched in somewhat unconventional terms. Apart from the absence of the customary references to the defense of home and country, it was remarkable for its curt, peremptory, and almost menacing tone. It ran as follows. At the moment when a battle, on which depends the welfare of the country, is about to begin, I have to remind all ranks that the time for looking back is past. Every effort must be made to attack the enemy and hurl him back. Troops which find advance impossible must stand their ground at all costs and die rather than give way. This is a moment when no faltering will be tolerated. The tone of this brief document is curiously at variance with the dramatic appeals to national sentiment and to stirring recollection of bygone victories by which, at critical moments, orders of the day to French armies are usually characterized. Although some fighting had taken place throughout the 5th on the line damartin Mio, the battle proper may be said to have begun at dawn on Sunday, the 6th of September, a dawn which gave promise of a day of almost tropical heat. The French 6th Army had as its task to force the passage of the River Orc between Lycée and New Shells and to make for Chateau Thierry, a movement which was practically tantamount to an order to attack the flank and rear of the German 1st Army. At daybreak, the French troops marched out, the 6th Army acting in two wings, of which the right was formed by the Reserve Corps, which had occupied the line cuissy yvernay neuf Montier. From this line, early on the morning of the 6th, the swing was once more set in motion. The Germans, who were apparently unprepared for such an onslaught, being attacked on the rolling hills round Montillon and Penchard. The French artillery made short work of the German field guns posted right and left of the Mio Soissons Road and on a smaller elevation above the village of Entrepilly. The village of Barcy was very heavily shelled throughout the day and was reduced to ruins before being taken toward evening by a battalion of chasseurs a pied. Here fell Major Derbal of the Second Suaves, brother of General Derbal, his grave dug by the shell which caused his death, and on the ground which sloped toward the Orc, French and German dead lay in hundreds, in some cases the foes transfixed with bayonets as they had fallen fighting. The day had been one of frequent hand-to-hand -hand encounters, but when darkness fell, General Lamaze's corps had gained several miles of ground and was in occupation of the line chambry barcy marcilly While the French Reserve Corps was thus making headway to the east, the Seventh Corps on its left was attacking the line Marcelli assy en montienne At daybreak, it had seized the village of saint Suple and was able to push on with considerable speed, for practically the whole of the German Fourth Reserve Corps was held by General Lamaze's troops on the right. Part of it was, however, falling back in a northeasterly direction toward assy en montienne The commander of the German Corps had not been slow to realize that the fighting which developed was something far different from a mere affair of advanced troops, and had, early in the morning, sent off to General von Kluck urgent appeals for assistance. During the day, General von Kluck continued to send off further reinforcements to deal with what was an obvious peril to his right flank, but these columns had now to run the gauntlet of the French 8th Division, which was south of the Marne. Toward evening, some stiff fighting, in consequence, took place in the Mio Woods, with the result that the German columns were delayed in their crossing of the Marne, and the day closed on a distinct tactical success for the French 6th Army. The British forces also began operations at sunrise. Later, they seized the heights on the Grand Morin, west of Coulomiers, and by evening lay astride of the Grand Morin. But on the whole, they did but little fighting the first day. Meanwhile, the other French armies had come into action, and the Battle of the Grand Couronne de Nancy reacted favorably on that along the Marne. The next day it became apparent that General von Kluck had taken alarm and that large forces from the German First Army were recrossing the Marne in the direction of Ork. A comparatively small force was left to withstand the British. The latter moved forward to the attack, using their cavalry to great advantage. The French Fifth Army felt the relaxation of pressure on its front caused by the withdrawal of the Germans across the Marne, and its task became largely one of pursuit. The 4th and Ninth Armies had to sustain themselves against fierce attacks, while the Germans also threatened the French above Verdun. 
On the whole, the attainments of September 7th were a disappointment. On the 8th, the Germans began to feel the pressure, which was to culminate in a general retreat, although the day was notable for the violence of the German attacks. The British Army came more fully into play with the order to force the passage of the Petit Morin. The general order for the British Army was now to advance toward nogent lartal as a preliminary step to a further movement toward Chateau Thierry. When the troops left their bivouacs early in the morning, the sky was already full of airplanes and the air humming with the whir of their engines. As the German cavalry, which had been opposing the British throughout the 7th, had, on the morning of that day, fallen back to the right bank of the Petit Morin, the march of the British was at first undisturbed. But on reaching that river, it was soon realized that the German rear guard would not yield their line without a struggle, especially as the steep valley, covered with small but thick woods, distinctly favored the defense. On the British right, two battalions of the First Corps were sharply engaged about Sablonnières and suffered a number of casualties before they succeeded in clearing the Germans out of the village, in conjunction with the First Cavalry Brigade. On the left, the Third Corps had passed through La haute maison early in the morning and during the day attacked from the line signy signé joire in the direction of La ferté sous joire supported by some French guns, while the British howitzers shelled the bridges of that place across which Germans were streaming northward. By evening, the British had made good the Petit Morin and were on the west and south of La Ferte sous Joire. Wednesday, the 9th of September, was a day of high winds and drenching rains, which were especially violent in the center and east of the position. A critical moment had arrived, for on the Orc, the battle was still undecided, and the menace to General Manouri's left flank had grown extremely serious. In the absence of a general reserve, reinforcements, however, were difficult to obtain, but the military governor of Paris again rose to the occasion. During the night, he dispatched some Zouave troops by railway and by motors to Saint-Lys and Creil, and apparently at the same time, and by the latter method of transport, he sent the 62nd Reserve Division from the Paris garrison. The Germans on their side were making most determined efforts to drive in the French left flank. During the morning, they gained possession of Nantuil, and their troops were found as far as Baron to the northwest. The French cavalry soon made some prisoners, from whom it was discovered that the new arrivals consisted of at least a brigade of Landwehr troops. The French 4th Corps, less the 8th Division, was now upon the extreme left. In face of the severe attack upon his front, and fearing that the enemy at Baron might work round toward his rear, its commander withdrew toward Sillé le Long. General Manouri, when he heard what was happening, instantly sent a staff officer to General Boel, the commander of the corps, with instructions to hold his ground at all cost, and even to advance, regardless of sacrifices. In response to this urgent message, General Boel halted his men, and flanked by some of the 1st Cavalry Corps, struggled northwards toward Nantuil. General von Kluck had, however, now shot his bolt. News had apparently reached him about midday from General Marwitz, who was commanding the rear guard on the Marne, indicating the difficulties that he was experiencing in face of the strong British advance. This intelligence, coupled later with the news that the French Fourth Corps was coming on again at Nantuil, seems to have brought it home to him that there was now nothing for it but a frank retreat. The definite orders to that effect were issued somewhere about 8 p.m., but these were anticipated by instructions for the immediate withdrawal of troops not actually engaged. During the afternoon, French aeroplanes were therefore able to report that immense German trains east of the Ork were heading northeast, evidently in full retreat, and that these were being followed by columns of all arms. General Manouri summoned the 8th Division to leave the right flank and to hurry to Sillé le Long so as to be in position to support an attack which he proposed to deliver with his left early on the 10th. This, he hoped, would put the seal on the victory which his army had now unquestionably achieved. This happy consummation for the French was not, however, entirely due to the counterstroke of the 7th Division of the 4th Corps, for elsewhere along the line of the 6th Army, the remaining troops had played a gallant part. The Germans had previously destroyed the bridges at La Ferte-sous-Joire, and the British were unable to bridge the Marne during daylight. 
but by nightfall the bulk of the third corps had crossed and the second corps forced the passage higher up the river a german battery was immediately taken and the british pressed forward the french fifth army was also busy on the marne the ninth was compelled to give some ground but the third under general Sorel, put the crown prince's army near verdun into a position not unlike that of von kluck's forces a few days before according to trustworthy reports the german emperor on the evening of the ninth of september found himself compelled to sign an order for the general retreat of the five armies between paris and verdun a summary of the day might therefore be confined to the statement that the germans had acknowledged defeat and that therefore the french had won a victory this however is somewhat beside the point for the question to consider is how the situation presented itself to the french generalissimo at the end of the day he could not naturally have been aware of the issue of the momentous order of the german emperor and his conclusions had to be based upon results actually known on the orc the crisis had been passed with clear gain to the french sixth army that the germans would have to acknowledge defeat was extremely probable but the extent of his own victory remained problematic general joffre had experienced constant retreat himself almost since the war broke out but he had never for a moment allowed retreat to affect his determination to use it purely as a means of resuming the offensive at his own time and under his own conditions such time and conditions had occurred and general joffre had been quick to use them Everything, therefore, depended upon the capacity of his armies so to press the pursuit as to deny the enemy the power of reforming within a reasonable time or within a favorable situation for retaking the offensive. The next morning the British started in pursuit in the pouring rain. Many parties of the Germans were rounded up, but the bulk of them were glad to surrender. The French armies also joined in the pursuit, with changes of front to the northeast according to General Joffre's plan as a whole. The retreat of the Germans could not be called a rout, since it was well managed and the heavy guns were got away in safety according to plans prepared with the thoroughness characteristic of the Germans. The last of the infantry escorting the guns were hurried away in motor cars. The pursuit continued on the following day, and finally the Germans reached their entrenched positions on the Aisne, the fact that they sought shelter being the most eloquent confession of failure they could have made. End of section 16. This recording is in the public domain. Section 17 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 15. The World War edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 17. The Fall of Antwerp, 1914, by Horace Green. The invasion of Belgium began with the attack upon Liège, which was followed by the destruction of one town or city after another, till Brussels was taken August 20th, and then more two days later. With the fall of Brussels, the Belgian army withdrew to Antwerp, which was besieged for ten days prior to its fall, October 9th. The Belgian army escaped south through Ostend to the Iser, north of Dunkirk. The Editor Antwerp, the temporary capital of Belgium, was at this time invested, but not yet besieged, by the German army. On the south, the city was already cut off by several regiments of the 9th and 10th German Army Corps and General von Bohn. The river Scheldt and the Dutch border formed a wall on the north and west. It was to Antwerp, therefore, that we determined to go. Judging from the looks of the country and the burning villages, we were on the heels of a devastating army. For three, four, and five miles on either side of the road, beautiful trees lay flat upon the ground. It was not until we saw groups of Belgian soldiers tearing down their own walls and hedges and applying match and gasoline to those which still stood, that we realized that this was a case of self-inflicted destruction. Farmhouses, stores, churches, old Belgian mansions, and windmills were either in flames or smoldering ruins. Where burning had not been sufficient, powder and dynamite had been applied to destroy landmarks which for centuries had been the country's pride. 
As far as the eye could reach, the countryside was flattened to a desert. The devastation was for the defensive purpose of giving an unobstructed view to the cannon of Antwerp's outer fortifications, which, on that side, covered one sector of the circle swept by her enormous guns. I should hesitate to mention the millions of dollars of self-inflicted damage to Antwerp's suburbs alone. There is no need of describing in detail Antwerp at the time of my first visit. One or two pictures will suffice to give a rough idea of its existence up to the time of the bombardment. Try to imagine, for example, going about your business in New York or Boston or Los Angeles when your country, a territory perhaps the size of the New England states, was already two-thirds overrun, burnt, smashed, and conquered by a hostile nation whose forces were now within 19 miles of the gates of the capital. Imagine that nation's warriors in the act of crushing your tiny army, whose remnants were already exhausted and on the verge of despair. Then picture a quaint, sleepy city with shadowy alleys and twisting, gabled streets, in which every other store and house was decorated with King Albert's picture, draped in the red, black, and yellow banner of the country, a city whose atmosphere was charged with fear and suspicion and excitement. Sometimes a crowd of a thousand or two drew one toward the central station, where bedraggled refugee families, just arrived from Liège, Termond, Erchaux, and Malines, stood on street corner or wagon top and thrilled the crowd with tales of atrocities and the story of their flight from their burning homes to the south. Now and then the crowd parted before the clanging bell of a Red Cross ambulance, rushing its load of bleeding bodies to the hospitals along the Place de Mer. Nurses, male or female, clung to the ambulance steps. During the daytime, the ordinary things of life went on, for the good burghers and shopkeepers went about their business as usual, and generally speaking, fought against fear as bravely as the soldiers in the trenches stood up against the German howitzers. It was only after dark, when martial law permitted no lights of any kind, that the city seemed to shiver and suck in its breath. Doors were barricaded, iron shutters came down, and behind them, people talked in whispers. Such, very briefly, was the condition of Antwerp at the time we arrived. That very evening, word came that the Belgian forces, which had been engaged with the enemy for five consecutive days of severe fighting, had retired behind the southern ramparts of the city. During the night, the stream of incoming wounded confirmed to the news of battle. In the moonlight, and later in the gray dawn, I watched the long lines of Belgian hounds pulling their rapid-fire guns toward the trenches. Many times later, I was destined to see them. They made a picturesque and stimulating sight, those faithful dogs of war, fettered and harnessed, their tongues hanging out as they lay patiently beneath the gun trucks, awaiting the order to go into action, or, when the word had been given, trotted along the dusty roads, each pair tugging to the battle front a lean, gray engine of destruction. Though not officially admitted to the besieged city at the time of the second visit, I went at once to my old stand, the Hotel Saint Antoine, now converted into British staff headquarters. At sundown, a mist crept up from the river, and through it we heard a roar of welcome and the rumble of heavy artillery. Charging down the Avenue de Kaiser came a hundred London motor buses, Piccadilly signs and all, some filled, some half-filled, with a wet-looking bunch of Tommies, followed by armored mitrailleuses, a few 6.7 naval guns, officers' machines, commissary and ammunition carriages, the first brigade of Winston Churchill's Army of Relief, which for five days was destined to make so valiant but so short a fight against the overwhelming German army. There was something typically British in the way those Englishmen went about the defense of Antwerp. In the streets and barracks, and more especially at the Saint Antoine, where I stayed until its doors were closed, I saw them at close range during that week of horror. Once when I was eating with a company of Marines near their temporary barracks, they gave me the password to the trenches, and although I only got as far as the inner line of forts on that day, it gave me an opportunity to observe the work of the men under long-range firing. Here was Belgium's last stronghold, on the verge of downfall. The outer line of forts had already fallen. Forts Wavre, saint Catherine, Velham, and Lierre were already prey to the Krupp mortars, 
the German hosts were swarming across the river Neth, six miles to the city south, and the cowering populace in their flight made the streets terrible to look upon. Yet at the Saint Antoine there was no particular flurry, so far at least as the officers were concerned. At night they worked over their war maps. In the daytime they went out to the forts. If only two or three of a group returned, you would naturally have to draw your own conclusions as to the fate of the rest. Those English gentlemen went about their jobs of life and death with the same detached coolness as if their hunters were being saddled or they were waiting for the referee's whistle in rugby football. Their attitude was infernally exasperating, yet you couldn't help taking off your hat to their sublime nerve and indifference. By that time, we of Antwerp were getting a very fair imitation of a city besieged. Water supply had already been cut off for some days. There was just enough for cooking purposes. Bathing in such pleasantries were out of the question, even for royalty. Monday, October 5th, the night before the city emptied itself of non-combatants, was almost a festive occasion at the Saint Antoine. The British army gave tremendous confidence to the stricken city and the tired Belgian soldiers, a bit of pride before the fall. New faces turned up, friends in the English army met, shook hands, and discussed the outlook. In the flash of an eye, these scenes changed to scenes of terror. The news leaked out and spread like wildfire that the Kaiser's men had crossed the river Neat and had placed their big guns within range of the city. It was not until 48 hours later that the populace saw a handful of Flemish posters pasted in out-of-the-way corners, posters signed by the civil government, which thanked the populace for retaining until the present time their praiseworthy sang froid and regretting that the responsibilities of their office necessitated their own removal to a neighborhood more safe. Then came the flight. Ye knew the fear of the Germans had gotten into their blood when waiters dropped their plates and dishes and ran, when shops, houses, hotels closed, and the people melted away, when the French chambermaid besought with frightened eyes that Monsieur would take her away to England, and when the hotel proprietor disappeared without even asking for his bill. Here on the waterfront was a sight to come again and rend the memory. The crowds were endeavoring to get away on one of the two avenues still open. I estimated that between five in the afternoon and the following dawn, 300,000 persons must have passed through the city's gates. They were the people of Antwerp itself, swelled by exiles from Alost, Erschot, Malines, Termond, and other cities to the south and west. Intermittently, for two days and nights, I watched them from my room in the Queen's. From five yards beneath my window ledge came the shuffle-shuffle of unending feet, the creaks and groans of heavy cartwheels, the talk and babble of guttural tongues, the yelp of hounds as the thousands moved and wept and surged and jostled along throughout the night and into the uncertain mist of that October morning. They were so close I could have jumped into their carts or dropped a pebble on their heads. Infinitely more impressive than the retreat of the Allied armies or the victorious entry of the Germans a little later, was the pageant of this pitiful army, without guns or leaders. The twenty-foot entrance to that pontoon bridge seemed to me like the mouth of a funnel through which poured the dense misery of an entire nation. Think of this army's composition. A great city was emptying itself of human life. Not only a great city, but all the people driven to it from the outside, all who had congregated in Belgium's last refuge and its strongest fort. They bore themselves bravely, the greater number plodding along silently in the footsteps of those who went ahead with no thoughts of their direction, some of them even chatting and laughing. You saw great open wagons carrying baby carriages, perambulators, pots and kettles, an old chair, huge bundles of household goods, and the ubiquitous Belgian bicycle strapped on the side. There were small wagons and more great wagons crowded with twenty, thirty, forty people, aged brown women buried like shrunk walnuts in a mass of shawls, girls sitting listlessly on piles of straw, and children fitfully asleep or very much awake and crying lustily. In this way the city emptied itself, but so slowly that the very slowness of the movement wore the marchers out. Each family group was limited to the speed of its oldest member. Hundreds gave it up and lay by the road, or formed little gypsy camps under the trees. At night, these were lighted by fires, overshadowed by the greater fire from the distant burning city, 
and beside them stretched dumb-looking souls, watching vaguely those who still had the strength to move. Watching these wretches got so on my nerves that I had to get out and do something. With a British intelligence officer, formerly of Sir John French's staff, I wandered down to the southern quarter of the city known as Bershem. As usual, the guns at the outer forts had been booming through the evening. From the city's ramparts, you could not only feel the shudder of the earth, but you could see the occasional splashes of flame from the Belgian batteries, answered in the dim distance to the south by smaller, less vivid splashes issuing from the mouths of the German instruments of culture, which throughout the night pounded ruthlessly on the unprotected houses within the city limits. On the way, we stopped in at the British Field Hospital to see a wounded British friend. As we left the hospital on the Rue de Leopold, a shrieking skyrocket whizzed by above us and buried its hissing head in the river to the north. One or two more fell at a distance of several hundred yards, and in the southern part of the city, flames from several houses shot up into the quiet, windless night. The bombardment was on. The time was 12.07, Wednesday midnight. For a moment, I did not realize that this was the beginning of the end of Antwerp. I had heard so much gunfire and seen so many bombs dropping from aeroplanes that I did not fully appreciate the significance of these shells. As I walked down the Avenue de Kaiser, the next morning, I thought at first it was Sunday, or rather a year of Sundays all rolled into one. Overnight, the city had been transformed into a tomb. Shops were closed. Iron shutters were pulled down everywhere. Trolley cars stood in the streets as they had been left. My own footsteps resounded fearfully on the pavement, and I walked five blocks before I saw a human being. All Thursday afternoon, the German Taubes circled above the city, mostly along the waterfront. Below them puffed little clouds of smoke where the Belgian anti-aircraft guns were exploding. I fancy the airmen were locating the pontoon bridge and signaling the battery commanders six miles away. But during Wednesday and Thursday, when the crowds of refugees were assembled on the waterfront, not a single bomb dropped among them. A few shells well placed would have slaughtered them like sheep. Before and during the bombardment, I am quite certain that the Germans intended to frighten rather than injure non-combatants. The bombardment lasted 40 hours. That night, Thursday, October 8th, the second and last night which the town held out, all of the Americans were gathered at the Queen's. The firing by this time was terrific. Except for the lurid glare of the burning buildings which lit up the streets, the city was in total darkness. About an hour after darkness settled on us, I climbed to the roof of the Queen's Hotel, from which, for a few minutes, I looked out upon the most horrible and at the same time the most gorgeous panorama that I ever hoped to see. The entire southern portion of the city appeared a desolate ruin. Whole streets were ablaze, and great sheets of fire rose to the height of thirty or forty feet. Even more glorious was the scene to the north. On the opposite side of the Scheldt, the oil tanks, the first objects to be set on fire by bombs from the German Taubes, were blazing furiously and vomiting huge volumes of oil-laden smoke. Looking over on this side of the river, too, I could see the crackling wooden houses of the village of St. Nicholas, lighting with their glow all of northern Antwerp and the waterfront. In the swampy meadows on the farther bank, we could see the frightened refugees as they hurried along the still-protected road to Ghent. They passed on our side of the burning village, not 500 yards away. Every now and then, as a fitful flame lighted the meadow, I could see the figures silhouetted against the red background. They appeared to be actually walking through the flames. There was at this time an ominous lull in the moaning pound of shrapnel. Out of the darkness in the direction of West Antwerp came a new sound, the low, methodical beat of feet. The noise became gradually louder and louder until one could hear the rumble of heavy wheels and distinguish the sound of voices above the crowd. This was the beginning of the British and Belgian retreat, which started at about 8 o'clock Thursday night and under cover of darkness continued unbroken for eight hours. Following the line taken by the escaping populace, this retreat went past our position on the waterfront. Before dawn on Friday morning, when the light became strong enough for the advancing army to make out the enemy's position, practically the entire Belgian army, plus 10,000 Royal British Naval Marines, had got across the pontoon bridge and were well along the road to Ghent. During all these hours, 
Squads of gendarmes with fixed bayonets held back such remaining townsfolk as attempted to get near the bridge. To these wretches, it seemed that their last avenue of escape had been cut off. Remaining in the city as long as possible, Mr. Green at length started for the pontoon bridge to escape into Holland, when a more terrible explosion than any that had been heard before rocked the city to its foundation. The retreating Belgian army had blown up the bridge, apparently cutting off the last avenue of escape. Mr. Green managed to clamber aboard a river barge laden to the sinking point with Antwerp's peaceful burghers and their dumb-looking women and children, and from this barge, which landed a few miles down the Scheldt, he made his way to Roosendaal, just across the Dutch border. End of Section 17. This recording is in the public domain. Section 18 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 18, A Prisoner in Ruhleben, 1915, by Jeffrey Pike. The author of the following narrative left London in September 1914 and set out for Berlin, unknown to the German authorities, in quest of such information and experience as a press correspondent might gain under such conditions. Not long after his arrival in Berlin, he was arrested without explanation and put in one prison after another until finally he was transferred from solitary confinement to the prison camp for civilians at Ruhleben near Berlin. From the latter prison, wonderful to relate, he made his escape, in company with a fellow prisoner, July 9, 1915, and succeeded in making his way by night to Holland and thence to London. The Editor The first time I saw Ruhleben, it was already dusk. There were six inches of snow upon the ground and several degrees of frost. The soles of my boots were worn away from walking up and down the cell. I reckoned that I had altogether walked 1,730 miles up and down those 11 feet. I walked with my sock feet upon the ice and snow. It was very cold. After we had passed along a brick wall and had been admitted at a door halfway along, I found myself in a square. In the center of the square was an electric standard with an arc light which flickered. Beneath this arc light walked up and down hundreds of dark couples. They walked energetically and seemed to have some object in doing so. I learned later that it was in order to keep warm. I was taken away to fill up my name on a slip and for the policeman who accompanied me to hand over my money. I was given a receipt for the greater part of it and was handed over about 30 marks in cash. There was a large map in the office and for the first time since October I saw where the line was on the western front. The last news that I had had was just before I got over the frontier. Then the great retreat of the Germans to the end was in full swing. Of this, the German public heard nothing but that their right wing had slightly altered its position backwards, um strategisch Grunde, for reasons of strategy. And then, much later, it was noticed that the daily reports contained mention of places that had been captured in the great advance. Gradually, the idea filtered through to the mind of the German public that they had retreated. The map with its flags and pins absorbed me immensely. I had not seen anything like it for more than four months. Then a soldier took me. We went down alleys, through doors. Everywhere there were people. The place was crowded with them. I went outside into the snow and up a staircase outside. I sat on a straw sack on the floor, and so did everyone. I lived for months in that place. It was impossible to stand upright in it, and at one spot the snow came gently through the roof. It was here I slept. The atmosphere was as thick as cheese. Nobody took his clothes off, or at best changed into others. We were so closely packed that it was impossible to put one's arms above one's head. The light went out, and an hour later there was silence. I could not sleep. It was intensely cold. I reckoned that there was one half square inch of window space per man, and my own particular half square inch was 18 feet away around the corner. These lofts in which we slept were the gables of the stables. 
In this loft, there were 200 people in four rows, two back to back in the center and one on each side. The people on the side, if tall, were unable to stand upright. The floor could not be seen for huddled forms that covered it. No one will ever know how much hope, how much despair, how much determination, how much suffering was hid in each of those 200 huddled heaps. The charm that I found in Huliban was purely relative, and it soon wore off. It is difficult, perhaps, for those whose tongues are only limited by what they have to say to understand how intense the pleasure of mere intercourse can be. I would lie back upon my sack and just listen to people borrowing spoons from each other or cursing each other for mutual coffee slopping. A universal shout of laughter would make me warm with delight, and a continual cry to someone to shut up would make me pause over every delectable syllable. Less, however, was the pleasure I took in the physical surroundings. It was my first morning there. I did nothing. I lay huddled on my sack of straw, vainly hoping that I might one day know again the meaning of the term warmth. But it was not long before a cry arose from the far-off depths of the loft, of, everyone outside, please, and I had to make a supreme effort to move my wretched carcass. I was still grasping my coffee bowl in a frantic attempt to get heat, long since flown. I stumbled numbly up and toward the door, and after passing two hurrying people with brooms, went out into the snow. It was very cold. There was a wind that cut. I found the scene of the night before repeated. Hundreds, thousands of forms, black against the snow, were moving like ants in every direction. What was everybody doing? I must find out and get something to do as well. I was standing thus when two dimly remembered figures suddenly laughed and clasped me by the hand. They were two old Cambridge friends, people I had never expected to see again, and whom I had completely forgotten. I found a very large Cambridge and Oxford colony, and we were all very merry. I still had nothing but a thin summer suit and a perfectly diaphanous shirt. The soles of my boots were worn away, and I had worn my one collar for sixteen weeks. My friends swept me away and clad me from head to foot in clothes that made my body glow with warmth. All of them gave me something, and I should have attained the proportions of a prima donna had I accepted everything in which they tried to wrap me up. My friends and their friends not merely clothed me but fed me for the first few days, gave me stores and books, bored themselves with my company, and left not a stone unturned to bring me back to life. It was not merely my friends. People I had never seen before were continually doing things for me, men whose purse was short and who had a limited amount of parcels sent them from home. The commanders of the camp and the barracks were soldiers. To the latter we gave money, to the former groveling respect. For a considerable time all newspapers were forbidden, and Vorwerts or any English paper was strictly forbidden at all times. Nevertheless, I always saw all the German newspapers, including Vorwerts and Maximilian Hardin's paper, the Zukunft. We had the number that was suppressed by the government in the spring. We had a regular subscription to the Times, and never a week went by without our seeing that or some other English paper. One method would be detected by the military, and we would discover another. Some men used to earn their living by getting hold of the English papers and letting them out at sixpence to one shilling per hour. It resulted in there being a species of club of persons who subscribed to obtain the news. Nearly all German soldiers are venal, as long as there is no risk attached to the service involved, and the Times is freely sold in Berlin. The complete disorganization that reigned in the camp for the first few months made it possible to do almost anything. I spent the first ten days of my stay at Ruleben trying to find out if there was any chance of obtaining an exchange of prisoners. At the end of that time, I not only came to the conclusion that there was none, but also suddenly got taken ill with double pneumonia. That evening, the loft captain sent for the one man in the camp who boasted any medical knowledge. The long and the short of the matter was that for days I lingered at death's door in the atmosphere of that loft. My friends nursed me day and night, taking it by turns to sit up with me. They got hold of the most wonderful things to feed me on and heaven only knows where they got them in that place. They had been continually urging the military doctor to come and see me, but he always replied that I could come and see him between nine and ten any morning that I cared to. One evening, thinking that they would not be able to keep me alive throughout the night, 
my friends got hold of the commander of the camp and induced him to telephone to the doctor, who was in Berlin on pleasure, to return at once. He did so. The doctor's mentality as regards myself when he arrived was, is he dead? If not, why not? He gave me two aspirins and remarked that I was too ill to be moved, remarking a little later in the week that I was not ill enough. He had me both ways. He never came to see me again. During the weeks that followed, I spent day and night upon my back. I was too weak to do a thing for myself, and during all that time, with all the long days and nights to get through, I became more and more of a daydreamer. The misery and futility of such a life took hold of me, driving me to the determination to do something, anything, to avoid any more of it. The determination to escape arose without any thought as to how it was to be done. It was not for several days that I even began to consider any plans. I had seen so little of the camp that I was untrammeled by any awe of the authorities. I knew that if I should eventually take on the idea and stick to it long enough and hard enough, I must pull through. The narrative goes on to indicate the insuperable difficulties and dangers that appeared to beset every plan of escape. Then the author made the acquaintance of a man who was ready to plot the way of escape with him. Together they studied every possibility. The way that finally led to success is not disclosed, since under the conditions which war imposes, it would not be discreet. The whole scheme worked most beautifully, and it is a matter of the keenest regret, the regret of an artificer at having to conceal his handiwork from the sight of men, that both my friend and I have agreed that until the German military authorities have discovered how we accomplished it, or circumstances rendered discretion nugatory, the secret shall not pass our lips. The plan was supremely obvious, and it still remains there for any one of the denizens of Ruleben whom it stares in the face and who cares to take the risk. After reaching Berlin, the two friends provided themselves with food and other supplies for travel by night across the country to the Dutch border. The author, weakened by his long illness, was compelled at times to rest every twenty minutes during their stealthy tramps through the darkness along hedges and in byways and at one time his friend was about to leave him apparently dead by the roadside when a last ray of hope restrained him. Thus, proceeding amidst the greatest hardships, they at last reached the border by night and met a friendly Dutch sentry, who permitted them to push on to their destination. And as we walked down a rough country lane at the end of which, not far away, was England, our jolly Dutch frontier guard who had taken us for smugglers said, You see that red roof cottage over there? I should think I do, I replied. I've been crawling about on my belly in mud all day in order to keep out of its sight. Well, he remarked, it's been a close thing for you. That cottage is in Holland. The rain from its roof drips off in Germany. End of section 18. This recording is in the public domain. Section 19 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War, edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 19. The Battle of the Slag Heaps, 1915, by Ian Hay. The Battle of Luce began with terrific bombardment, September 23rd, and the British assault of the 25th. On the French front, facing Vimy Heights, the French attack also began. German first-line trenches were taken by the Allies at Hugue, Vermelles, Luz, Suchet, Perthes, and 20,000 prisoners were captured. A British force under General Rawlinson later captured Luz itself. The battle in that region continued into the early part of October. The British losses in the battle were said to be about 45,000 men, including a major general and 28 battalion commanders. September 25th, the French launched an offensive against the Germans in Champagne in accordance with the plan which led to the attack on Luz. Here, too, the advances were made at fearful cost. The French took 150 guns and 25,000 prisoners, but lost about 120,000 men. The battalion in which Major Ian Hay, Beath, served, took part in the early fighting at Luce and was then sent back to rest. Almost immediately, however, 
they were recalled to the front lines to meet the German counterattacks. The following selection describes one of these attacks launched among the slag heaps of what had once been a great mining center. The Editor By midnight on the same Sunday, the battalion, now far under its original strength, had re-entered the scene of yesterday's long struggle, filing thither under the stars by a deserted and ghostly German boyau nearly ten feet deep. Fosse Alley erred in the opposite direction. It was not much more than four feet in depth. The chalky parapet could by no stretch of imagination be described as bulletproof. Dugouts and communication trenches were non-existent. On our left, the trench line was continued by the troops of another division. On our right lay another battalion of our own brigade. If the line has been made really continuous this time, observed the colonel, we should be as safe as houses. Wonderful fellows, these sappers. They have wired almost our whole front already. I wish they had had time to do it on our left as well. Within the next few hours, all defensive preparations possible in the time had been completed, and our attendant angels, most effectively disguised as royal engineers, had flitted away, leaving us to wait for Monday morning and Brother Bosch. With the dawn, our eyes, which had known no sleep since Friday night, peered roomily out over the whitening landscape. To our front, the ground stretched smooth and level for 200 yards, then fell gently away, leaving a clearly defined skyline. Beyond the skyline rose houses, of which we could descry only the roofs and upper windows. That must be either Haines or Dufresne, said Major Kemp. We are much farther to the left than we were yesterday. By the way, was it yesterday? The day before yesterday, sir, the ever-ready Waddell informed him. Never mind, today's the day anyhow, and it's going to be a busy day too. The fact is, we are in a tight place and all through doing too well. We have again penetrated so much farther forward than anyone else in our neighborhood that we may have to fall back a bit, but I hope not. We have a big stake, Waddell. If we can hold on to this position until the others make good upon our right and left, we shall have reclaimed a clear two miles of the soil of France, my son. The Major swept the horizon with his glasses. Let me see. That is probably Hullach away on our right front. The loose towers must be in line with us on our extreme right, but we can't see them for those hillocks. There's our old friend Fosse 8 towering over us on our left rear. I don't know anything about the ground on our absolute left, but so long as that flathead regiment hold on to their trench, we can't go too far wrong. Waddell, I don't like those cottages on our left front. They block the view and also spell machine guns. I see one or two very suggestive loopholes in those red-tiled roofs. Go and draw Ailing's attention to them. A little preliminary strafing will do them no harm. Five minutes later, one of Ailing's machine guns spoke out, and a cascade of tiles came sliding down the roofs of the offending cottages. That will tickle them up if they have any guns set up on those rafters, observed the major with ghoulish satisfaction. I wonder if Br'er Bosch is going to attack. I hope he does. There's only one thing I am afraid of, and that is that there may be some odd saps running out toward us, especially on our flanks. If so, we shall have some close work with bombs, a most ungentlemanly method of warfare. Let us pray for a straightforward frontal attack. But Br'er Bosch had other cards to play first. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the air was filled with whiz-bang shells moving in a lightning procession which lasted nearly half an hour. Most of these plastered the already scarred countenance of Fosse 8. Others fell shorter and demolished our parapet. When the tempest ceased as suddenly as it began, the number of casualties in the crowded trench was considerable. But there was little time to attend to the wounded. Already the word was running down the line. Look out to your front. Sure enough, over the skyline, 200 yards away, gray figures were appearing. Not in battalions, but tentatively in twos and threes. Next moment, a storm of rapid rifle fire broke from the trench. The gray figures turned and ran. Some disappeared over the horizon. Others dropped flat. Others simply curled up and withered. In three minutes, solitude reigned again, and the firing ceased. Well, that's that, observed Captain Wagstaff to Bobby Little upon the right of the battalion line. The Boche has bethought himself and went, as the poet says. Now he knows we're here and have brought our arquebuses with us. He'll try something more Ikey next time. Talking of time, what about breakfast? When was our last meal, Bobby? Haven't the vaguest notion, said Bobby sleepily. 
Well, it's about breakfast time now. Have a bit of chocolate? It's all I have. It was eight o'clock, and perfect silence reigned. All down the line, men, infinitely grubby, were producing still grubbier fragments of bully beef and biscuits from their persons. For an hour, squatting upon the sodden floor of the trench, it was raining yet again, the unappetizing intermittent meal proceeded. Then, hello, exclaimed Bobby with a jerk, for he was beginning to nod. What was that on our right? I'm afraid, replied Wagstaff, that it was bombs. It was right in this trench, too, about a hundred yards long. There must have been a sap leading up there, for the bombers certainly have not advanced overground. I've been looking out for them since stand two. Who is this anxious gentleman? A subaltern of the battalion on our right was forcing his way along the trench. He addressed Wagstaff. We're having a pretty bad time with Bosch bombers on our right, sir, he said. Will you send us down all the bombs you can spare? Wagstaff hoisted himself upon the parapet. I will see our CO at once, he replied, and departed at the double. It was a risky proceeding, for German bullets promptly appeared in close attendance, but he saved a good five minutes on his journey to battalion headquarters at the other end of the trench. Presently the bombs began to arrive, passed from hand to hand. Wagstaff returned, this time along the trench. We shall have a tough fight for it, he said. The Bosch bombers know their business and probably have more bombs than we have but those boys on our right seem to be keeping their end up. Can't we do anything? asked Bobby feverishly. Nothing, unless the enemy succeed in working right down here, in which case we shall take our turn of getting it in the neck, or giving it. I fancy old Ailing and his pop gun will have a word to say, if he can find a nice straight bit of trench. All we can do for the present is to keep a sharp lookout in front. I have no doubt they will attack in force when the right moment comes. For close on three hours, the bomb fight went on. Little could be seen, for the struggle was all taking place upon the extreme right, but the sounds of conflict were plain enough. More bombs were passed up, and yet more. Men, some cruelly torn, were passed down. Then a signal sergeant doubled up across country from somewhere in the rear, paying out wire, and presently the word went forth that we were in touch with the artillery. Directly after, sure enough, came the blessed sound and sight of British shrapnel bursting over our right front. That won't stop the present crowd, said Wagstaff, but it may prevent their reinforcements from coming up. We're holding our own, Bobby. What's that, Sergeant? The commanding officer, sir, announced Sergeant Carfrey, has just passed up that we are to keep a sharp lookout to our left. They've commenced for to bomb the English regiment now. Golly, both flanks. This is getting a trifle steep, remarked Wagstaff. Detonations could now be distinctly heard upon the left. If they succeed in getting round behind us, said Wagstaff in a low voice to Bobby, we shall have to fall back a bit into line with the rest of the advance. Only a few hundred yards, but it means a lot to us. It hasn't happened yet, said Bobby stoutly. Captain Wagstaff knew better. His more experienced eye and ear had detected the fact that the position of the regiment upon the left was already turned, but he said nothing. Presently, the tall figure of the colonel was seen, advancing in leisurely fashion along the trench, stopping here and there to exchange a word with a private or a sergeant. The regiment on the left may have to fall back, men, he was saying. We, of course, will stand fast and cover their retirement. This most characteristic announcement was received with a matter-of-fact, very good, sir, from its recipients, and the colonel passed on to where the two officers were standing. Hello, Wagstaff, he said. Good morning. We shall get some very pretty shooting presently. The enemy are massing on our left front down behind those cottages. How are things going on our right? They're holding their own, sir. Good. Just tell Ailing to get his guns trained. But doubtless he's done so already. I must get back to the other flank. And back to the danger spot, our CO passed, an upright, gallant figure, saying little, exhorting not at all, but instilling confidence and cheerfulness by his very presence. Halfway along the trench, he encountered Major Kemp. How are things on the left, sir, was the Major's sotto voce inquiry. Not too good. Our position is turned. We've been promised reinforcements, but I doubt if they can get up in time. Of course, when it comes to falling back, this regiment goes last. Of course, sir. Highlanders, 400 yards, at the enemy advancing half left, rapid fire. Twenty minutes had passed. The regiment still stood immovable though its left flank was now utterly exposed. All eyes and rifles were fixed upon the cluster of cottages. Through the gaps that lay between these could be discerned the advance of the German infantry, line upon line moving toward the trench upon our left. 
the ground to our front was clear. Each time one of these lines passed a gap, the rifles rang out, and Ailing's remaining machine gun uttered joyous barks. Still, the enemy advanced. His shrapnel was bursting overhead. Bullets were whistling from nowhere, for the attack in force was now being pressed home in earnest. The deserted trench upon our left ran right through the cottages, and this restricted our view. No hostile bombers could be seen. It was evident that they had done their bit and handed on the conduct of affairs to others. Behind the shelter of the cottages, the infantry were making a safe detour, and were bound, unless something unexpected happened, to get round behind us. They'll be firing from our rear in a minute, said Kemp between his teeth. Loguerre, order your platoon to face about and be ready to fire over the parados. Young Loguerre's method of executing this command was characteristically thorough. He climbed in leisurely fashion upon the parados, and standing there, with all his six foot three in full view, issued his orders. Face this way, boys. Keep your eyes on that group of buildings just behind the empty trench, in below the fosse. You'll get some target practice presently. Don't go and forget that you're the straightest shooting platoon in the company. There they are, he pointed with his stick. Lots of them, coming through that gap in the wall. Now then, rapid fire and let them have it. Oh, well done, boys. Good shooting. Very good. Very good and... He stopped suddenly, swayed and toppled back into the trench. Major Kemp caught him in his arms and laid him gently upon the chalky floor. There was nothing more to be done. Young Laguerre had given his platoon their target, and the platoon were now firing steadily upon the same. He closed his eyes and sighed like a tired child. Carry on, Major, he murmured faintly. I'm all right. So died the simple-hearted, valiant enthusiast whom we'd christened Othello. The entire regiment, what was left of it, was now firing over the back of the trench, for the wily Teuton had risked no frontal attack, seeing that he could gain all his ends from the left flank. Despite vigorous rifle fire and the continuous maledictions of the machine gun, the enemy were now pouring through the cottages behind the trench. Many gray figures began to climb up the face of Fosse 8, where apparently there was nothing to say them nay. "'We shall have a cheery walk back, I don't think,' murmured Wagstaff. He was right. Presently a withering fire was opened from the summit of the Fosse, which soon began to take effect in the exiguous and ill-protected trench." The colonel is wounded, sir, reported the sergeant major to Major Kemp. Badly? Yes, sir. Kemp looked round him. The regiment was now alone in the trench, for the gallant company upon their right had been battered almost out of existence. We can do no more good by staying here any longer, said the major. We've done our little bit. I think it is a case of home, John. Tell off a party to bring in the CO, sergeant major. Then he passed the order. Highlanders, retire to the trenches behind by companies, beginning from the right. End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. Section 20 of The World War. Read for LibriVox.org by Abai. Flamethrowers. Photograph page 100. This remarkable photograph shows a squad of French soldiers drenching no man's land in front of their trenches with liquid fire. Of this terrifying adaptation of an old method of warfare, Captain F. H. Elliot, in his book Trench Fighting, says, Liquid fire was first used by the Germans, and it is largely a morale effect weapon. The methods used to produce liquid fire differ. They consist generally of a tank containing highly inflammable liquid, petrol or coal oil. This liquid is forced out under pressure of compressed nitrogen gas, 90 pounds pressure, through a long pipe nozzle and is ignited by a safety lighter on reaching the air, producing large volumes of smoke and flame, and has a terrifying effect on troops who do not understand the method of combating it. However, the flame which is thus produced heats the surrounding air, and this heated air tends to lift the flame, rather than to allow it to be directed in the same manner that you would direct a stream of water. Consequently, should a liquid fire attack come down your trench, all that is necessary is for you not to expose yourself above the height of the trench, and a few well-directed Mills bombs will effectively dispose of the attacking party. 
If caught in the open by a liquid fire attack, bayonet men should charge madly at the source of the fire, and the chances are about ten to one that they will not be seriously injured, and they will be able to stab the nozzle man. The range of liquid fire is about 25 yards, and it can be used with considerable effect in protecting a trench from a frontal attack. Its value, however, as a trench weapon, is decidedly limited. The Allies at the present time have a very much more effective liquid fire apparatus than that of the enemy. End of section 20「Section 21 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War, edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 21. The Legion Captures a Trench, 1915, by Edward Morley the next morning at eight a m hot coffee was passed round and we breakfasted on sardines cheese and bread with the coffee to wash it down at nine the command passed down the lines every man ready up went the knapsack on every man's back and rifle in hand we filed along the trench the cannonading seemed to increase in intensity from the low places in the parapet we caught glimpses of barbed wire which would glisten in occasional flashes of light our own we could plainly see and a little farther beyond was the german wire suddenly at the sound of a whistle we halted the command bayonet au canon passed down the section a drawn-out rattle followed and the bayonets were fixed then the whistle sounded again this time twice we adjusted our straps each man took a look at his neighbor's equipment i turned and shook hands with the fellows next to me they were grinning and i felt my own nerves a-quiver as we waited for the signal waiting seemed an eternity as we stood there a shell burst close to our left a moment later it was whispered along the line that an adjutant and five men had gone down what were we waiting for i glanced at my watch it was nine fifteen exactly the germans evidently had the range two more shells burst close to the same place we inquired curiously who was hit this time our response was two whistles that was our signal i felt my jaws clenching and the man next to me looked white it was only for a second then every one of us rushed at the trench wall each and every man struggling to be the first out of the trench in a moment we had clambered up and out we slid over the parapet wormed our way through gaps in the wire formed in line and at the command moved forward at march step straight toward the german wire the world became a roaring hell shell after shell burst near us sometimes right among us and as we moved forward at the double quick men fell right and left we could hear the subdued rattling of the mit rail looses and the roar of volley fire but above it all i could hear with almost startling distinctness the words of the captain shouting in his clear high voice en avant viva la france as we marched forward toward our goal huge geysers of dust spouted into the air rising behind our backs from the rows of seventy fives supporting us in front the fire curtain outlined the whole length of the enemy's line with a neatness and accuracy that struck me with wonder as the flames burst through the pall of smoke and dust around us above all was blackness but at its lower edge the curtain was fringed with red and green flames marking the explosion of the shells directly over the ditch and parapet in front of us low flying clouds mingled with the smoke curtain so that the whole brightness of the day was obscured out of the blackness fell a trickling rain of pieces of metal lumps of earth knapsacks rifles cartridges and fragments of human flesh we went on steadily nearer and nearer now we seemed very close to the wall of shells streaming from our own guns curving just above us and dropping into the trenches in front the effect was terrific i almost braced myself against the rocking of the earth like a sailor's instinctive gait in stormy weather in a single spot immediately in front of us not over ten metres in length i counted twelve shells bursting so fast that i could not count them without missing other explosions the scene was horrible and terrifying across the wall of our own fire poured shell after shell from the enemy tearing through our ranks from overhead the shrapnel seemed to come down in sheets and from behind the stinking blinding curtain came volleys of steel-jacketed bullets their whine unheard and their effect almost unnoticed 
i think we moved forward simply from habit with me it was like a dream as we went on ever on here and there men dropped the ranks closing automatically of a sudden our own fire curtain lifted in a moment it had ceased to bar our way and jumped like a living thing to the next line of the enemy we could see the trenches in front of us now quite clear of fire but flattened almost beyond recognition the defenders were either killed or demoralized calmly almost stupidly we parried or thrust with the bayonet at those who barred our way without a backward glance we leaped the ditch and went on straight forward toward the next trench marked in glowing outline by our fire i remember now how the men looked their eyes had a wild unseeing look in them everybody was gazing ahead trying to pierce the awful curtain which cut us off from all sight of the enemy always the black pall smoking and burning appeared ahead just ahead of us hiding everything we wanted to see the drama was played again and again each time as we approached so close that fragments of our own shells occasionally struck a leading file the curtain lifted as by magic jumped the intervening meters and descended upon the enemy's trench farther on the ranges were perfect we followed blindly sometimes at a walk sometimes at a dog trot and when close to our goal on the dead run you could not hear a word in that pandemonium all commands were given by example or by gesture when our captain lay down we knew our orders were to lie down too when he waved to the right to the right we swerved if to the left we turned to the left a sweeping gesture with an arm extended first up then down meant halt lie down from down up it meant rise when his hand was thrust swiftly forward we knew he was shouting on avant and when he waved his hand in a circle above his head we broke into the double quick three times on our way to the second trench the captain dropped and we after him then three short quick rushes by the companies and a final dash as the curtain of shells lifts and drops farther away then a hand-to-hand -hand struggle short and very bloody some using their bayonets others clubbing their rifles and grenades a minute or two in the trench was ours the earthen fortress so strong that the germans had boasted that it could be held by a janitor and two washerwomen was in the hands of the legion as we swept on the trench cleaners entered the trench behind and began setting things to rights far down six to eight metres below the surface they found an underground city long tunnels with chambers opening to right and left bedrooms furnished with bedsteads washstands tables and chairs elaborate mess-rooms some fitted with pianos and phonographs there were kitchens too and even bathrooms so complex was the labyrinth that three days after the attack germans were found stowed away in the lateral galleries the passages were choked with dead hundreds of germans who had survived the bombardment were torn to pieces deep beneath the ground by french hand grenades and buried where they lay in rifles munitions and equipment the booty was immense we left the subterranean combat raging underneath us and continued on as we passed over the main trench we were enfiladed by cannon placed in armored turrets at the end of each section of trench the danger was formidable but it too had been foreseen in a few moments these guns were silenced by hand grenades shoved point-blank through the gun ports just then i remember i looked back and saw pala down on his hands and knees i turned and ran over to help him up he was quite dead killed in the act of rising from the ground his grotesque posture struck me at the time as funny and i could not help smiling i suppose i was nervous our line was wearing thin half way to the third trench we were reinforced by battalion e coming from behind the ground in our rear was covered with our men all at once came a change the german artillery in front ceased firing and the next second we saw the reason why in the trench ahead the german troops were pouring out in black masses and advancing toward us at a trot was it a counter-attack tan mire said a man near me another of a different race said we'll show them then as suddenly our own artillery ceased firing and the mystery became plain the germans were approaching in columns of four officers to the front hands held in the air and as they came closer we could distinguish the steady cry kameraden kameraden they were surrendering how we went at our work out flew our knives and in less time than it takes to tell it we had mingled among the prisoners slicing off their trousers buttons cutting off suspenders and hacking through belts all the war shoes had their laces cut according to the regulations laid down in the last french manual and thus slopping along their hands helplessly in their breeches pockets to keep their trousers from falling round their ankles shuffling their feet to keep their boots on the huge column of prisoners was sent to the rear with a few soldiers to direct rather than to guard them there was no fight left in them now a terror-stricken group some of them temporarily at least half insane as the germans had left the trenches their artillery had paused thinking it a counter-attack now as file after file was escorted to the rear and it became apparent to their rear lines that the men had surrendered the german artillery saw its mistake and opened up again furiously at the dark masses of defenceless prisoners 
we too were subjected to a terrific fire six shells landed at the same instant in almost the same place and within a few minutes section three of our company had almost disappeared i lost two of my own section casey and leaguer both severely wounded in the leg i counted fourteen men of my command still on their feet the company seemed to have shrunk two-thirds a few minutes later we entered the trench lately evacuated by the prussians and left it by a very deep communication trench which we knew led to our destination ferm navarin just at the entrance we passed signboards marked in big letters with black paint schutzen graben spandau this trench ran zigzag in the general direction north and south in many places it was filled level with dirt and rocks kicked in by our big shells from the mass of debris hands and legs were sticking stiffly out at grotesque angles in one place the heads of two men showed above the loose brown earth here and there men were sitting their backs against the wall of the trench quite dead with not a wound showing in one deep crater excavated by our three twenty millimetres lay five saxons side by side in the pit where they had sought refuge killed by the bursting of a single shell when a man of about twenty-three years of age lay on his back his legs tensely doubled elbows thrust back into the ground and fingers dug into the palms eyes staring in terror and mouth wide open i could not help carrying the picture of fear away with me and i thought to myself that man died a coward just alongside of him resting on his left side lay a blond giant stretched out easily almost graceful in death his two hands were laid together palm to palm in prayer between them was a photograph the look upon his face was calm and peaceful the contrast of his figure with his neighbours struck me i noticed that a paper protruded from his partly open blouse and picking it up read the heading ein fest berg ist unser gott it was a two-leaf track i drew a blanket over him and followed my section the trench we marched in wound along in the shelter of a little ridge crowned with scrubby pines here the german shells bothered us but little we were out of sight of their observation posts and consequently their fire was uncontrolled and no longer effective on we went at every other step our feet pressed down upon soldiers corpses lying indiscriminately one on top of the other sometimes almost filling the trench i brushed against one who sat braced against the side of the trench the chin resting upon folded arms quite naturally yet quite dead it was through this trench that the germans had tried to rush reinforcements into the threatened position and here the men were slaughtered without a chance to go back or forwards hemmed in by shells in both front and rear many hundreds had climbed into the open and tried to escape over the fields toward the pine forest only to be mown down as they ran for hundreds of metres continuously my feet as i trudged along did not touch the ground in many of the bodies life was not yet extinct but we had to leave them for the red cross men we had our orders no delay was possible and at any rate our minds were clogged with our own work ahead making such time as we could we finally arrived at the summit of the little ridge then we left the cover of the trench formed in indian file fifty metres between sections and at the signal moved forward swiftly and in order it was a pretty bit of tactics and executed with a dispatch and neatness hardly equalled on the drove ground the first files of the sections were abreast while the men fell in one close behind the other and so we crossed the ridge offering the smallest possible target to the enemy's guns before us and a little to our left was the ferme navarin our goal as we descended the slope we were greeted by a new hail of iron shells upon shells fired singly by pairs by salvos from six gun batteries they crashed and exploded around us we increased the pace to a run and arrived out of breathy breast of immense pits dynamited out of the ground by prodigious explosions embedded in them we could see three enemy howitzers but not a living german was left all had disappeared as we waited there the mood of the men seemed to change their spirits began to rise one jest started another and soon we were all laughing at the memory of the german prisoners marching to the rear holding up their trousers with both hands some of the men had taken the welcome opportunity of searching the prisoners while cutting their suspenders and most of them were now puffing german cigarettes one of them heffel offered me a piece of kk bread krieg's kartoffel brought black as ink i declined with thanks for i didn't like the looks of it in the relaxation of the moment nobody paid any attention to the shells falling outside the little open shelter until cap de vielle proposed to crawl inside one of the german howitzers for security alas he was too fat and stuck i myself hoped rather strongly that no shell would enter one of these pits in which the company had found shelter because i knew there were several thousand rounds of ammunition piled near each piece hidden under the dirt and an explosion might make it hot for us as we sat there smoking and chatting del Ponche slid over the edge of the hollow and brought with him the order to leave the pit in column of one and to descend to the bottom of the inclining line with some trees which he pointed out to us 
there we were to deploy in open order and dig shelter trenches for ourselves though i can tell the reader that shelter is a poor word to use in such a connection it seems we had to wait for artillery before making the attack on navarin itself the trench spandau so delponge told me was being put into shape by the engineers and was already partially filled with troops who were coming up to our support the same message had been carried to the other section as we filed out of our pit we saw them leaving theirs in somewhat loose formation we ran full tilt down the hill and at the assigned position flung ourselves on the ground and began digging like mad we had made the last stretch without losing a man the ferme navarin was two hundred metres from where we lay from it came a heavy rifle and mitrailleur's fire but we did not respond we had something else to do every man had his shovel and every man made the dirt fly in what seemed half a minute we had formed a continuous parapet twelve to fourteen inches in height and with our knapsacks placed to keep the dirt in position we felt quite safe against infantry and machine-gun fire next each man proceeded to dig his little individual niche in the ground about a yard deep twenty inches wide and long enough to lie down in with comfort between each two men there remained a partition wall of dirt from ten to fifteen inches thick the usefulness of which was immediately demonstrated by a shell which fell into blondino's niche blowing him to pieces without injuring either of his companions to the right or the left the day passed slowly and without mishap to my section as night fell one half of the section stayed on the alert for hours while the other half slept the second sergeant had returned and relieved me at twelve midnight i pulled several handfuls of grass and with that and two overcoats i had stripped from dead germans during the night i made a comfortable bed and lay down to sleep the bank was not uncomfortable i was very tired and dozed off immediately suddenly i woke in darkness everything was still and i could hear my watch ticking but over every part of me there was an immense leaden weight i tried to rise and couldn't move something was holding me and choking me at the same time there was no air to breathe i set my muscles and tried to give a strong heave as i drew in my breath my mouth filled with dirt i was buried alive it is curious what a man thinks about when he is in trouble into my mind shot memories of feats of strength performed why i was the strongest man in the section surely i could lift myself out i thought to myself and my confidence began to return i worked the dirt out of my mouth with the tip of my tongue and prepared myself mentally for the sudden heave that would free me a quick inhalation of my mouth filled again with dirt i could not move a muscle under my skin and then i seemed to be two people the eye who was thinking seemed to be at a distance from the body lying there my god am i going to die stretched down in a hole like this i thought through my mind flashed a picture of the way i had always hoped to die the way i had a right to die face to the enemy and running towards him why that was part of a soldier's wages i tried to shout for help and more dirt entered my mouth i could feel it gritting way down in my throat my tongue was locked so i could not move i watched the whole picture i was standing a little way off and could hear myself gurgle my throat was rattling and i said to myself that's the finish then i grew calm he wasn't hurting so much and somehow or other i seemed to realize that a soldier had taken a soldier's chance and lost it wasn't his fault he had done the best he could then the pain all left me and the world went black it was death then somebody yelled hell he's bit my finger i could hear him that's nothing said a voice i knew as colette's get the dirt out of his mouth again a finger entered my throat and i coughed spasmodically some one was working my arms backward and my right shoulder hurt me i struggled up but sank to my knees and began coughing up dirt here says souberon turn round and spit that dirt on your parapet it all helps the remark made me smile i was quite all right now and souberon colette joe and marcel returned to their holes the red cross men were picking something out of the hole made by a two fifty millimeter they told me it was the remnant of the corporal and sergeant fourier who had their trench to my left it seems that a tenant shell had entered the ground at the edge of my hole exploded a depth of two metres tearing the corporal and sergeant to pieces and kicking several cubic metres of dirt into and on top of me souberon and the colette saw what had happened and immediately started digging me out they had been just in time it wasn't long before my streak began to come back two stretcher bearers came up to carry me to the rear but i declined their services there was too much going on i dug out the german overcoats recovered some grass and bedding myself down in the crater made by the shell began to feel quite safe again lightning never strikes twice in the same spot however that wasn't much like the old-fashioned lightning the enemy seemed to have picked upon my section the shells were falling thicker and closer everybody was broad awake now and all of us seemed to be waiting for a shell to drop on our holds it was only a question of time before we should be wiped out herfel called my attention to a little trench we all had noticed during the daytime about forty metres in front of us no fire had come from there and it was evidently quite abandoned 
i took heffler and st hilaire with me and quietly crawled over to the trench round the end of it and started to enter at about the centre then all of a sudden a wild yell came out of the darkness in front of us franzosen dear franzosen we couldn't see anything nor they either there might have been a regiment of us or of them for that matter i screeched out in german hand hach hands up and jumped into the trench followed by my two companions as we crouched in the bottom i yelled again handa hach oder wir schießen hands up or we will shoot the response was a familiar kameradan kameradan heffel gave an audible chuckle calling again on my german i ordered the men to step out of the trench with hands held high and to march toward our line i assured the poor devils we would not hurt them they thought there was a division of us more or less and i don't know how much confidence they put in my assurance anyhow as they scrambled over the parapet i counted six of them prisoners to the three of us heffel and st hilaire escorted them back and also took word to the second sergeant to let the section crawl one after the other up this trench to where i was one by one men came on crawling in single file and i put them to work carefully and noiselessly reversing the parapet this german trench was very deep with niches cut into the bank at intervals of one metre permitting the men to lie down comfortably i wanted to know the time and felt along my belt one of the straps had been cut clean through and my wallet which had held two hundred and sixty-five francs had been neatly removed some one of my men who had risked his life for mine with a self-devotion that could scarcely be surpassed had felt that his need was greater than mine whoever he was i bear him no grudge poor chap if he lived he needed the money and that day he surely did me a good turn besides he was a member of the legion i placed sentries took care to find a good place for myself and was just dropping off to sleep as heffel and st hilaire returned and communicated to me the captain's compliments and the assurance of a citation footnote equivalent to mentioned in dispatches End of footnote. i composed myself to sleep and dropped off quite content End of section twenty one this recording is in the public domain section twenty two of the world war read for librivox dot org by betty b the world war part four on the western and italian fronts nineteen sixteen to nineteen seventeen historical note with the coming of nineteen sixteen the allies on the western front were much better prepared for war the french were compelled to be sure to act on the defensive for weeks in order to save verdun and that prolonged battle was a severe drain upon all available resources but the french were victorious they were once more proved equal to the occasion when the germans tried to break through to paris and in later months were ready to take the offensive in the champagne and elsewhere meanwhile the british had been making the most extensive preparations with new armies new implements of war and far-reaching plans for the operation of mines the great battle of the somme was the first result a battle which put the allies in a position to take the offensive at the strongest points of the german lines the campaigns of nineteen seventeen steadily developed the new plans of offense netting the allies great numbers of prisoners guns and other items of conquest the germans meanwhile approached the campaigns of nineteen sixteen with the assurance of victors after the conquests on the eastern front during the previous year undoubtedly they expected to break through the french lines at verdun as they had driven the russians before them in galicia their failure after the most furious and persistent assaults put them on the defensive in the western theater of the war the russian revolution in the spring of nineteen seventeen played into their hands for russia was practically out of the war from that time on during the months of internal turmoil the germans were able to withdraw troops and mass forces opposite the british lines also to make ready for the sudden drive through the italian lines on the isonzo and beyond early in november italy thus suddenly became the center of crucial operations for the submarine policy of frightfulness launched by germany february first had failed to bring the anticipated destruction of british shipping and the united states had come to the aid of england on the seas end of section twenty two this recording is in the public domain
Section 23 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jake Knopp. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 23, The Battle of Verdun, 1916, by Raoul Blanchard. Why did the Germans make their drive at Verdun, a powerful fortress defended by a complete system of detached outworks? Several reasons may be found for this. First of all, there were the strategic advantages of the operation. Ever since the Battle of the Marne and the German offensive against saint Miel, Verdun had formed a salient in the French front which was surrounded by the Germans on three sides, northwest, east, and south, and was consequently in greater peril than the rest of the French lines. Besides, Verdun was not far distant from Metz, the great German arsenal, the fountainhead for arms, food, and munitions. For the same reasons, the French defense of Verdun was made much harder because access to the city was commanded by the enemy. Of the two main railroads linking Verdun with France, the Le Rouville line was cut off by the enemy at saint Miel. The second, leading through Chalon, was under ceaseless fire from the German artillery. There remained only a narrow gauge road connecting Verdun and bar le duc The fortress, then, was almost isolated. For another reason, Verdun was too near, for the comfort of the Germans, to those immense deposits of iron ore in Lorraine, which they have every intention of retaining after the war. The moral factor involved in the fall of Verdun was also immense. If the stronghold were captured, the French, who look on it as their chief bulwark in the east, would be greatly disheartened whereas it would delight the souls of the Germans, who had been counting on its seizure since the beginning of the war. They have not forgotten that the ancient Lotharingia, created by a treaty signed eleven centuries ago at Verdun, extended as far as the Meuse. Finally, it is probable that the German general staff intended to profit by a certain slackness on the part of the French who, placing too much confidence in the strength of the position and the favorable nature of the surrounding countryside, had made little effort to augment their defensive value. This value, as a matter of fact, was great. The theater of operations at Verdun offers far fewer inducements to an offensive than the plains of Artois, Picardy, or Champagne. The rolling ground, the vegetation, the distribution of the population all present serious obstacles. The German preparation was, from the start, formidable and painstaking. It was probably underway by the end of October 1915, for at that time the troops selected to deliver the first crushing attack were withdrawn from the front and sent into training. Four months were thus set aside for this purpose. To make the decisive attack, the Germans made selection from four of their crack army corps, the 18th active, the 7th Reserve, the 15th Active, the Mühlhausen Corps, and the 3rd Active, composed of Brandenburgers. These troops were sent to the interior to undergo special preparation. In addition to these 80,000 to 100,000 men who were appointed to bear the brunt of the assault, the operation was to be supported by the Crown Prince's army on the right and by that of General von Strauss on the left, 300,000 men more. Immense masses of artillery were gathered together to blast open the way. Fourteen lines of railroad brought together from every direction the streams of arms and munitions. Heavy artillery was transported from the Russian and Serbian fronts. No light pieces were used in this operation, in the beginning at any rate. Only guns of large caliber, exceeding 200 millimeters, many of 370 and 420 millimeters. The point chosen for the attack was the plateau on the right bank of the Meuse. The Germans would thus avoid the obstacles of the cliffs of Côte de Meuse, and, by seizing the ridges and passing down the ravines, they could drive down on Doamont, which dominates the entire region, and from there fall on Verdun and capture the bridges. At the same time, the German right wing would assault the French positions on the left bank of the Meuse. The left wing would complete the encircling movement, and the entire French army of Verdun, 
driven back to the river and attacked from the rear, would be captured or destroyed. The plan was worked out meticulously. It is even reported that every colonel of the regiments which were to take part in the operation had been summoned to the great headquarters at Charleville, and that a sort of general rehearsal was gone through in the presence of the Kaiser. As in the beginning of the war, the Germans felt that success was assured. They had taken every precaution. Their resources were immense. Their adversary had grown careless. They could not fail. But once more Germany had counted without the mettle and adaptability of the French soldiers, their genius for improvisation, and their spirit of self-sacrifice. With such thorough preparation, the Germans felt that the contest would be a short one. As a matter of fact, the Battle of Verdun lasted no less than ten months, from February 21st to December 16th, and in its course various phases were developed which the Germans had scarcely foreseen. First of all came the formidable German attack, with its harvest of success during the first few days of the frontal drive, which was soon checked and forced to wear itself out in fruitless flank attacks kept up until April 9th. After this date, the German program became more modest. They merely wished to hold at Verdun sufficient French troops to forestall an offensive at some other point. This was the period of German fixation, lasting from April to the middle of July. It then became the object of the French, in their turn, to hold the German forces at Verdun and prevent their transfer to the Somme. This was the period of French fixation, which ended in the successes of October and December. The first German onslaught was the most intense and critical moment of the battle. The violent frontal attack on the plateau east of the Meuse, magnificently executed, at first carried all before it. This success was due to the thoughtfulness of the preparations, the admirable strategy, and also to weaknesses on the part of the French. The commanders at Verdun had shown a lack of foresight. For more than a year this sector had been quiet, and undue confidence was placed in the natural strength of the position. There were too few trenches, too few cannon, too few troops. These soldiers, moreover, had had little experience in the field compared with those who came up later to reinforce them, and it was their task to face the most terrific attack ever known. On the morning of February 21st, the German artillery opened up a fire of infernal intensity. This artillery had been brought up in undreamed-of quantities. French aviators who flew over the enemy positions located so many batteries that they gave up marking them on the maps. Their number was too great. The forest of Gremily, northeast of the point of attack, was just a great cloud shot through with lightning flashes. A deluge of shells fell on the French positions, annihilating the first line, attacking the batteries and attempting to silence them, and finding their mark as far back as the city of Verdun. At five o'clock in the afternoon, the first waves of infantry went forward to the assault, and carried the advanced French positions in the woods of Halmont and Cara. On the 22nd, the French left was driven backwards for a distance of about four kilometers. The following day, a terrible engagement took place along the entire line of attack, resulting toward evening in the retreat of both French wings. On the left, Samolnieu was taken by the Germans. On the right, they occupied the strong position of Herbe Bois, which fell after a magnificent resistance. The situation developed rapidly on the 24th. The Germans enveloped the French center, which formed a salient. At two in the afternoon, they captured the important central position of Beaumont, and by nightfall had reached Louvement and Lavauche Forest, gathering in thousands of prisoners. On the morning of the 25th, the enemy, taking advantage of the growing confusion of the French command, stormed Baisonval, and, after some setbacks, entered the fort of Donomont, which they found evacuated. The German victory now seemed assured. In less than five days, the assaulting troops sent forward over the plateau had penetrated the French positions to a depth of eight kilometers, and were masters of the most important elements of the defense of the fortress. It seemed as if nothing could stop their onrush. Verdun and its bridges were only seven kilometers distant. 
the commander of the fortified region himself proposed to evacuate the whole right bank of the Meuse. The troops established in the Wolf were already falling back toward the bluffs of Cote de Meuse. Most luckily, on the same day there arrived at Verdun some men of resource, together with substantial reinforcements. General de Castelno, chief of the general staff, ordered the troops on the right bank to hold out at all costs. And on the evening of the 25th, General Pétain took over the command of the entire sector. The Zouaves, on the left bank, were standing firm as rocks on the Côte de Poivre, which cuts off access from the valley to Verdun. During this time, the Germans, pouring forward from Donnemont, had already reached the Côte de Froditerre, and the French artillerymen, outflanked, poured their fire into the grey masses as though with rifles. It was at this moment that the 39th Division of the famous 20th French Army Corps of Nancy met the enemy in the open, and, after furious hand-to-hand -hand fighting, broke the backbone of the attack. That was the end of it. The German tidal wave could go no farther. There were fierce struggles for several days longer, but all in vain. Starting on the 26th, five French counterattacks drove back the enemy to a point just north of the fort of Donemal, and recaptured the village of the same name. For three days, the German attacking forces tried unsuccessfully to force these positions. Their losses were terrible, and already they had to call in a division of reinforcement. After two days of quiet, the contest began again at Donemal, which was attacked by an entire army corps. The 4th of March found the village again in German hands. The impetus of the great blow had been broken, however. After five days of success, the attack had fallen flat. Were the Germans then to renounce Verdun? After such vast preparations, after such great losses, after having roused such high hopes, this seemed impossible to the leaders of the German army. The frontal drive was to have been followed up by the attack of the wings, and it was now planned to carry this out with the assistance of the Crown Prince's army, which was still intact. In this way, the scheme so judiciously arranged would be accomplished in the appointed manner. Instead of adding the finishing touch to the victory, however, these wings now had the task of winning it completely, and the difference is no small one. These flank attacks were delivered for over a month, March 6th to April 9th, on both sides of the river simultaneously, with an intensity and power which recalled the first days of the battle. But the French were now on their guard. They had received great reinforcements of artillery, and the nimble 75s, thanks to their speed and accuracy, barred off the positions under attack by a terrible curtain of fire. Moreover, their infantry contrived to pass through the enemy's barrage fire, wait calmly until the insulting infantry were within 30 meters of them, and then let loose their rapid-fire guns. They were also commanded by energetic and brilliant chiefs, General Pétain, who offset the insufficient railroad communications with the rear by putting in a motion of great stream of more than 40,000 motor trucks, all traveling on a strict schedule time, and General Neville, who directed operations on the right bank of the river before taking command of the army of Verdun. The German successes of the first days were not duplicated. And indeed... The great attack of April 9th was the last general effort made by the German troops to carry out the program of February, to capture Verdun and wipe out the French army which defended it. They had to give in. The French were on their guard now. They had artillery, munitions, and men. The defenders began to act as vigorously as the attackers. They took the offensive, recaptured the woods of La Cayette, and occupied the trenches before Les Morhomes. The German plans were ruined. Some other scheme had to be thought out. Instead of employing only eight divisions of excellent troops as originally planned, the Germans had little by little cast into the fiery furnace thirty divisions. This enormous sacrifice could not be allowed to count for nothing. The German high command therefore decided to assign a less pretentious object to the abortive enterprise. The Crown Prince's offensive had fallen flat, but at all events it might succeed in preventing a French offensive. For this reason, it was necessary that Verdun should remain a sore spot, a continually menaced sector where the French would be obliged to send a steady stream of men, material, and munitions. 
It was hinted then in all the German papers that the struggle at Verdun was a battle of attrition, which would wear down the strength of the French by slow degrees. There was no talk now of thunderstrokes. It was all the siege of Verdun. This time they expressed the true purpose of the German general staff. The struggle which followed the fight of April 9th now took the character of a battle of fixation, in which the Germans tried to hold their adversaries' strongest units at Verdun, and to prevent their tra being transferred elsewhere. This state of affairs lasted from mid-April to well into July, when the progress of the Somme offensive showed the Germans that their efforts have been unavailing. On May 4th, there began a terrible artillery preparation, directed against Hill 304. This was followed by attacks of infantry, which surged up the shell-blasted slopes, first to the northwest, then north, and finally northeast. The attacks of the 7th were made by three divisions of fresh troops, which had not previously been in action before Verdun. No gains were secured. Every foot of ground taken in the first rush was recaptured by French counterattacks. During the night of the 18th, a savage onslaught was made against the woods of Avocor, without the least success. On the 20th and 21st, three divisions were hurled against Les Morhomme, which they finally took, but they could go no farther. The 23rd and 24th were terrible days. The Germans stormed the village of Cumier, their advance guard penetrated as far as Chatoncourt, on the 26th, however, the French were again in possession of Cumier and the slopes of Les Mohomme. And if the Germans, by means of violent counterattacks, were able to get a fresh foothold in the ruins of Cumier, they made no attempt to progress farther. The battles on the left river bank were now over. On this side of the Meuse, there were only to be local engagements of no importance, and the usual artillery fire. Verdun, however, continued to be of great interest to the French. In the first place, they could not endure seeing the enemy entrenched five kilometers away from the coveted city. Moreover, it was most important for them to prevent the Germans from weakening the Verdun front and transferring their men and guns to the Somme. The French troops, therefore, were to take the initiative out of the hands of the Germans and inaugurate, in their turn, a battle of fixation. This new situation presented two phases. In July and August, the French were satisfied to worry the enemy with small forces and to oblige them to fight. In October and December, General Neville, well supplied with troops and material, was able to strike two vigorous blows which took back from the Germans the larger part of all the territory they had won since February 21st. From July 15th to September 15th, furious fighting was in progress on the slopes of the plateau stretching from Thiamal to Damlu. This time, however, it was the French who attacked savagely, who captured ground, and who took prisoners. So impetuous were they that their adversaries, who asked for nothing but quiet, were obliged to be constantly on their guard and deliver costly counterattacks. The contest raged most bitterly over the ruins of Thialmont and Fleury. On the 15th of July, the Zouave broke into the southern part of the village, only to be driven out again. However, on the 19th and 20th, the French freed Souville and drew near to Fleury. From the 20th to the 26th, they forged ahead step by step, taking 800 prisoners. A general attack, delivered on August 3rd, carried the fort of Thiamont and the village of Fleury, with 1,500 prisoners. The Germans reacted violently. The 4th of August, they reoccupied Fleury, a part of which was taken back by the French that same evening. From the 5th to the 9th, the struggle went on ceaselessly, night and day, in the ruins of the village. During this time, the adversaries took and retook the Amal, which the Germans held after the 8th. But on the 10th, the colonial regiment from Morocco reached Fleury, carefully prepared the assault, delivered it on the 17th, and captured the northern and southern portions of the village, encircling the central part, which they occupied on the 18th. From this day, Fleury remained in French hands. The German counter-assaults of the 18th, 19th, and 20th of August were fruitless. The Moroccan colonials held their conquest firmly. On the 24th, the French began to advance east of Fleury, in spite of incessant attacks which grew more intense on the 28th. 
300 prisoners were taken between Fleury and Thiamont on September 3rd, and 300 more men fell into their hands in the woods of val Chapitre. On the 9th, they took 300 more before Fleury. It may be seen that the French troops had thoroughly carried out the program assigned to them of attacking the enemy relentlessly, obliging him to counterattack, and holding him at Verdun. But the high command was to surpass itself. By means of sharp attacks, it proposed to carry the strong positions which the Germans had dearly bought from February to July at the price of five months of terrible effort. This new plan was destined to be accomplished on October 24th and December 15th. Verdun was no longer looked on by the French as a sacrificial sector. To this attack of October 24th, destined to establish once for all the superiority of the soldier of France, it was determined to consecrate all the time and all the energy that were found necessary. A force of artillery which General Neville himself declared to be of exceptional strength was brought into position. No old-fashioned ordnance this time, but magnificent new pieces, among them long-range guns of 400 millimeters caliber. The Germans had 15 divisions on the Verdun front, but the French command judged it sufficient to make the attack with three divisions, which advanced along a front of seven kilometers. These, however, were made up of excellent troops, withdrawn from service in the first lines and trained for several weeks, who knew every inch of the ground and were full of enthusiasm. General Mangin was their commander. The French artillery opened fire on October 21st by hammering away at the enemy's positions. A feint attack forced the Germans to reveal the location of their batteries, more than 130 of which were discovered and silenced. At 11.40 a.m. October 24th, the assault started in the fog. The troops advanced on the run, preceded by a barrage fire. On the left, the objective points were reached at 2.45 p.m. and the village of Donamont captured. The fort was stormed at 3 o'clock by the Moroccan colonials, and the few Germans who held out there surrendered when night came on. On the right, the woods surrounding Val were rushed with lightning speed. The battery of Damlu was taken by the assault. Val alone resisted. In order to reduce it, the artillery preparation was renewed from October 28th to November 2nd, and the Germans evacuated the fort without fighting on the morning of the 2nd. As they retreated, the French occupied the village of Val and Damlu at the foot of the Côte. The success was undeniable. As a reply to the German peace proposals of December 12th, the Battle of Verdun ended as a real victory, and this magnificent operation, in which the French had shown such superiority in infantry and artillery, seemed to be a pledge of future triumphs. The conclusion is easily reached. In February and March, Germany wished to end the war by crushing the French army at Verdun. She failed utterly. Then, from April to July, she wished to exhaust French military resources by a battle of fixation. Again she failed. The Somme offensive was the offspring of Verdun. Later on, from July to December, she was not able to elude the grasp of the French, and the last engagements, together with the vain struggles of the Germans for six months, showed to what extent General Neville's men had won the upper hand. The Battle of Verdun, beginning as a brilliant German offensive, ended as an offensive victory for the French. And so, this terrible drama is an epitome for the whole Great War. A brief term of success for the Germans at the start, due to a tremendous preparation which took careless adversaries by surprise. Terrible and agonizing first moments, soon offset by energy, heroism, and the spirit of sacrifice. And finally, victory for the soldiers of right. End of section 23. This recording is in the public domain. Section 24 of The World War. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. The Biggest Cannon on the Western Front. Photograph, page 134. This has been called a war of artillery, and the name is justified. Beyond the front line, the batteries are arranged in tiers. First, the lighter guns, 
then the medium and last of all the heavy artillery such as is shown in the illustration all placed according to their range each of the lighter batteries is trained on an imaginary line fifty yards in advance of the front line trench and thirty feet in the air if the enemy attacks at night a coloured rocket is fired from the front trench this is noted by the lookout man for the batteries having that particular sector in their care and the guns immediately come into action putting a barrage or curtain of fire along their imaginary line with the object of keeping the enemy from reaching the trench at the same time the orderly at company headquarters telephones the s o s call to battalion division and corps headquarters and the heavy artillery come into action against the enemy's trenches and rear lines to illustrate the rapidity and accuracy with which all this can be carried out captain f halls elliot in his book trench fighting says at saint eloy in 1916 the germans were attacking our position and we sent up an s o s rocket and within ten seconds we had fourteen hundred eighteen pounder field guns putting up a barrage fifty yards in front of our trench with a burst point thirty feet in the air this fire was concentrated on a frontage of one thousand yards being five hundred yards either side of the point where the rocket was sent up when you remember that the lateral burst of a shell is twenty-five yards either side of the burst point and the forward burst one hundred and fifty yards and also the fact that these eighteen pounders were firing at a rate of eighteen shells per minute you will gain some idea of the tremendous screen of fire which our artillery places in front of us the cannon shown in the illustration throws a shell almost eighteen inches in diameter or nearly two inches larger than the great german forty two centimetre it is hidden away from the most keen-sighted enemy airmen by the thick foliage of the vosges mountains end of section twenty four this recording is in the public domain Section 25 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. The World Story, Volume 15. The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 25. Cayette Wood. An episode of Verdun. The fiercest struggle on the sector between Dumont and Vaux was that which raged around Cayette Wood in the early days of April. Eyewitnesses describe it as one of the most thrilling episodes in the whole great series of battles. The importance of the position lay in the fact that if the Germans could keep it, they could force the French to abandon the entire ridge. The heroic deeds on both sides in the French recapture of this ground are narrated by a staff correspondent in the following remarkable story, under date of April 4th. The Germans had taken Cayette on Sunday morning, April 2nd, after twelve hours' bombardment, which seemed even to beat the Verdun record for intensity. The French curtain fire had checked their further advance, and a savage countercharge in the early afternoon had gained for the defenders a corpse-strewn welter of splintered trees and shell-shattered ground that had been the southern corner of the wood. Further charges had broken against a massive barricade, the value of which as a defence paid good interest on the expenditure of German lives which its construction demanded. A wonderful work had been accomplished that Sunday forenoon in the livid, London-like fog and twilight produced by the lowering clouds and battle smoke. While the German assault columns in the van fought the French hand to hand, picked corps of workers behind them formed an amazing human chain from the woods to the east over the shoulder of the centre of the Domont slope to the crossroads of a network of communication trenches six hundred yards in the rear. Four deep was his chain and along its line of nearly three thousand men passed an unending stream of wooden billets, sandbags, chevaux de frise, steel shelters, and light mitrailleuses, in a word, all the material for defensive fortifications, like buckets at a country fire. 
Despite the hurricane of French artillery fire, the German commander had adopted the only possible means of rapid transport of the shell-torn ground, covered with debris, over which neither horse nor cart could go. Every moment counted. Unless barriers rose swiftly, the French counter-attacks, already massing, would sweep the assailants back into the wood. Cover was disdained. The workers stood at full height, and the chain stretched openly across the hollows and hillocks, a fair target for the French gunners. The latter missed no chance. Again and again great rents were torn in the line with the bursting melanite, but as coolly as at manoeuvres the iron-disciplined soldiers of Germany sprang forward from shelters to take the places of the fallen, and the work went apace. Gradually another line doubled the chain of the workers, as the upheaved corpses formed a continuous embankment, each additional dead man giving greater protection to his comrades, until the barrier began to form shape along the diameter of the wood. There others were digging and burying logs deep into the earth, installing shelters and mitrailleuses, or feverishly building fortifications. At last the work was ended at fearful cost, but as the vanguard sullenly withdrew behind it, from the whole length burst a havoc of flame upon the advancing Frenchmen. Vainly the latter dashed forward. They could not pass, and as the evening fell, the barrier still held, covering the German working parties, burrowing like moles in the maze of trenches and boyaux. So solid was the barricade, padded with sandbags and earthworks, that the artillery fire fell practically unavailing, and the French general realized that the barrier must be breached by explosives as in Napoleon's battles. It was eight o'clock, and already pitch dark in that blighted atmosphere as a special blasting corps, as devoted as the German chain workers, crept forward toward the German position. The rest of the French waited, sheltered in the ravine east of Dumont, until an explosion should signal the assault. An Indian file, to give the least possible sign of their presence to the hostile sentinels, the blasting corps advanced in a long line, at first with comparative rapidity, only stiffening into the grotesque rigidity of simulated death when the searchlights played upon them, and resuming progress when the beam shifted. Then, as they approached the barrier, they moved slowly and more slowly. When they arrived within fifty yards, the movement of the crawling men became imperceptible. The German star shells and sentinels surpassed the searchlights in vigilance. The blasting core lay at full length, just like hundreds of other motionless forms about them, but all were working busily. With a short trowel, each file leader scuffled the earth from under the body, taking care not to raise his arms, and gradually making a shallow trench deep enough to hide him. The others followed his example until the whole line had sunk below the surface. Then the leader began scooping gently forward while his followers deepened the furrow already made. Thus, literally, inch by inch, the file stole forward, sheltered in a narrow ditch from the gusts of German mitrailleuse fire that constantly swept the terrain. Here and there the sentinel's eye caught a suspicious movement, and an incautiously raised head sank down, pierced by a bullet. But the stealthily mole-like advance continued. Hours passed. It was nearly dawn when the remnant of the blasting corps reached the barricade at last, and hurriedly put their explosives in position. Back they wriggled breathlessly. An over-hasty movement meant death, yet they must needs hurry lest the imminent explosions overwhelm them. Suddenly there comes a roar that dwarfs the cannonade, and along the barrier fountains of fire rise skyward, hurling a rain of fragments upon what was left of the blasting party. The barricade was breached, but seventy-five per cent of the devoted corps had given their lives to do it. As the survivors lay exhausted, the attackers charged over them, cheering. In the melee that followed, there was no room to shoot or wield the rifle. Some of the French fought with unfixed bayonets, like the stabbing swords of the Roman legions. Others had knives or clubs. All were battle-frenzied, as only Frenchmen can be. The Germans broke, and as the first rays of dawn streaked the sky, only a small northern section of the wood was still in their hands. There, a similar barrier stopped progress, and it was evident that the night's work must be repeated. But the hearts of the French soldiers were leaping with victory as they dug furiously to consolidate the ground they had gained. End of section 25. This recording is in the public domain.
section twenty six of the world war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume fifteen the world war edited by horatio w dresser section twenty six the fight for montauban an incident of the battle of the sum nineteen sixteen by ian hay the long expected allied drive against the germans on the western front began july first and operations were in active process well into november in this great contest the british and french took thousands of prisoners while suffering great losses themselves in killed wounded and missing the germans were pushed back six miles and the new british army was proved superior to the german veteran forces the german retreat in the spring of nineteen seventeen was a direct result of the allied successes in this retreat along the line from arras to soissons the germans evacuated nearly a thousand square miles of french territory the editor for nearly two years the british armies on the western front have been playing for time they have been sticking their toes in and holding their ground with numerically inferior forces and inadequate artillery support against a nation in arms which has set out with forty years of preparation at its back to sweep the earth we have held them and now der tag has come for us the deal has passed into our hand at last a fortnight ago ready for the first time to undertake the offensive on a grand and prolonged scale loas was a mere reconnaissance compared with this the new british army went over the parapet shoulder to shoulder with the most heroic army in the world the army of france and attacked over a sixteen mile front in the valley of the somme it was a critical day for the allies certainly it was a most critical day in the history of the british army for on that day an answer had to be given to a very big question indeed hitherto we had been fighting on the defensive unready uphill against odds it would have been no particular discredit to us had we failed to hold our line but we had held it and more now at last we were ready as ready as we were ever likely to be we had the men the guns and the munitions we were in a position to engage the enemy on equal and more than equal terms and the question that the british empire had to answer in that day the first of july nineteen sixteen was this are these new amateur armies of ours raised trained and equipped in less than two years with nothing in the way of military tradition to uphold them nothing but the steady courage of their race are they a match for and more than a match for that grim machine-made iron-bound host that lies waiting for them along that line of picardy hills because if they are not we cannot win this war we can only make a stalemate of it we looking back now over a space of twelve months know how our boys answered that question in the greatest and longest battle that the world had yet seen that army of city clerks midland farm lads lancashire mill hands scottish miners and irish corner boys side by side with their great-hearted brethren from overseas storm positions which had been held impregnable for two years captured seventy thousand prisoners reclaimed several hundred square miles of the sacred soil of france and smashed once and for all the german fostered fable of the invincibility of the german army it was good to have lived and suffered during those early and lean years if only to be present at their fulfilment but at this moment the battle was only beginning and the bulk of their astounding achievement was still to come nevertheless in the cautious and modest estimate of their commander-in-chief they had already done something after ten days and nights of continuous fighting said the first official report our troops have completed the methodical capture of the whole of the enemy's first system of defence on a front of fourteen thousand yards this system of defence consisted of numerous and continuous lines of fire trenches extending to depths of from two thousand to four thousand yards and included five strongly fortified villages numerous heavily entrenched woods and a large number of immensely strong redoubts the capture of each of these trenches represented an operation of some importance and the whole of them are now in our hands quite so one feels somehow that berlin would have got more out of such a theme it was dawn on saturday morning and the second phase of the battle of the somme was more than twenty-four hours old the programme had opened with a night attack 
always the most difficult and uncertain of enterprises especially for soldiers who were civilians less than two years ago but no undertaking is too audacious for men in whose veins the wine of success is beginning to throb and this undertaking this hazardous gamble had succeeded all along the line during the past day and night more than three miles of the german second system of defences from bazantin le petit to the edge of deville wood had received their new tenants and already long streams of not altogether reluctant hun prisoners were being escorted to the rear by perspiring but cheerful gentlemen with fixed bayonets meanwhile in case such of the late occupants of the line as were still at large should take a fancy to revisit their previous haunts working parties of infantry pioneers and sappers were toiling at full pressure to reverse the parapets run out barbed wire and bestow machine-guns in such a manner as to produce a continuous lattice-work of fire along the front of the captured position all through the night the work had continued as a result positions were now tolerably secure the intrepid buzzers had included the newly drafted territory in the nervous system of the british expeditionary force and battalion headquarters and supply depots and moved up to their new positions meanwhile up in the line a company were holding on grimly to what are usually described as certain advanced elements of the village village fighting is a confused and untidy business but it possesses certain redeeming features the combatants are usually so inextricably mixed up that the artillery are compelled to refrain from participation that comes later when you have cleared the village of the enemy and his guns are preparing the ground for the inevitable counter-attack so far a company had done nobly from the moment when they had lined up before montauban in the gross darkness preceding yesterday's dawn until the moment when bobby little led them in one victorious rush into the outskirts of the village they had never encountered a setback by sunset they had penetrated some way farther now creeping stealthily forward under the shelter of a broken wall to hurl bombs into the windows of an occupied cottage now climbing precariously to some commanding position in order to open fire with a lewis gun now making a sudden dash across an open space such work offered peculiar opportunities to small and well-handled parties opportunities of which bobby little's veterans availed themselves right readily angus mclaughlin for instance accompanied by a small following of seasoned experts had twice rounded up parties of the enemy in cellars and had dispatched the same back to headquarters with his compliments and a promise of more muckle wayne and four men had bombed their way along a communication trench leading to one of the side streets of the village a likely avenue for a counter-attack and having reached the end of the trench had built up a sandbag barricade and had held the same against the assaults of hostile bombers until a vicar's machine-gun had arrived in charge of an energetic subaltern of that youthful but thriving organization the suicide club or machine-gun corps and closed the street to further teutonic traffic during the night there had been periods of quiescence devoted to consolidation and here and there to snatches of uneasy slumber angus mclaughlin fairly in his element had trailed his enormous length in and out of the back yards and brick heaps of the village visiting every point in his irregular line testing defences bestowing praise and ensuring that every man had his share of food and rest unutterably grimy but inexpressibly cheerful he reported progress to major wagstaff when that nocturnal rambler visited him in the small hours well angus how goes it inquired wagstaff we have won the match sir replied angus with simple seriousness we are just playing the bye now and with that he crawled away with the unnecessary stealth of a small boy playing robbers to encourage his dour paladins to further efforts we shall probably be relieved this evening he explained to them and we must make everything secure it would never do to leave our new positions untenable by other troops they might not be so reliable with a paternal smile as you now our right flank is not safe yet we can improve the position very much if we can secure that estaminet standing up like an island among those ruined houses on our right front you see the sign au bon fermier over the door the trouble is that a german machine-gun is sweeping the intervening space and we cannot see the gun there it goes again see the brick dust fly keep down they are firing mainly across our front but a stray bullet may come this way the platoon crouched low behind their improvised rampart of brick rubble while machine-gun bullets swept low with misleading claquements 
along the space in front of them from some hidden position on their right presently the firing stopped brother boche was merely loosing off a belt as a precautionary measure at commendably regular intervals i cannot locate that gun said angus impatiently can you corporal m snape it is not in the estament itself sir replied m snape estament is as near as our rank and file ever get to estaminet it seems to be mounted some place higher up the street i doubt they cannot see us themselves only the ground in front of us if we could reach the estaminet itself said angus thoughtfully we could get a more extended view sergeant mucklewayne select ten men including three bombers and follow me i'm going to find a jumping-off place the lewis gun too presently the little party were crouching round their officer in a sheltered position on the right of the line which for the moment appeared to be in the air except for the intermittent streams of machine-gun fire and an occasional shrapnel burst overhead all was quiet the enemy's counter-attack was not yet ready now listen carefully said angus who had just finished scribbling a dispatch first of all you bogle take this message to the telephone and get it sent to company headquarters now you others we will wait till that machine-gun has fired another belt then the moment it has finished while they are getting out the next belt i will dash across to the estaminet over there mcsnape you will come with me but no one else yet if the estaminet seems capable of being held i will signal to you sergeant mucklemoyne and you will send your party across in driblets not forgetting the lewis gun by that time i may have located the german machine-gun so we should be able to knock it out with the lewis further speech was cut short by a punctual fantasia from the gun in question angus and mcsnape crouched behind the shattered wall awaiting their chance the firing ceased now whispered angus next moment officer and corporal were flying across the open and before the mechanical boche gunner could jerk the new belt into position both had found sanctuary within the open doorway of the half-ruined estaminet nay more than both for as the panting pair flung themselves into shelter a third figure short and stout in an ill-fitting kilt tumbled heavily through the doorway after them simultaneously a stream of machine-gun bullets went storming past just in time observed angus well pleased bogle what are you doing here i was given to understand sir replied mr bogle calmly when i jined the regiment that in action an officer's servant stands by his officer that is true conceded angus but you had no right to follow me against orders did you not hear me say that no one but corporal mcsnape was to come no sir i doubt i was away at the phone well now you are here wait inside this doorway where you can see sergeant mucklewayne's party and look out for signals mcsnape let us find that machine-gun the pair made their way to the hitherto blind side of the building and cautiously peeped through a much perforated shutter in the living-room do you see it sir inquired mcsnape eagerly angus chuckled see it fine it is right in the open in the middle of the street look he relinquished his people the german machine-gun was mounted in the street itself behind an improvised barrier of bricks and sandbags it was less than a hundred yards away sighted in a position which though screened from the view of angus's platoon farther down enabled it to sweep all the ground in front of the position this it was now doing with great intensity for the brief public appearance of angus and mcsnape had effectually converted intermittent into continuous fire we must get the lewis gun over at once muttered angus it can knock that breastwork to pieces he crossed the house again to see if any of mucklewayne's men had arrived they had not the man with the lewis gun was lying dead halfway across the street with his precious weapon on the ground beside him two other men both wounded were crawling back whence they came taking what cover they could from the storm of bullets which whizzed a few winches over their flinching bodies angus hastily some afford to mucklewayne to hold his men in check for the present then he returned to the other side of the house how many men are serving that gun he said to mcsnape can you see only two sir i think i cannot see them but that wee breastwork will not cover more than a couple of men hm observed angus thoughtfully i expect they have been left behind to hold on have you a bomb about you the admirable mr nape produced from his pocket a mills grenade and handed it to his superior just the one sir he said go you commanded angus his voice rising to a more than usually highland inflection and some afford to mucklewayne that when he hears the explosion of this he pulled out the safety pin of the grenade and gripped the grenade itself in his enormous paw followed probably by the temporary cessation of the machine-gun he is to bring his men over here in a bunch as hard as they can pelt put it as briefly as you can but make sure he understands he is a good signaller with him send bogle to report when you have finished now repeat what i have said to you that's right carry on m snape was gone 
angus left alone pensively restored the safety pin to the grenade and laid the grenade upon the ground beside him then he proceeded to write a brief letter in his field message book this he placed in an envelope which he took from his breast pocket the envelope was already addressed to the rev neil mclaughlin the manse in a very remote highland village angus had no mother he closed the envelope initialed it and buttoned it up in his breast pocket again after that he took up his grenade and proceeded to make a further examination of the premises presently he found what he wanted and by the time bogle arrived to announce that sergeant mucklewain had signalled message understood his arrangements were complete stay by this small hole in the wall bogle he said in the moment the lewis gun arrives tell them to mount it here and open fire on the enemy gun he left the room leaving bogle alone to listen to the melancholy rustle of peeling wallpaper within and the steady crackling of bullets without but when peering through the improvised loophole he next caught sight of his officer angus had emerged from the house by the cellar window and was creeping with infinite caution behind the shelter of what had once been the wall of the estaminet's back yard but was now an uneven bank of bricks averaging two feet high in the direction of the german machine-gun the gun oblivious of the danger now threatening its right front continued to fire steadily and hopefully down the street slowly painfully angus crawled on until he found himself within the right angle formed by the corner of the yard he could go no farther without being seen between him and the german gun lay the cobbled surface of the street offering no cover whatsoever except one mighty shell crater situated midway between angus and the gun and full to the brim with rain-water a single peep over the wall gave him his bearings the gun was too far away to be reached by a grenade even when thrown by angus mclaughlin still it would create a diversion it was a time-bomb he would he stretched out his long arm to its full extent behind him gave one mighty overarm sweep and with all the crackling strength of his mighty sinews hurled the grenade it fell into the exact centre of the flooded shell crater angus said something under his breath which would have shocked a disciple of culture fortunately the two german gunners did not hear him but they observed the splash fifty yards away and it relieved them from ennui for they were growing tired of firing at nothing they had not seen the grenade thrown and were a little puzzled as to the cause of the phenomenon four seconds later their curiosity was more than satisfied with a muffled roar the shell hole suddenly spouted its liquid contents and other debris straight to the heavens startling them considerably and entirely obscuring their vision a moment later with an exultant yell angus mclaughlin was upon them he sprang into their vision out of the descending cascade a towering terrible kilted figure bareheaded and berserk mad he was barely forty yards away initiative is not the fort of the tutsen number one of the german gun mechanically traversed his weapon four degrees to the right and continued to press the thumb-piece mud and splinters of brick sprang up round angus's feet but still he came on he was not twenty yards away now the gunner beginning to boggle between waiting and bolting fumbled at his elevating gear but angus was right on him before his thumbs got back to work then indeed the gun spoke out with no uncertain voice for perhaps two seconds after that it ceased fire altogether almost simultaneously there came a triumphant roar lower down the street as mucklewain and his followers dashed obliquely across into the estaminet mucklewain himself was carrying the derelict lewis gun in the doorway stood the watchful m snape this way quick he shouted we have the garbin gun spotted and the officers needing the lewis but m snape was wrong the lewis was not required a few moments later in the face of brisk sniping from the houses higher up the street james bogle officer's servant a member of that despised class which according to the bander log at home spend the whole of its time pressing its master's trousers and smoking his cigarettes somewhere back in belay let out a stretcher party to the german gun number one had been killed by a shot from angus's revolver number two had adopted hindenburg tactics and was no more to be seen angus himself was lying stone dead a yard from the muzzle of the gun which he single-handed had put out of action his men carried him back to the estaminet au bon fermier with the german gun which was afterwards employed to good purpose during the desperate days of attacking and counter-attacking which ensued before the village was finally secured they laid him in the inner room and proceeded to put the estaminet in a state of defence ready to hold the same against all comers until such time as the relieving division should take over and they themselves be enabled under the kindly cloak of darkness to carry back their beloved officer to a more worthy resting-place in the left-hand breast pocket of angus's tunic they found his last letter to his father two german machine-gun bullets had passed through it it was forwarded with a covering letter by colonel kemp 
in the letter angus says commanding officer informed neil mclaughlin that his son had been recommended posthumously for the highest honour that the king bestows upon his soldiers End of section twenty six section twenty seven of the world war read for librivox dot org by april six zero nine zero a modern battlefield photograph page one hundred and forty eight this official french photograph taken by an aviator during a french advance at the somme gives a graphic idea of a modern battlefield the ground dotted with shell holes many of them large enough to shelter a dozen men from the sweep of rifle and machine-gun bullets and the rain of exploding shells this picture is of particular interest as showing what a modern charge really looks like instead of a rush of cheering frenzied men it is now made either by men pacing slowly watch in hand behind the steadily moving curtain of bursting shells from their artillery or as in this case by methods that recall indian warfare the storming parties working their way forward bit by bit and taking advantage of every scrap of cover the leaders of the charge are the men in the upper end of the communication trench that runs from top to bottom of the picture another far advanced group has just taken shelter in a shell hole slightly above the centre a picture like this gives a more vivid idea of war as it is than most realistic description end of section twenty seven this recording is in the public domain section twenty eight of the world war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by andrew katsu the world story volume fifteen the world war edited by horatio w dresser section twenty eight the battle of messine ridge nineteen seventeen it will be remembered that in the vicinity of ypres fierce contests have taken place since the beginning of the war from october twenty fifth to november fifteenth nineteen fourteen the germans made desperate and furious assaults in their persistent attempts to push through to dunkirk and calais by the use of chlorine vapor bombs in the assault of april twenty second nineteen fifteen the germans once more tried to gain their end and the attempts were renewed during the second battle of ypres extending into november nineteen fifteen in the action of june seventh nineteen seventeen the british took the offensive south of ypres in a great drive which had been long in preparation for many months prior to the attack the british sappers had been at work digging for the mining operations and at the appointed time a million pounds of ammonite were discharged at three ten a m nineteen mines electronically connected were sent off in the most remarkable mining operation in history the hilltops were blown off by the vast explosion which was heard one hundred and forty miles away in england the intense shell fire which began at the same time was followed by the charge of the infantry and the capture of the ridge with seven thousand prisoners and many guns the german casualties are estimated at thirty thousand those of the british at ten thousand it was the most important day's work in nineteen seventeen after the capture of vimy ridge the following is the summary of the british war office the editor the position captured by us was one of the enemy's most important strongholds on the western front dominating as it did the ypres salient and giving the enemy complete observation over it he neglected no precautions to render the position impregnable these conditions enabled the enemy to overlook all our preparations for the attack and he had moved up reinforcements to meet us the battle therefore became a gauge of the ability of the german troops to stop our advance under conditions as favorable to them as any army can ever hope for with every advantage of ground and preparation and with the knowledge that an attack was impending the german forward defenses consisted of an elaborate and intricate system of well-wired trenches and strong points forming a defensive belt over a mile in depth 
Numerous farms and woods were thoroughly prepared for the defense, and there were large numbers of machine guns in the German garrisons. Guns of all calibers, recently increased in numbers, were placed to bear not only the front, but on the flanks of an attack. Numerous communicating trenches and switch lines, radiating in all directions, were amply provided with strongly constructed concrete dugouts and machine gun emplacements designed to protect the enemy garrison and machine gunners from the effect of our bombardment. In short, no precaution was omitted that could be provided by the incessant labor of years guided by the experience gained by the enemy in his previous defeats on the Somme, at Arras, and on Vimy Ridge. Despite the difficulties and disadvantages which our troops had to overcome, further details of the fighting show that our first assault and the subsequent attacks were carried out in almost exact accordance with the timetable previously arranged. Following on the great care and thoroughness and preparations made under the orders of General Sir Herbert Plummer, the complete success gained may be ascribed chiefly to the destruction caused by our mines, to the violence and accuracy of our bombardment, to the very fine work of the Royal Flying Corps, and to the incomparable dash and courage of the infantry. The whole force acted in perfect combination. Excellent work was done by the tanks, and every means of offense at our disposal was made use of so that every arm of the service had a share in the victory. The British had to level many bits of woodland, and then they sprayed these woods with drums of blazing oil, which burdened them away and made attacking across what would be considered impregnable natural defenses almost an easy matter. The communication trenches were so damaged that it was impossible for the Germans to make their way along them in daylight except on all fours. Ration parties attempting at night to come up over the open were badly cut up by the constant British fire. The action against Messine Ridge was characteristic of the new form which the battles on the Western Front have assumed since the Germans gave up the attempt to hold a long line, equally strong at many points, and tried to maintain their ground by concentrating upon a few strongly fortified positions seemingly impregnable. The positions at Bapalm, Vimy, and the Manchi Plateau, east of Arras, were heavily fortified positions of this sort. All of these, together with the Messine Ridge, were taken by the British during three months of remarkably successful offensives. In the same way, the French concentrated upon and captured the famous Dead Man's Hill and Hill 304, overlooking Verdun, August 19th. The new conditions have made it imperative either to direct the attack upon a single hill or to advance on a very wide front, the British and French forces cooperating. Thus we read that on July 30th, the French and British smashed the German line on a 20-mile front in Flanders. August 14th, the British renewed the fighting on the loose lens line along a wide front, and on the following day they made a wide thrust between Ypres and Dimode. On September 20th, the British once more renewed the offensive in Flanders, while on the 27th they took their turn in repelling such furious attacks by the Germans in the Ypres sector as the French have steadily repelled around Verdun. No less than eight of the drives which the Allies have made so successful were launched after September 20th, the climax being that for Passchendaele, a most important position on high ground commanding the lowlands, the coast, about 20 miles distant. Field Marshal von Hindenburg is reported to have ordered his armies to hold this point at any cost. Meanwhile, the British have been striving all summer to gain it, and were victorious November 6th. This town lies five miles west of Ruler, around which fierce fighting has taken place in supreme efforts of the Germans to protect their submarine base at Ostend and Zeebrugge. The newer warfare centers about the concrete pillbox, readout, with the Germans fortify to guard an important position, the British tank, which enables the assailants to ride over obstacles to the desired position, and the swarm of airplanes by which the Allies hold the supremacy of the air. The concrete redoubt is readily seen by the aviators who direct the Allied fire, which in turn prepares the way for the tank. End of section 28. This recording is in the public domain. Section 29 of The World War Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Charge of the Canadians at Vimy Ridge, 
Photograph page 162. On April the 9th, the British began the spring drive of 1917 along a battlefront of 45 miles toward Lens and St. Quentin, since known as the Battle of Arras. The battle started on a 12-mile front north and south of Arras and led to the capture of many coveted points, including the famous Vimy Ridge, where nearly 6,000 prisoners were taken. Of this attack, the Canadian War Office said, At half-past five on Easter Monday morning, the great attack was launched with terrible fire from our massed artillery and from many field guns in hidden advance positions. Our heavies bombarded the enemy positions on and beyond the ridge, and trenches, dugouts, emplacements and roads, which for long had been kept in a continual state of disrepair by our fire, were now smashed to uselessness. An intense barrage of shrapnel from our field guns, strengthened by the indirect fire of hundreds of machine guns, was laid along the front. At the same moment, the Canadian troops advanced in line in three waves of attack. The illustration opposite, reproduced from the largest war photograph in existence, shows a wide portion of the battlefield during the actual charge. Ahead of the Canadians, their barrage is pounding to pieces the German trenches, having swept across the battlefield, demolishing the German wire entanglements, as may be plainly seen in the picture. It will be noticed that the counter-barrage smoke is particularly heavy in the background, which is accounted for by the fact that the Germans were at the moment concentrating their artillery fire on the line of tanks, which may be dimly seen through the clouds of smoke lumbering along towards the German trenches. End of section 29. This recording is in the public domain. Section number 30 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emilio Caputo. The World's Story, Volume 15. The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 30. The Battle of Cambrai, 1917, by Philip Gibbs. The last great battle of 1917 was fought by the British and Germans, November 20th to December 12th, for possession of the strategic city of Cambrai. Under Sir Julian Bing, the British attacked suddenly on a 32-mile front between St. Quentin and the Scarp, and penetrated the so-called and supposedly impregnable Hindenburg Line to a depth of five miles. The attack was led by hundreds of tanks and was irresistible. Many prisoners and guns were taken. The victory was even greater than anticipated, hence the British were not able to sustain it at all points. And the Germans, by massing heavy reinforcements from the Eastern Front, succeeded in driving the British back part way, taking prisoner about 6,000 men and numbers of guns. The battle was almost continuous for 20 days and was one of the most sanguinary of the war. The description below is from Cable Dispatches to the Current History Magazine of the New York Times. The Editor The enemy yesterday, November 20th, 1917, had, I am sure, the surprise of his life on the Western Front, where, without any warning by ordinary preparations that are made before a battle, without any sign of strength in men and guns behind the British front, without a single shot fired before the attack, and with his great belts of hideously strong wire still intact, the British troops suddenly assaulted him at dawn, led forward by great numbers of tanks, smashed through his wire, passed beyond to his trenches, and penetrated in many places the main Hindenburg line and the Hindenburg support beyond. To my mind, it is the most sensational and dramatic episode of this year's fighting, brilliantly imagined and carried through with the greatest secrecy. Not a whisper of it, 
had reached men like myself who were always up and down the lines. And since the secret of the tanks themselves, which suddenly made their appearance on the Psalm last year, this is, I believe, the best kept secret of the war. How could the enemy guess, in his wildest nightmare, that a blow would be struck quite suddenly at that Hindenburg line of his? Enormously strong in redoubts, tunnels, and trenches, and without any artillery preparation or any sign of gunpowder behind the British front. The enemy had withdrawn many of his guns from this quiet sector, and he did not know that during recent nights, great numbers of tanks had been crawling along the roads toward Avrincourt and the British lines below Flesquier Ridge, hiding by day in the copses of this wooded and rolling country beyond Peron et Bapom. Indeed, he knew little of all that was going on before him under the cover of darkness. Most of the prisoners say that the first thing they knew of the attack was when, out of the mist, they saw the tanks advancing upon them, smashing down their wire, crawling over their trenches, and nosing forward with gunfire and machine gun fire slashing from their sides. The Germans were aghast and dazed. Many hid down in their dugouts and tunnels, and then surrendered. Only the steadiest and bravest of them rushed to the machine guns and got them into action, and used their rifles to snipe the British. Out of the silence, which had prevailed behind the British lines, a great fire of guns came upon the Germans. They knew they had been caught by an amazing stratagem, and they were full of terror. Behind the tanks, coming forward in platoons, the infantry swarmed, cheering and shouting, trudging through the thistles while the tanks made a scythe of machine gun fire in front of them, and thousands of shells went screaming over the Hindenburg lines. The German artillery made but a feeble answer. Their gun positions were being smothered by the fire of all the British batteries. There were not many German batteries, and the enemy's infantry could get no great help from them. They were caught. German officers knew they had been caught, like rats in a trap. It was their black day. I think all the British felt the drama of this adventure, and had the thrill of it. A thrill which I had believed had departed out of war because of the ferocity of shellfire and the staleness of war's mechanism and formula of attack. A mass of cavalry was brought up and hidden very close to the enemy's lines, ready to make a sweeping drive should the Hindenburg line be pierced by the advance of the tanks over the great belts of barbed wire and the deep, wide trenches of the strongest lines on the western front. Yesterday, I saw the cavalry in all this country waiting for their orders to saddle up and get their first great chance. I was astounded to see them there and was stirred by a great thrill of excitement. Not without some tragic foreboding. Because after seeing much of the war on this front, and coming straight from Flanders, with its terrifying artillery and frightful barrages, it seemed to me incredible that after all, cavalry should ride out into the open and round up the enemy. I had seen the Hindenburg line up by Bullecourt and Coyant, and knew the strength of it, and the depth of the barbed wire belts that surround it. The cavalry were in the highest of spirits and full of tense expectation. Young cavalry officers galloped past smiling and called out a cheery, Good morning, like men who have had good sport ahead. In the folds of land toward the German lines, there were thousands of cavalry horses, massed in parks, with their horse artillery limbered up and ready for their ride. This morning, very early, in the steady rain and wet mist, I saw squadrons of them going into action, and it was the most stirring sight I had seen for many a long day in this war, one which I sometimes thought I should never live to see. They rode past me as I walked along the road through our newly captured ground and across the Hindenburg line. They streamed by at a quick trot, and the noise of the horses' hooves was a strange, rushing sound. Rain slashed down upon their steel hats, their capes were glistening, and mud was flung up to the horses' flanks, as in long columns they went up and down the rolling country, 
and cantered up the steep track, making a wide curve around two great mine craters and roads which the enemy had blown up in his retreat. It was a wonderful picture to see and remember. Other squadrons of cavalry had already gone ahead and had been fighting in the open country since midday yesterday, after crossing the bridges at Masnier and Marcoing, which the enemy did not have time to destroy. They had done well. One squadron rode down a battery of German guns, and a patrol had ridden into Flasquier village when the Germans were still there. Still, other bodies of cavalry had swept around German machine gun emplacements and German villages, and drawn many prisoners into their net. The drama was far beyond the most fantastic imagination. This attack on the Hindenburg lines before Cambrai has never been approached on the Western Front, and the first act began when the tanks moved forward, before dawn, toward the long, wide belts of wire, which they had to destroy before the rest could follow. These squadrons of tanks were led into action by the general commanding their corps, who carried his flag on his own tank, a most gallant man full of enthusiasm for his monsters and their brave crews, and determined that this day should be theirs. To every officer and man of the tanks he sent this order of the day before the battle. The tank corps expects that every tank this day will do its damnedest. The German troops knew nothing of the fate that awaited them, until out of the gloom of dawn they saw these great numbers of grey, inhuman creatures bearing down upon them. A German officer whom I saw today, one out of thousands of prisoners who had been taken, described his own sensations. At first, he could not believe his eyes. He seemed in some horrible nightmare and thought he had gone mad. After that, from his dugout, he watched all the tanks trampling about, crunching down the wire heaving themselves across his trenches and searching about for machine gun emplacements, while his man ran about in terror, trying to avoid the bursts of fire and crying out in surrender. Some of the German troops kept their nerve and served their machine guns, firing between the tanks at British infantry, but the tanks dealt with them and silenced them. Some of the German snipers fired at the British at a few yards, and the infantry dealt with them masterfully. But, for the most part, the enemy broke as soon as the tanks were on them, and fled, or surrendered. A few of the tanks had had bad luck, and I saw these cripples this morning, where they were overturned by shell fire or had become bogged. Elsewhere I saw one or two which had buried their noses deep into the soft earth, and lay overturned, or lay head downward, over deep banks down which they had tried to crawl. But the tank casualties were light, and large numbers of them went ahead and fought all day up in Flesquier Ridge and round the Chateau of Avrincourt, where the enemy held out for some time, and across the bridges of Marcoing and Masnier, and up to the neighborhood of Noyelle and Graincourt, and beyond Ribicourt. The attack of the Ulster battalions on the first two days of the battle was a hard, grim episode of the general action and ground was gained only by the most persistent endeavors and courage. These men, newly down from the Battle of Flanders where they had terrible and tragic fighting, were determined to go far in this new field and their spirit was high. They had no tanks to cut the wire in front of them, as those machines were concentrated in large numbers on the right wing of the attack. The Ulstermen had the Hindenburg trenches before them, wide belts of wire, and beyond the trenches, the deep ditch of the Canal du Nord, a most formidable series of defenses. They had to break down the wire in front of them by bomb explosions, and under heavy machine gun fire from the trenches, in the further side of the canal bank, where the Germans were in concrete blockhouses and strong emplacements. At first, they broke their way through all obstacles in spite of being hung up by wire here and there and the harassing fire of snipers, and they cleared the trenches of the men who were demoralized by the surprise and suddenness of the attack. Later, some of the Ulstermen came up against a high spoil bank, or waste heap, 60 feet high from the canal bank and defended from tunnel dugouts underneath it. 
About 8.30 in the morning, they captured the spoil heap and a crowd of prisoners in the dugouts, and then tried to get astride the Cambrai Road and across the canal. A gallant little body of Belfast men, all from shipbuilding works on Queen's Island, worked for hours under fire to build a bridge across and repaired the destroyed causeway so that the infantry could pass. It was done before dusk, and the Ulstermen seized the way across the Cambrai Road, but could not cross the canal or get forward very far owing to the fierce machine gun fire that swept down upon them from the east side of the canal, where the enemy was holding Mouvray and Grain Court. As the British troops advanced and the various villages were captured, the French civilians, who had for three years been under German domination, were released. The scenes at the liberation of these people are thus described by Mr. Gibbs in a cable letter written on November 22nd. The people I saw today gathered together in a ruined village in the heart of all these new scenes of war, with the tide of cavalry streaming up the roads with tanks crawling on the hillsides and guns firing across the open fields and new batches of German prisoners tramping down under escort, haggard and dazed by the swift turn of fortune's wheel, which had flung them into British hands when they seemed so safe behind their great lines, were all from Massenier near Marcoing, where 450 of them had awaited the coming of the English in feverish excitement since they heard the approach of the advance guards. They were pitiful groups of men, women, and children. Pitiful because of their helplessness in this corner of war among the guns. Some of the women had babies with them, in perambulators and wooden boxes on wheels, into which also they had tucked a few things from their abandoned homes. Some of them were young women, neatly dressed, but all plastered with mud after the tramp across the battlefields and woefully bedraggled. Some of the little girls had brought their dogs with them, and one child had a bird in a cage. There were sturdy peasants among them, and old folk, with wrinkled faces and frightened eyes because of this strange adventure in their old age, and young men of military age, who had not been taken away like most of their comrades for forced labor because their work was useful to the enemy in their own district. This was the case of a good-looking young barber to whom I talked, who had shaved the German officers and men for three years in Massenier. These people looked woe-begone as they waited in the ruins for the English lorries to take them away to safety. But in their hearts, there was great joy, as I found when I talked to them, because they were on the British side of the lines and out of reach of the enemy, whom they hate bitterly because of the discipline put upon them and their servitude, and most of all, and all in all, because he is the enemy of their country and the destroyer of their land and blood. They told me that after the coming of the Germans in the early days of the war, when the Uhlans entered Massenier and fought with French and English cavalry at Crevecourt, where our cavalry was again fighting yesterday, they had no liberty and no property. The Germans requisitioned everything, they took their pigs and their poultry and their grain and their wine. If a peasant hit a hen, he was heavily fined or put in prison. If he was discovered with a bottle of wine, he was fined 10 francs or put in prison. Mr. Gibbs gave this graphic and interesting description of the battlefield in a cable letter dated November 25th. The way up to Havrincourt village on the ridge to the west of Flesquier by a stone cross five centuries old dedicated to St. Hubert, the patron saint of huntsmen, before the tanks went on a hunting on a fine November morning, it was littered with things the Germans had left behind. Field gray overcoats, shrapnel helmets, innumerable pairs of boots, goatskin pouches, rifles, bayonets, bandoliers, tunics, gas masks. It was as if great numbers of men had thrown everything away from them in a moment of great terror and had fled naked from their fear. I went out into the open country. Outstretched before me was the whole panorama of this battle. I went up to the edge of it, as close as one could go without getting into the furnace fires. All around me were the swirl and turmoil of the battlefield. Everywhere, 
tanks were crawling over the ground, some of them moving forward into action, some of them out of action, mortally wounded. Some of them, like battle cruisers of the land, going forward in reconnaissance. Less than 200 yards away from me was a town on fire. It was grain court, and the enemy was knocking hell out of it, in revenge for its capture. It had been my intention to go there, but I stopped short of it, and was glad I had gone no farther. Shell after shell burst among its roofs and walls without ceasing for several hours. Red brick cottages went up in clouds of rosy smoke with flames in the heart of it. The enemy's shells burst in grain court with so many colors, green, purple, orange, rose, and pink, that it was a wonderful poem in color, but as tragic as the death that was there. The Germans retaliated on November 30th by delivering two flank and a center attack southwest of Cambrai on a wide front and succeeded in surprising one weaker section of the British line where 4,000 men were captured with some territory, compelling the British a few days later to withdraw from about one-third of the advance they had previously made. This bloody attack is described as follows. The assault began at 8.40 o'clock. The enemy went over the ridge between these Meuves and Berlin woods in dense masses. As they swept down the slope toward the Bapaume Cambrai Road, they came under the fire of the British artillery. The British gunners had so many targets that they hardly knew where to begin shooting, but immediately poured a veritable deluge of shells into the advancing German ranks. British machine guns and rifles also took part in the sanguinary business. The Germans fell by scores as they advanced over the ridge in close formation, but they kept coming on. British infantrymen were thrown into the battle line for a counterattack, and hot fighting ensued. The Germans succeeded in penetrating to the vicinity of the Bapaume Cambrai Highway, northwest of Graincourt, but this was as far as they were able to get. Notwithstanding their terrible losses, the Germans continued to rush over the ridge in waves all day, and always with the same result. They came under an intense fire and were mown down in great numbers. Late in the day, British counterattacks succeeded in pushing the enemy back to virtually the same line that they had left. Farther to the south, the Germans broke through the British front south of villers guislain and by executing a turning movement to the north, succeeded in enveloping Gauchewood, Gouzelcourt, Gonalou, and La Vacherie. The Germans followed their advantage by continuing their attacks on December 1st with fresh fury. The correspondent describes the battle for the village of Masnier as follows. Nine separate counterattacks launched against Masnier by strong German forces yesterday were all repulsed after most sanguinary fighting, although the British pulled their line back somewhat to lessen the sharp salient there. An intense battle raged all day, and it is stated that the British killed more Germans between daylight and dark than in any similar period since the war began. It was practically a continuous fight from the start of the first counterattack. The enemy infantry kept surging forward in waves, and as each came up it was caught by the fire from the artillery, rifles, and machine guns. The attacking forces were mowed down like wheat before the wind, but with characteristic Prussian discipline, they continued to fill their ranks and advance until the ninth assault had failed. During the afternoon, the Germans succeeded in capturing La Rue Verte, a suburb south of Massenier, but a British counterattack pushed the enemy out again. The British had to encounter ten German attacks in great force, advancing into the suburbs of La Rue Verte under the protection of a frightful bombardment. They repulsed these attacks ten times with a machine gun and rifle fire until the enemy officers sent back word that their position in this suburb was untenable and they had to retreat from the annihilating fire. But by this time, Massenier was at the end of a sharp salient, formed by the enemy's gain of the ridge below, and during the night, according to orders, the British withdrew, unknown to the Germans, who were busy with their dead and wounded. Even on Sunday morning, the Germans did not know that not a single English soldier remained in Massenier, and they bombarded it anew before sending forward more stormtroops in the afternoon when they discovered its abandonment. The Germans continued their battle on the 2nd and 3rd, employing great forces, 
they approached Le Vacherie from the east and southeast, and at the outset it appeared that the attack was comparatively local. In their first charge, the enemy came up against a stone wall, and they were forced to fall back. They kept coming in waves, however. They finally won a footing in the town, but immediately were ejected. Intense fighting at close quarters followed. In the early dawn, on December 4th, the British withdrew from the Berlin salient to a depth varying from a half to two and a half miles. The readjustment of the lines was effected without any losses to the British and left them in possession of about two-thirds of the territory originally captured. Fierce artillery exchanges between the two fronts continued day and night from the 6th to the 12th, and there were indications that the Germans were amassing immense forces for another great offensive. End of section 30. This recording is in the public domain. Section 31 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War, edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 31. The Garibaldi take the Col d'Elana, told in Colonel Papino Garibaldi's own words. 1916 by Louis R. Freeman for many years italy had longed to extend her territory on the north through the trentino and on the east through trieste and along the coast of the adriatic partly to liberate her fellow-countrymen who lived in these regions partly to secure herself against an austrian invasion by holding the mountain passes and partly to gain complete control of the adriatic sea the war seemed to offer her an opportunity to satisfy her ambition and on may twenty three nineteen fifteen she entered the conflict on the site of the entente the following selection describes the capture of one of the austrian key positions in the Carnic alps and gives a graphic idea of the obstacles the italians were compelled to overcome in their advance through the mountains colonel garibaldi is a grandson of the famous italian patriot who was largely responsible for the liberation of italy from austrian rule in the middle of the last century the editor toward the middle of the short winter afternoon the gorge we had been following opened out into a narrow valley and straight over across the little lake which the road skirted reflected in the shimmering sheet of steaming water that the thaw was throwing out across the ice was a vivid white triangle of towering mountain a true granite alp among the splintered dolomites a fortress among cathedrals it was the outstanding the dominating feature in a panorama which i knew from my map was made up of the mountain chain along which wriggled the interlocked lines of the austro-italian battlefront plainly a peak with a personality i said to the officer at my side what is it called it's the call delana was the reply the mountain colonel peppino garibaldi took in a first attempt in galassio caetani the italio american mining engineer afterward blew up and captured completely it is one of the most important positions on our whole front for whichever side holds it not only effectually blocks the enemy's advance but has also an invaluable sally port from which to launch his own we simply had to have it and it was taken in what was probably the only way humanly possible it's colonel garibaldi's headquarters by the way where we put up to-night and to-morrow perhaps you can get him to tell you the story by the light of a little spirit lamp and to the accompaniment of a steady drip of eaves and the rumble of distant avalanches of falling snow colonel garibaldi that evening told me the story in july i was given command of a battalion occupying a position at the foot of the call delana perhaps you saw from the lake as you came up the commanding position of this mountain if so you will understand its supreme importance to us whether for defensive or offensive purposes looking straight down the corda vol valley toward the plains of italy it not only furnished the austrians an incomparable observation post but also stood as an effectual barrier against any advance of our own toward the levin alongo valley and the important por doy pass we needed it imperatively for the safety of any line we established in this region and just as imperatively would we need it when we were ready to push the austrians back since it was just as important for the austrians to maintain possession of this great natural fortress as it was for us to take it away from them 
you will understand how it came about that the struggle for the cold de lana was perhaps the bitterest that has yet been waged for any one point on the alpine front early in july under cover of our guns to the south and east the alpini streamed down from the kimbra di falzarego and sasso di stria which they had occupied shortly before and secured what was at first but a precarious foothold on the stony lower eastern slope of the cold de lana indeed it was little more than a toehold at first but the never resting alpini soon dug themselves in and became firmly established it was to the command of this battalion of alpini that i came on the twelfth of july after being given to understand that my work was to be the taking of the cold de lana regardless of cost at that time the austrians who had appreciated the great importance of that mountain from the outset had us heavily outgunned while mining in the hard rock was too slow to make it worth while until some single position of crucial value hung in the balance so well i simply did the best i could under the circumstances the most i could do was to give my men as complete protection as possible while they were not fighting and this end was accomplished by establishing them in galleries cut out of the solid rock this was i believe the first time the gallery barracks now quite the rule at all exposed points were used on the italian front there was no other way in the beginning but to drive the enemy off the col de lana trench by trench and this was the task i set myself to toward the end of july what made the task an almost prohibitive one was the fact that the austrian guns from corte and Schertz, which we were in no position to reduce to silence were able to rake us unmercifully every move we made during the next nine months was carried out under their fire and there is no use in denying that we suffered heavily i used no more men than i could possibly help using and the higher command was very generous in the matter of reserves and even in increasing the strength of the force at my disposal as we gradually got more room to work in by the end of october my original command of a battalion had been increased largely the austrians made a brave and skilful defence but the steady pressure we were bringing to bear on them gradually forced them back up the mountain by the first week in november we were in possession of three sides of the mountain while the austrians held the fourth side and but most important of all the summit the latter presented a sheer wall of rock more than two hundred metres high to us from any direction we were able to approach it and on the crest of this cliff the only point exposed to our artillery fire the enemy had a cunningly concealed machine-gun post served by fourteen men back and behind under shelter in a rock gallery was a reserve of two hundred men who were expected to remain safely under cover during a bombardment and then sally forth to repel any infantry attack that might follow it the handful in the machine-gun post it was calculated would be sufficient and more than sufficient to keep us from scaling the cliff before their reserves came up to support them and so they would have been if there had been only an infantry attack to reckon with it failed to allow sufficiently however for the weight of the artillery we were bringing up and the skill of our gunners the apparent impregnability of the position was really its undoing this cunningly conceived plan of defence i had managed to get a pretty accurate idea of no matter how and i laid my own plans accordingly all the guns i could get hold of i had in place in positions most favourable for concentrating on the real key to the summit the exposed machine-gun post on the crown of the cliff with the idea if possible of destroying men and guns completely or failing in that at least to render it untenable for the reserves who would try to rally to its defence we had the position ranged to an inch and so fortunately lost no time in feeling for it this with the surprise incident to it was perhaps the principal element in our success for the plan at least so far as taking a summit was concerned worked out quite as perfectly in action as upon paper that is the great satisfaction of working with the alpino by the way he is so sure so dependable that the human fallibility element in a plan always the most uncertain quantity is practically eliminated it is almost certain that our sudden gust of concentrated gunfire snuffed out the lives of all the men in the machine-gun post before they had time to send word of our developing infantry attack to the reserves in the gallery below at any rate these latter made no attempt whatever to swarm up to the defence of the crest even after our artillery fire ceased the consequence was that the one hundred and twenty alpini i sent to scale the cliff reached the top with only three casualties these probably caused by rolling rocks or flying rock fragments the austrians in their big funk hole were taken completely by surprise and one hundred and thirty of them fell prisoners to considerably less than that number of italians the rest of the two hundred escaped or were killed in their flight so far it was so good but unfortunately taking the summit and holding it were two entirely different matters 
no sooner did the austrians discover what had happened than they opened on the summit with all their available artillery we have since ascertained that the fire of one hundred and twenty guns was concentrated upon a space of one hundred by one hundred and fifty metres which offered the only approach to cover that the barren summit afforded fifty of my men finding shelter in the lee of rocky ledges remained right out on the summit the others crept over the edge of the cliff and held on by their fingers and toes not a man of them sought safety by flight though a retirement would have been quite justified considering what a hell the austrians guns were making of the summit the enemy counter-attacked at nightfall but despite superior numbers and the almost complete exhaustion of that little band of alpini heroes they were able to retake only a half of the summit here at a ten metres high ridge which roughly bisects the kaima the alpini held the austrians and here in turn the latter held the reinforcements which i was finally able to send to the alpini's aid they are exposed to the fire of the guns of either side and so comparatively safe from both a line was established from which there seemed little probability that one combatant could drive the other at least without a radical change from the methods so far employed the idea of blowing up positions that cannot be taken otherwise is by no means a new one probably it dates back almost as far as the invention of gunpowder itself doubtless if we only knew of them there have been attempts to mine the great wall of china it was therefore only natural that when the austrians had us held up before our position it was vitally necessary we should have we should begin to consider the possibility of mining it as the only alternative the conception of the plan did not necessarily originate in the mind of any one individual however many have laid claim to it it was the inevitable thing if we were not going to abandon striving for our objective but while there was nothing new in the idea of the mine itself in carrying out an engineering operation of such magnitude at so great an altitude and from a position constantly exposed to intense artillery fire there were presented many problems quite without precedent it was these problems which gave us pause but finally despite the prospect of difficulties which we fully realized might at any time become prohibitive it was decided to make the attempt to blow up that portion of the summit of the Col de Lana still held by the enemy the choice of the engineer for the work was a singularly fortunate one glacio caetani he is the son of the duke of Sermoneta, had operated as a mining engineer in the american west for a number of years previous to the war and the practical experience gained in california and alaska was invaluable preparation for the great task now set for him his ready resource and great personal courage were also incalculable assets as an instance of the latter i could tell you how to permit him to make certain imperative observations he allowed himself to be lowered over the side of a sheer cliff at a point only partially protected from the enemy's fire well the tunnel was started about the middle of january nineteen sixteen some of my men italians who had hurried home to fight for their country when the war started had had some previous experience with hand and machine drills in the mines of colorado and british columbia but the most of our labor had to gain its experience as the work progressed considering this as well as the difficulty of bringing up material to say nothing of food and munitions we made very good progress the worst thing about it all was the fact that it had to be done under the incessant fire of the austrian artillery i provided for the men as best i could by putting them in galleries where they were at least able to get their rest in comparative safety my own headquarters were in a little shed in the lee of a big rock when the enemy finally found out what we were up to they celebrated their discovery by a steady bombardment which lasted for fourteen days without interruption during a certain forty-two hours of that fortnight there was by actual count an average of thirty-eight shells a minute exploding on our little position with all the protection it was possible to provide the strain became such that i found it advisable to change the battalion holding our portion of the summit every week did i have any respite myself well hardly or rather not until i had to we were constantly confronted with new and perplexing problems things which no one had ever been called upon to solve before most of them in connection with transportation how we contrived to surmount one of these i shall never forget the austrians had performed a brave and audacious feat in emplacing one of their batteries at a certain point the fire from which threatened to make our position absolutely untenable the location of this battery was so cunningly chosen that not one of our guns could reach it and yet we had to silence it and for good if we were going to go on with our work the only point from which we could fire upon these destructive guns was so exposed that any artillery we might be able to mount there could only count on the shortest shrift under the fire of the hundred or more heavies that the austrians would be able to concentrate upon it and yet i figured well employed these few minutes might prove enough to do the work in as there was no other alternative i decided to chance it 
and then there arose another difficulty the smallest gun that would stand a chance of doing the job cut out for it weighed one hundred and twenty kilos about two hundred and sixty five pounds this just for the gun alone with all detachable parts removed but the point where the gun was to be mounted was so exposed that there was no chance of rigging up a cable way while the incline was so steep and rough that it was out of the question to try to drag it up with ropes just as we were on the verge of giving up in despair one of the alpini a man of herculean frame who had made his living in peacetime by breaking chains on his chest and performing other feats of strength came and suggested that he be allowed to carry the gun up on his shoulder grasping at a straw i let him indulge in a few practice manoeuvres but these only showed that while the young samson could shoulder and trot off with the gun without great effort the task of lifting himself and his burden from foothold to foothold in the crumbling rock of the seventy degree slope was too much for him but out of this failure there came a new idea why not let my strong man simply support the weight of the gun on his shoulder acting as a sort of ambulant gun carriage so to speak while a line of men pulled him along with a rope we rigged up a harness to equalize the pull on the broad back and with the aid of sixteen ordinary men the feat was accomplished without a hitch i am sorry to say however that poor samson was laid up for a spell with racked muscles the gun with the necessary parts and munition was taken up in the night and at daybreak it was set up and ready for action it fired just forty shots before the austrian heavies blew it and all but one or two of its brave crew to pieces with a rain of high explosive but it had done its work and done it well the sacrifice was not in vain the troublesome austrian battery was put so completely out of action that the enemy never thought it worth while to re-emplace it that is just a sample of the fantastic things we were doing all of the three months that we drove the tunnel under the summit of the cold Delana. the last few weeks were further enlivened by the knowledge that the austrians were countermining against us once they drove so near that we could feel the jar of their drills but they exploded their mine just a few metres short of where it would have upset us for good and for all all the time work went on until on the seventeenth of april the mine was finished charged and tamped that night while every gun we could bring to bear rain shell upon the austrian position it was exploded a crater one hundred and fifty feet in diameter and sixty feet deep engulfed the ridge the enemy had occupied and this our waiting alpini rushed and firmly held feeble austrian counter-attacks were easily repulsed and the call de lana was at last completely in italian hands in the autumn of nineteen seventeen the teuton army broke through the flank of the italian forces that were threatening trieste and drove deep into the plains of italy undoing at a blow the gains the italians had spent nearly two and a half years and countless lives to gain and capturing a vast booty of prisoners and supplies End of section thirty one Section thirty two of the World War Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The World War Part five The Eastern Front Historical Note The campaign on the Eastern Front began with the mobilizing of the Austrian and Serbian forces during the last days of july nineteen fourteen, the massing of Russian troops, and the mobilizing of German armies to meet Russia. The main Austrian forces were sent to Galicia to meet the Russian advance, and an effort was also made to enter Poland. The Russian plan was to engage Austria as soon as possible, before Germany could move forces from the Western Front. Russia met with reverses in East Prussia, and was defeated by the Germans in the Battle of Tannenberg, September 1st, when the army opposing von Hindenburg was enveloped in the swamp districts. But the main armies still pressed forward, and were generally victorious over Austria. The main Austrian army was defeated and routed at Lemberg and Lublin. The Germans failed in their attempt to come to the rescue. And the Russians crossed the San, invested Remzil, the key to Galicia, penetrated the Carpathians, and finally took Remzil, March 22, 1915. Nothing now seemed to stand in the way of Russia's campaign. Meanwhile, the Germans won the Battle of the Missourian Lakes region, February 10, 1915, and began a great offensive early in May, which turned the tide in favor of Austria. Under von Mackensen, a large army swept the Russians to the rear at all points. Remzil and Lemberg were retaken, and Warsaw fell August 5th. The Russian army escaped, but Galicia had been lost, the campaign in Poland had failed, and many prisoners and a large section of Russian territory were in the hands of the Austro-Germans. But the Russians rallied, and in the late spring of 1916 once more broke through the Austrian lines. Later, Romania joined the Allies, and Russian success seemed secure. 
but the Germans, strengthened by the Bulgars and Turks, carried the day. The Romanian forces were routed, and the Russian armies once more withdrew. Then, in the spring of 1917, came the Russian Revolution, internal disruption in the army, Teutonic intrigue, and the gradual withdrawal of Russia as a factor in the war. End of section 32. This recording is in the public domain. Section 33 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2021. The World's Story, Volume 15, The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 33. Entrenched with the Austrians in Galicia, 1914, by Fritz Kreisler. Just then our own artillery came thundering up, occupied a little hill in the rear, and opened fire on the enemy. The moral effect of the thundering of one's own artillery is most extraordinary, and many of us thought that we had never heard any more welcome sound than the deep roaring and crashing that started in at our rear. It quickly helped to disperse the nervousness caused by the first entering into battle, and to restore self-control and confidence. Besides, by getting into action, our artillery was now focusing the attention and drawing the fire of the Russian guns, for most of the latter's shells whined harmlessly above us, being aimed at the batteries in our rear. Considerably relieved by this diversion, we resumed our forward movement after about fifteen minutes of further rest, our goal being the little chain of hills which our advance guard had previously occupied pending our arrival. Here we were ordered to take up positions and dig trenches, any further advance being out of the question, as the Russian artillery overlooked and commanded the entire plain stretching in front of us. We started at once to dig our trenches, half of my platoon stepping forward abreast, the men being placed an arm's length apart. After laying their rifles down, barrels pointing to the enemy, a line was drawn behind the row of rifles and parallel to it. Then each man would dig up the ground, starting from his part of the line backwards, throwing forward the earth removed until it formed a sort of breastwork. The second half of the platoon was meanwhile resting in the rear, rifle in hand and ready for action. After a half hour they took the place of the first division at work, and vice versa. Within an hour work on the trenches was so far advanced that they could be deepened while standing in them. Such an open trench affords sufficient shelter against rifle bullets striking from the front, and can be made in a measure shell-proof by being covered with boards, if at hand, and with sword. Where we were in Galicia at the beginning of the war, with conditions utterly unsteady and positions shifting daily and hourly, only the most superficial trenches were used. In fact, we thought ourselves fortunate if we could requisition straw enough to cover the bottom. That afternoon we had about finished our work, when our friend the aeroplane appeared on the horizon again. This time it immediately opened fire. It disappeared, but apparently had seen enough, for very soon our position was shelled. By this time, however, shrapnel had almost ceased to be a source of concern to us, and we scarcely paid any attention to it. Human nerves quickly get accustomed to the most unusual conditions and circumstances, and I noticed that quite a number of men actually fell asleep from sheer exhaustion in the trenches, in spite of the roaring of the cannon about us and the whizzing of shrapnel over our heads. At nine o'clock in the morning everything was ready to receive the enemy, the men taking a short and well-deserved rest in the trenches, while we officers were called to the colonel, who acquainted us with the general situation, and giving his orders, addressed us in a short, business-like way, 
appealing to our sense of duty and expressing his firm belief in our victory. We all knew that this martial attitude and abrupt manner were a mask to hide his inner self, full of throbbing emotion and tender solicitude for his subordinates, and we returned to our trenches deeply moved. The camp was absolutely quiet, the only movements being around the field kitchens in the rear, which were being removed from the battle line. A half hour later, any casual observer, glancing over the deserted fields, might have laughed at the intimation that the earth around him was harboring thousands of men armed to their teeth, and that pandemonium of hell would break loose within an hour. Barely a soul was audible, and a hush of expectancy descended upon us. I looked around at my men in the trench. Some were quietly asleep, some writing letters, others conversing in subdued and hushed tones. Every face I saw bore the unmistakable stamp of feeling so characteristic of the last hour before a battle, that curious mixture of solemn dignity, grave responsibility, and suppressed emotion, with an undercurrent of sad resignation. They were pondering over their possible fate, or perhaps dreaming of their dear ones at home. By and by even the little conversation ceased, and they sat silent, waiting and waiting, perhaps awed by their own silence. Sometimes one would bravely try to crack a joke, and they laughed, but it sounded strained. They were plainly nervous, these brave men that fought like lions in the open when led to an attack, heedless of danger and destruction. They felt under a cloud in the security of the trenches, and they were conscious of it and ashamed. Sometimes my faithful orderly would turn his eye on me, mute as if in quest of an explanation of his own feeling. Poor, dear, unsophisticated boy! I was as nervous as they all were, although trying my best to look unconcerned, but I knew that the hush that hovered around us like a dark cloud would give way like magic to wild enthusiasm as soon as the first shot broke the spell and the exultation of the battle took hold of us all. Suddenly, at about ten o'clock, a dull thud sounded somewhere far away from us, and simultaneously we saw a small white round cloud about half a mile ahead of us where the shrapnel had exploded. The battle had begun. Other shots followed shortly, exploding here and there, but doing no harm. The Russian gunners evidently were trying to locate and draw an answer from our batteries. These, however, remained mute, not caring to reveal their position. For a long time the Russians fired at random, mostly at too short range to do any harm, but slowly the harmless-looking white clouds came nearer, until a shell, whining as it whizzed past us, burst about a hundred yards behind our trench. A second shell followed, exploding almost at the same place. At the same time we noticed a faint spinning noise above us. Soaring high above our position, looking like a speck in the firmament, flew a Russian aeroplane, watching the effect of the shells and presumably directing the fire of the Russian artillery. This explained its sudden accuracy. One of our aeroplanes rose, giving chase to the enemy, and simultaneously got into action. The Russians kept up a sharply concentrated, well-directed fire against our centre, our gunners responding gallantly, and the spirited artillery duel which ensued grew in intensity until the entrails of the earth seemed fairly to shake with the thunder. By one o'clock the incessant roaring, crashing and splintering of bursting shells had become unendurable to our nerves, which were already strained to the snapping point by the lack of action and the expectancy. Suddenly there appeared a thin dark line on the horizon which moved rapidly toward us, looking not unlike a running bird with immense outstretched wings. We looked through our glasses. 
there could be no doubt it was russian cavalry swooping down upon us with incredible impetus and swiftness i quickly glanced at our colonel he stared open-mouthed this was indeed good fortune for us too good to believe no cavalry attack could stand before well-disciplined infantry providing the latter keep cool and well composed calmly waiting until the riders come sufficiently close to take sure aim there was action for us at last a sharp word of command our men scrambled out of the trenches for better view and aim shouting with joy as they did so what a change had come over us all my heart beat with wild exultation i glanced at my men they were all eagerness and determination hand at the trigger eyes on the approaching enemy every muscle strained yet calm their bronzed faces hardened to immobility waiting for the command to fire every subaltern officer's eye hung on our colonel who stood about thirty yards ahead of us on a little hill his figure well defined in the sunlight motionless the very picture of calm assurance and proud bearing he scanned the horizon with his glasses shrapnel was hailing around him but he seemed utterly unaware of it for that matter we had all forgotten it though it kept up its terrible uproar spitting here and there destruction into our midst by this time the avalanche of tramping horses had come perceptibly nearer soon they would sweep by the bundle of hay which marked the carefully measured range within which our fire was effective suddenly the mad stampede came to an abrupt standstill and then the cossacks scattered precipitately to the right and left only to disclose in their rear the advancing russian infantry the movements of which it had been their endeavour to veil the first russian lines were mowed down as if by a gigantic scythe and so were the reserves as they tried to advance the first attack had collapsed after a short time however they came on again this time more cautiously armed with nippers to cut the barbed wire and using the bodies of their fallen comrades as a rampart again they were repulsed once more their cavalry executed a feigned attack under cover of which the russian infantry rallied strongly reinforced by reserves and more determined than ever supported by heavy artillery fire their lines rolled endlessly on and hurled themselves against the barbed wire fences for a short time it almost seemed as if they would break through by sheer weight of numbers at that critical moment however our reserves succeeded in executing a flanking movement surprised and caught in a deadly crossfire the russian line wavered and finally fled in disorder all these combined artillery infantry cavalry and aeroplane attacks had utterly failed in their object of dislodging our center or shaking its position each one being frustrated by the resourceful cool alertness of our commanding general and the splendid heroism and stoicism of our troops but the strain of the continuous fighting for nearly the whole day without respite of any kind or chance for food or rest in the end told on the power of endurance of our men and when the last attack had been successfully repulsed they lay mostly prostrated on the ground panting and exhausted our losses had been very considerable too stretcher bearers being busy administering first aid and carrying the wounded back to the nearest field hospital while many a brave man lay stark and still by eight o'clock it had grown perceptibly cooler we now had time to collect our impressions and look about us the russians had left many dead on the field and at the barbed wire entanglement which our sappers had constructed as an obstacle to their advance their bodies lay heaped upon each other looking not unlike the more innocent bundles of hay laying in the field 
we could see the small red cross parties in the field climbing over the horribly grotesque tumuli of bodies trying to disentangle the wounded from the dead and administer first aid to them enthusiasm seemed suddenly to disappear before this terrible spectacle life that only a few hours before had glowed with enthusiasm and exultation suddenly paled and sickened the silence of the night was interrupted only by the low moaning of the wounded that came regularly to us it was hideous in its terrible monotony end of section 33section thirty four of the world war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr natter the world's story volume fifteen the world war edited by horatio w dracer section thirty four russian victory at premishu nineteen fifteen by bernard pears the great Austrian fortress of Przemysl in Galicia surrendered to the Russian forces March 22, 1915. With one short interruption, the siege had been continuous since September 21, 1914. The victory was celebrated by a Te Deum of Thanksgiving in the presence of the Tsar and General Staff. Until this fortress was taken, the Russians were not in a position to invade Hungary early in april the whole russian battlefront was moved forward along the carpathians and for some time the fight for galicia was favourable to russia the editor the fall of Przemysl, which will now no doubt be called by its russian name of Peremyshl, is in every way surprising even a few days before quite well informed people had no idea that the end was coming so soon the town was a first-class fortress whose development had been an object of special solicitude to the late archduke ferdinand of course it was recognized that peremyshl was the gate of hungary and the key to galicia but more than that it was strengthened into a great point of debauchment for an aggressive movement for austria-hungary against russia for the russian policy of austria like her original plan of campaign was based on the assumption of the offensive it was generally understood that Peremyshl was garrisoned by about 50,000 men, that the garrison was exclusively Hungarian, and that the commander, Kusmanek, was one of the few really able Austrian commanders in this war. The stores were said to be enough for a siege of three years. The circle of the forts was so extended as to make operations easy against any but the largest blockading force, and the aerodrome, which was well covered, gave communication with the outside world an airpost has run almost regularly the letters of which i have some being stamped fliegerpost as long as peremyshl held out the local jews constantly circulated rumours of an austrian return and the russian tenure of galicia remained precarious the practical difficulties offered to the russians by peremyshl were very great for the one double railway line westward runs through the town so that all military and red cross communications have been indefinitely lengthened for weeks past the fortress had kept up a terrific fire which was greater than any experienced elsewhere from austrian artillery thousands of shells yielded only tens of wounded and it would seem that the austrians could have had no other object than to get rid of their ammunition the fire was now intensified to stupendous proportions and the sortie took place but so far from the whole garrison coming out it was only a portion of it and was driven back with the annihilation of almost a whole division now followed extraordinary scenes austrian soldiers were seen fighting each other while the russians looked on amid the chaos a small group of staff officers appeared casually enough with a white flag and announced surrender austrians were seen cutting pieces out of slaughtered horses that lay in heaps and showing an entire indifference to their capture explosions of war material continued after the surrender the greatest surprise of all was the strength of the garrison which numbered not fifty thousand but one hundred and thirty thousand which makes of peremyshl a second metz different explanations were offered for instance the troops which had lost their field trains and therefore their mobility 
are reported to have taken refuge in Peremyshl after Ravaruska, but surely the subsequent withdrawal of the blockade gave them ample time for retreat. A more convincing account is that Peremyshl was full of depots, left there to be supports of a great advancing army. In any case, no kind of defence can be pleaded for the surrender of this imposing force. The numbers of the garrison, of course, reduced to one-third the time during which food supplies would last, but even so the fortress should have held out for a year. The epidemic diseases within the lines supply only a partial explanation. The troops, instead of being all Hungarians, were of various Austrian nationalities, and there is good reason to think that the conditions of defence led to feuds, brawls, and in the end open disobedience of orders. This was all the more likely because, while food was squandered on the officers, the rank and file and the local population were reduced to extremes, and because the officers, to judge by the first sortie, took but little part in the actual fighting. The wholesale slaughter of horses of itself robbed the army of its mobility. The fall of Peremyshl is the most striking example so far of the general demoralization of the Austrian army and monarchy. Peremyshl, so far a formidable hindrance to the Russians, is now, March 1915, a splendid base for an advance into Hungary. The hopes thus held out were doubtless well founded, as far as Russian successes over Austria were concerned. But in May and June, the Germans, under von Mackensen, began a great offensive which brought disaster to the Russian forces. The Russians were driven back in the Carpathians, along the Dunayets they suffered defeat, and presently the whole Carpathian army was threatened. June 2nd, the Austria-German forces recaptured Tremischl, and by the 14th, the German army was attacking the Russians over a 43-mile front, taking positions from Czerniawa to Lienawa. June 22nd, the Austro-German forces took Ravaruska, 32 miles northwest of Lemberg, and the next day the Russians abandoned Lemberg, which was occupied by the Austrians and Germans. The Russians were then defeated on the Dniester, and on the entire front from Halic to Firielov. For a considerable time the Russians were able to head off the attacks on Warsaw, but on August the 5th the city fell into the hands of the Germans. The Russian disaster is explained by the lack of ammunition and by the great superiority of the German artillery and generalship. End of section 34. This recording is in the public domain. Section 35 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 35. The Defeat at Gallipoli, 1915 by Sir Ian Hamilton. In an attempt to capture Constantinople and open the Dardanelles, thus securing a much-needed passage to the grain ports of southern Russia, an English army, under Sir Ian Hamilton, landed on the Gallipoli Peninsula on April 26, 1915. The campaign, which ended with the retreat from Gallipoli, as reported January the ninth, nineteen sixteen, with the final abandonment of positions which the British had held, covered a period of about eleven months. General Sir Ian Hamilton's report, which made known to the world for the first time some of the more important details of the great disaster, covers the period from early May to the middle of October, when General Hamilton was recalled. The operations at Suvla Bay took place early in August and led to the climax on August the 10th when the Turks made their attack upon the battalions of the 6th North Lancashire and 5th Wiltshire regiments. The campaign in the Dardanelles came to an end with the abandonment of Sed El Bar. The following selection from General Hamilton's report tells the story of the fateful days in August the editor 
first our men were shelled by every enemy gun then assaulted by a huge column consisting of no less than a full division plus three battalions the north lancashire men were simply overwhelmed in their shallow trenches by sheer weight of numbers while the wiltshires who were caught out in the open were literally almost annihilated the ponderous mass of the enemy swept over the crest and swarmed around the hampshires and general baldwin's brigade which had to give ground and were only extricated with great difficulty and with very heavy losses now it was our turn the warships and the new zealand and australian artillery an indian mountain artillery brigade and the sixty ninth brigade royal field artillery were getting the chance of a lifetime as successive solid lines of turks topped the crest of the ridge gaps were torn through their formation and an iron rain fell upon them as they tried to reform in the gullies not here only did the turks pay dearly for their recapture of the vital crest enemy reinforcements continued to move up under a heavy and accurate fire from our guns still they kept topping the ridges and pouring down the western slopes of chunuk bear as if determined to regain everything they had lost but once they were over the crest they became exposed not only to the full blast of the guns naval and military but to a battery of ten new zealand machine guns which played upon their serried ranks at close range until their barrels were red hot enormous losses were inflicted and of the swarms which had once fairly crossed the crest line only a handful ever struggled back to their own side of chunuk bear at the same time strong forces of the enemy were hurled against the spears to the northeast where there arose a conflict so deadly that it may be considered the climax of four days fighting for the ridge portions of our line were pierced and the troops were driven clean down the hill at the foot of the hill the men who were supervising the transport of food and water were rallied by staff captain street unhesitatingly they followed him back where they plunged again into the midst of that series of struggles in which generals fought in the ranks and men dropped their scientific weapons and caught one another by the throat the turks came on again and again fighting magnificently and calling upon the name of god our men stood to it and maintained by many a deed of daring the old traditions of their race they died in the ranks where they stood by evening the total casualties of general birdwood's force had reached twelve thousand and included a large proportion of officers the thirteenth division of the new army under major general shaw had alone lost six thousand out of a grand total of ten thousand five hundred brigadier general baldwin was gone and all his staff and commanding officers thirteen had disappeared from the fighting effectives the warwicks and worcesters had lost literally every single officer the old german notion that no unit could stand the loss of more than twenty five per cent had been completely falsified the thirteenth division and the twenty ninth brigade of the tenth irish division had lost more than twice that and in spirit were game for as much more fighting as might be required the operations in the region of anzac were in process at about the same time general hamilton reports that during the night of august the eleventh two brigades were brought from imbros to suvla bay the brigades and their batteries were landed in the darkness and the turks were taken by surprise but misfortunes soon came here as elsewhere in the campaign the senior commanders lacked experience in the new trench warfare and did not understand the turkish methods of fighting on august the fifteenth general stopford was relieved of the command of his division and general de lisle succeeded him then too the soldiers suffered greatly from lack of water a large quantity of water was secretly collected at anzac where a reservoir holding thirty thousand gallons was built 
oil tins with a capacity of eighty thousand gallons were collected and fitted with handles but at the most important juncture an accident to a steamer delayed the landing of the supply it was not therefore feasible to bring up the reserves when most needed general hamilton's report continues at times i thought of throwing my reserves into this stubborn central battle where probably they would have turned the scale but each time water troubles made me give up the idea all ranks at anzac being reduced to a pint a day true thirst is a sensation unknown to the dwellers in cool well-watered england but at anzac when the mules with water-bags arrived at the front the men would rush up to them in swarms just to lick the moisture that exuded through the canvas bags until wells had been discovered under freshly won hills the reinforcing of anzac by even so much as a brigade was unthinkable by the middle of august the british were also short of rifles general hamilton cabled for fifty thousand fresh rifles and reinforcements at once believing that by their aid his troops could clear a passage for the fleet to constantinople but the reinforcements and munitions were not forthcoming the retirement from Suvla Bay and Anzac regions was a step towards the abandonment of the entire peninsula of Gallipoli. At the time General Hamilton was recalled in October, the evacuation of the peninsula seemed to him unthinkable, but the abandonment came as a matter of course after it became clear that Constantinople could not then be taken great britain's losses in the dardanelles up to december the eleventh nineteen fifteen are officially given as one hundred and twelve thousand nine hundred and twenty one officers and men this figure which includes the naval lists covers the total number of killed wounded and missing besides these casualties the number of sick admitted to the hospital was ninety six thousand six hundred and eighty three general sir charles munro then in command reported january the ninth nineteen sixteen that the evacuation of the peninsula was complete the guns and howitzers were successfully removed with the exception of a few worn-out guns which were blown up before the last forces withdrew the casualties amounted to one member of the british rank and file wounded with no casualties among the french some of the forces were sent to salonica while others were assigned to duty in mesopotamia a military expert has written in summing up the effect of the gallipoli failure it is fair to say that it is readily susceptible to great exaggeration it must be remembered that the british never held very much in the strait had they taken constantinople the war would certainly have been shortened having failed to take it the war will follow the course it would have followed had the dardanelles movement not been attempted this entire theatre is subsidiary a side issue the movement was designed to help russia not because there was any decisively inherent value in constantinople itself end of section thirty five this recording is in the public domain Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. Section 36 of The World War Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Landing under fire at the Dardanelles Photograph, page 204 it would be difficult to find in all history a more heroic episode than the landing of the british troops at gallipoli the circumstances of the landing were fully described in the accompanying article the launches shown in the illustration are being towed by a picket boat under cover of fire from the british battleship just behind them these launches were the target of innumerable cannon machine guns and rifles and the losses were fearfully heavy many of the men were shot or drowned before the boats grounded 
many more were killed on the beach but the survivors made good the landing and flinging themselves against the turkish positions won a precarious footing along the shore end of section thirty six this recording is in the public domain section thirty seven of the world war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by Brittany bogle the world story volume fifteen the world war edited by horatio w dresser section thirty seven a british soldier at suvla bay nineteen fifteen by john hargrave a pale pink sunrise burst across the eastern sky as our transport came steaming into the bay the haze of early morning dust still held blurring the mainland and water in misty outlines you must understand that we knew not where we were we had never heard of suvla bay we didn't know what part of the peninsula we had reached the mystery of the adventure made it all the more exciting it was to be a new landing by the tenth division that was all we knew. Some of us had slept, and some had lain awake all night. Rapidly, the pink sunrise swept behind the rugged mountains to the left, and was reflected in wobbling ripples in the bay. We joined the host of battleships, monitors, and troop ships standing out, and stood by. We could hear the rattle of machine guns and the distant gloom behind the streak of sandy shore. The decks were crowded with that same khaki crowd. We all stood eagerly watching and listening, the death silence had come upon us. No one spoke. No one whistled. We could see the lighters and small boats towing troops ashore. We saw the men scramble out, only to be blown to pieces by landmines as they waded to the beach. On the Lala Baba side, we watched platoons and companies form up and march along in fours, all in step as if they were on parade. No sooner had my companions spoken than a high explosive from the Turkish positions on the Sari Bear Range came screaming over the Salt Lake. They were like a little group of dead beetles, and the wounded were crawling away like ants into the dead yellow grass and the sage bushes to die. A whole platoon was smashed. It was not yet daylight. We could see the flicker of rifle fire and the crackle sounded first on one part of the bay and then on another. Among the dark rocks and bushes, it looked as if people were striking thousands of matches. Mechanical death went steadily on. Four Turkish batteries on the Kizlar Daw were blown up one after the other by our battleships. We watched the thick, rolling smoke of the explosions and saw bits of wheels and the arms and legs of gunners blown up in little black fragments against that pearl-pink sunrise. The noise of mechanical battle went surging from one side of the bay to the other. It swept round suddenly with an angry rattle of maxims and the hard echoing crackle of rifle fire. Now and then our battleships crashed forth, and their shells went hurtling and screaming over the mountains to burst with a muffled roar somewhere out of sight. Mechanical death moved back and forth. It whistled and screamed and crashed. It spat fire and unfolded puffs of gray and white and black smoke. It flashed tongues of livid flame, like some devilish anteater lapping up its insects and the insects were the sons of men. Mechanical death, as we saw him at work, was hard and metallic, steel-studded and shrapnel-toothed. Now and then he bristled with bayonets, and they glittered here and there in tiny groups and charged up the rocks and through the bushes. The noise increased. Mechanical death worked first on our side and then with the Turks. He led forward a squad, and the next instant mowed them down with a hail of lead. He galloped up a battery, unlimbered, and before the first shell could be rammed home, mechanical death blew up the whole lot with a high explosive from a Turkish battery in the hills. And so it went on, hour after hour. Crackle, rattle, and roar. Scream, whistle, and crash. We stood there on the deck, watching the men get killed. Now and then, a shell came wailing and moaning across the bay, and dropped into the water with a great column of spray glittering in the early morning sunshine. A German Taub buzzed overhead. The hum, hum, hum of the engine was very loud. She dropped several bombs, but none of them did much damage. The little yellow-skinned observation balloon floated above one of our battleships like a penny toy. The Turks had several shots at it, but missed it every time. The incessant noise of battle grew more distant as our troops on shore advanced. 
It broke out like a bushfire and spread from one section to another. Mechanical death pressed forward across the salt lake. It stormed the heights of the Capandra Cert on one side and took Lalababa on the other. Puffs of smoke hung on the hills, and the shore was all wreathed in the smoke of rifle and machine gun fire. A deadly conflict, this, for one Turk on the hills was worth ten British down below on the salt lake. There was no glory. Here was death, sure enough. Mechanical death run amok. But where was the glory? We wondered how it was that we were still alive when so many lay dead. Some were killed on the decks of the transports by shrapnel. Our monitors crept close to the sandy shore and poured out a deadly brood of death. And now came the time for us to land. We huddled into the lighter and hauled our stores down below. Some of us were green about the gills, and some were trying to pretend we didn't care. We watched the boat which landed just before us strike a mine and be blown to pieces. Encouraging sight. The Capanja Cert runs along one side of Suvla Bay. It is one wing of that horseshoe formation of rugged mountains which hymns on the Anafartaova and the Salt Lake. Our searching zone for wounded lay along this ridge, which rises like the vertebrae of some great antediluvian reptile, dropping sheer down on the Gulf of Sarah's side and in varying slopes to the plains and the Salt Lake on the other. Here again, small things left a vivid impression. The crack of a rifle from the top of the ridge, and a party of British climbing up the rocks and scrub in search of the hidden Turk. I worked up and down the line of squads trying to keep them in touch with each other. We were carrying stretchers, haversacks, iron rations, medical haversacks, medical water bottles filled on Limnus Island, and three monkey boxes or filled medical companions. The stretcher squads worked slowly forward. We passed an old Turkish well with a stone flagged front and a stone trough. Later on, we came upon the trenches and bivouacs of a Turkish sniping headquarters. It was near here that our first man was killed later in the day. He was looking into these bivouacs and was about to crawl out when a bullet went through his brain. It was a sniper's shot. Now came a period of utter stagnation. It was a deadlock. We held the bay, the plain of Anafarta, the Salt Lake, the Kislar Daw, and the Kapanja Cert in a horseshoe. The Turks held the heights of Sari Bear, Anafarta Village, and the hills in a semicircle enclosing us. Nothing happened. We shelled and they shelled every day. Snipers sniped and men got killed, but there was no further advance. Things had remained at a standstill since the first week of the landing. Rumors floated from one unit to another. We are going to make a great attack on the 28th always a fixed date. The Italians are landing troops to help the Australians at Anzac. Every possible absurdity was noised abroad. Orders to pack up, ready for a move, came suddenly. It was now late in September. The wet season was just beginning. The storm clouds were coming up over the hills in great masses of rolling banks, black and forbidding. It grew colder at night, and a cold wind sprang up during the day. And so at last, we got aboard. It was still a profound secret. No one knew whither we were going or why we were leaving the desolation of Sauvla Bay. But everyone was glad. Anything would be better than this barren waste of sand and flies and dead men. That was the last we saw of the bay. Only three months ago we had landed 25,000 strong, and now we numbered about 6,000. A fearful loss, a smashed division. The queer thing is that when I look back upon that great failure— it is not the danger or the importance of the undertaking which is strongly impressed so much as a jumble of smells and sounds and small things. It is just these small things which no author can make up in his study at home. Stay-at-home critics and prophets of war cannot strike just that tiny spark of reality which makes the whole thing live. There was adventure, wild and queer enough, in the Dardanelles campaign to fill a volume of Turkish nights' entertainments, but the people at home know nothing of it. This is the very type of adventure and incident which would have aroused a war-sickened people, which would have rekindled war-weary enthusiasm and patriotism in the land. Maybe most of these accounts of marvelous escapes and cute encounters, secret scoutings, and extraordinary expeditions will lie now forever with the silent dead and the thousands of rounds of ammunition in the silver sand of Suvla Bay. End of section 37. This recording is in the public domain. Section 38 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brittany Bogle. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War, edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 38, Bulgaria Enters the War, 1915, by J. B. W. Gardiner. In preparation for a successful campaign in the Balkans, Germany massed a large army on the Serbian frontier along the Danube and the Drina under command of von Mackensen. When this army was in readiness, Bulgaria mobilized for the attack on Serbia. The order for mobilization was given September 22, 1915. The Bulgars invaded Serbia October 10 and declared war on the Serbs four days later. Greece mobilized but remained neutral, leaving Serbia unaided. Bulgarian armies entered Nish and swept through Macedonia. The Allies went to the assistance of Serbia, but too late to avail. Serbia resisted but was everywhere overwhelmed. The campaign continued until December, when Monastir was captured. The Editor Germany, in order to strike a vital blow at her most formidable enemy, England, looked to the Far East as the scene of her next endeavor. But an offensive in the East would call for a base at Constantinople, and Bulgaria stood in the way. Bulgaria was the bridge between Hungary and Turkey. Without Bulgaria's aid, the Germans could never reach Constantinople. From such information as is at hand, it was not merely a question of getting shell over the Oriental Railroad to the hard-pressed Turks on Gallipoli. The ammunition factory at Topane near Constantinople had a production almost if not quite sufficient to meet the demands of the Gallipoli defenders. Romania had, it is true, refused to permit the passage of shell over her railroads. But it was more than a question of shell. It was a question of a place in the sun through domination of the Oriental Railroad. It was a question of an attack on Egypt, of a thorough reorganization of Turkey and Teuton interests by means of a direct connection with Germany and Austria. Bulgaria alone was in position to furnish such connection and to provide a regular passageway through which free, unhampered communication could be had between Germany and her Muslim ally. With Bulgaria in the field, it remained for the Germanic allies to conquer only the northern part of Serbia, where the Oriental Road runs from Belgrade to Pirot, in order to open a direct route from Berlin to Constantinople. The diplomatic efforts of the Teutons were therefore concentrated on Sofia, and in spite of all the Entente could offer, Bulgaria, early in October, entered the lists on the side of the Central Powers. The opening gun of the campaign against Serbia was fired immediately upon the announcement of Bulgaria's decision. This campaign was essentially different from that in any other field of operations. Germany, as well as her opponents, realized from the outset that it was entirely subsidiary. Victory, no matter how complete, might bring the destruction or the dismemberment of the Serbian army. Under no possible circumstances could it bring a decision. The maximum practical result would be obtained when the Oriental Railroad was under complete control of the Central Powers, which meant the occupation of the northeast corner of Serbia only, involving the railway points of Belgrade, Nish, and Pirot. Any other accomplishment in this field would be purely incidental. The entrance of Bulgaria into the war contributed to the forces of the Teutonic allies, certainly not more than 400,000 men and probably not more than 350,000. The Serbian strength depleted by the Austrian campaign of the previous year and sapped by the typhus scourge which had decimated the population was at that time not more than 250,000 effectives. Opposed to this force were the 350,000 Bulgarians and an equal number of Austrians and Germans. Obviously, therefore, Serbia could not turn back the attack alone, but would have to depend for the backbone of her defense upon assistance obtained from extraneous sources. Her first call was upon Greece, who under the Treaty of Bucharest, which closed the Second Balkan War, was obligated to unite with Serbia in case of attack. The ties of kinship with the German Kaiser proved stronger, however, than treaty obligations, and contrary to the will of the Greek people, King Constantine refused to be bound. 
Serbia then turned to her Western allies, France and England, who, taking advantage of certain leasehold rights in Salonika, which Serbia had acquired by treaty, started a belated movement of troops to that port. When the Teutonic allies attacked, the Serbians were concentrated along the line of the Danube and along the northeastern border, guarding the railroad passes between Serbia and Bulgaria. The British and French contingents, having landed in Salonika, were moving up into Macedonia. As in other campaigns, the military problem involved in this invasion can best find expression in terms of railroads, and in this case was extremely simple. There is in Serbia but one railroad running north and south. This road, entering Serbia at Belgrade, has its other terminus at Monastir. At Uskup, some 70 miles north of Monastir, a branch breaks off to the northwest, running up toward Montenegro. It is obvious, therefore, that the maintenance of this one line was fundamental to the Serbian defense, as it was their single line of retreat and supply, and the one means by which the reinforcements of the Allies could come north from Macedonia. This road was then the objective of both Bulgarian and Teuton armies. While the Teutons were engaged in forcing the passage of the Danube, the Bulgarians struck from the east at practically every pass along the border. Throwing a force into Macedonia from Strumnitsa, they had no trouble in holding the British and French back while penetrating the passes farther north. They reached the railroad at a number of points. The end came soon. The Serbians offered stubborn resistance from the outset, but with their lifeline cut by the Bulgarians, unable to get food, outnumbered at every point, they fell back from point to point until in the last week of December 1915, the Teuton occupation of Serbia was complete. Not a vestige of military force remained. The British and French fell back, now that there was nothing for them to do, and took up a position in front of Salonika, which they strongly fortified. The Serbian army, or its miserable remnant, was either scattered in the wilds of Albania or, having reached the sea, was transported by the Allies to some of the Mediterranean islands to recuperate. Germany had taken her first real step toward a place in the sun. While the Serbians were being driven out of their own country and the entire eastern situation was being got under control by the Teutonic powers, Great Britain was maintaining an army of at least a quarter of a million men on Gallipoli, men who were fighting a series of battles in which there was not one chance in 10,000 of winning. These men could have been used to great advantage in Serbia had the British seen fit to transfer them. But, having undertaken the Gallipoli campaign, they were afraid to let go lest the admission of defeat would cause a loss of prestige among the Mohammedans of the East, where it is essential to the empire that British rule be unquestioned. When it finally became apparent to the British High Command that further fighting on the peninsula was useless and that to acknowledge failure was really the bigger thing to do, Serbia had been overrun and the gates of the East had been opened. End of section 38. This recording is in the public domain. Section 39 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15. The World War, edited by Horatio W. Dresser, Section 39, from Salonica, 1916, by Albert Kin Ross. Salonica has occupied an exceptional position in relation to the war. After the retreat of the remnants of the British Army from Gallipoli, decisive action along the new front established by the Allies at Salonica was long anticipated too late to be of real service salonica was made the base of operations for the relief of serbia the french landed a division there under general sorail but there was no allied commander to coordinate all forces in november nineteen fifteen large allied reinforcements arrived yet they were held in salonica on account of the uncertain situation in greece in december the allied forces began to fortify their quarters and salonica became notable as a blocking point 
rather than as a centre of action the presence of the allies there seriously blocked the plans of the central powers for the conquest of mesopotamia suez and egypt the editor i've been here seven months now and am beginning to feel like an old inhabitant we reached here early in november and now it is june one's main impression of this country if one is a native of northern europe is sunshine and ever sunshine blazing over the slender whiteness of minarets i speak now of the town and not of the moors beyond macedonia like caledonia is stern and wild though i doubt much whether its inhabitants are romantic children we came here in november and had to begin at the beginning luckily there was the harbour and three good keys on them we poured our men our stores and ammunition to say nothing of our mules and horses guns ovens and pontoons how we sorted ourselves all out is still a mystery men slept literally anywhere in the mud in the cold in passable hotels i as an old campaigner had little to complain about i slept in a bed and quite a good bed too after seeing to it that my men were under cover they took it all good-humouredly and so went the first night the next day i had time to skirmish and constituted myself the unit's billeting officer i found rooms for all my friends and the mosquitoes took stock of us they were on the wane however a dying race and only captain f a succulent morsel was pretty properly attacked perhaps some of my own immunity was bought at the cost of a night's rest i was given a dump of canned meat and biscuit a string of motor lorries a herd of native labour and told to feed the division more or less my men and i and the native labour checked and filled up the lorries we worked by some kind of artificial light fed by benzine the native labourers were greek refugees from thrace and asia minor and we shoved them along by signs and plentiful cursing we were five europeans two eighty of these enigmas we half expected them to cut our throats in the dark and make off with the meat and biscuit why they did not do so i have never discovered however about one o'clock in the morning the heavens began to open and the stormy winds to blow out went our flimsy lights down came the rain a lorry driver returned from up country reported a bridge carried away and all the rest of the lorries stuck it seemed about time to close the shop the piece of waste land which was the scene of this first act had now become a swamp the darkness was illuminated only by flashes of lightning we were all wet to the skin so i gave the signal to retire which was obeyed with alacrity home i floundered to bed leaving the division to the unconsumed portion of its emergency ration nor did the division take much hurt i can see it bivouacked huddled together wet and muddy snoring blissfully too tired to grouse so much for chaos to-day the swamp where i worked on that first night is drained and firm good roads lead to it good roads run away inland and climb the hills the flimsy bridges of yesterday are replaced by work unknown in macedonia since the days of the roman legionaries and the legionaries of the allies now repose in cities of wood and canvas pitched in the shadow of prehistoric tumuli or covering hillsides more ancient still down in the dusty plain too are our legions and even in the sun-baked marshland to the east serb french and british and at one point scores of canadians the retreat and the four air raids are the only things that have happened since we came here except for our troubles with the greek government which while i write june three seem to be exceptionally flourishing outside this quiet room allied troops and marines are moving to positions before the prefecture and post office and i dare say that by the time this letter is read the administration of greek macedonia will be in the capable hands of general sorail the retreat of the allies from serbia made most of us sit up it was a very breathless business of which the full story will be told in time the men that came down were pretty well spent spent to the world in fact and rather relieved to find themselves alive 
of the four air raids i have a somewhat closer knowledge the first was just a pretty picture seen against a cloudless sky the taubes we always call them taubes looked like wicked moths playing amid white puffs of shrapnel they did little damage and soon retired the first zeppelin was a sterner foe he came when we were all innocently asleep and at two o'clock in the morning waking or sleeping a man's courage is not at its proudest i was billeted at that time in a little smelly house of three floors and six apartments the house was packed with the original tenants jew and greek together with such lodgers as myself in our flat of four rooms and a kitchen were the landlord and his lady four sons and two daughters the sons slept on the sitting-room floor and if you came home in the dark you were likely to tread on them two french officers shared the best bedroom while i slept alone in the second best bang 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 went the bombs from the zeppelin the french officers cried en bas and the boys banged at my door yelling en bro which is greek for forwards as it didn't seem to matter much where one went the whole thing failing dugouts being purely a question of luck i stayed in bed and touched wood the crashes of the big bombs were terrifying the house shook with each explosion but as all things good or bad must come to an end so too after a while ended this business a wonderful orange-coloured blaze lit up the world outside and so i got out of bed and watched it deciding at last to dress and see things at close quarters most of the year the war has shifted from this quarter and apart from the gunners whose thunders punctuate the writing of these notes and sketches we are all busy with routine work which save for a higher pressure is very like the work of peace incidentally i may say that since i began this paper i have shifted toward the serbian frontier a line of lakes and hills and am now encamped in a paradise of pied meadows ever-changing butterflies and plentiful tortoises i sit out of doors in the never-failing sunshine and continue bang go the guns and miles away in the bulgar lines you see the smoke that follows the bursting of the heavy shells our business all winter was to make this possible to me now looking back it was chiefly a matter of lost sleep of lorries going endlessly up country night and day and of brother officers here and there getting very ragged about the nerves much of that time i was on night duty and an agreeable feature of my work was that it brought me into close contact with the navy our senior service unlike our army was ready for war was indeed seemingly ready for anything and everybody here no improvisation was needed a sailor is a sailor whether he belong to the grand fleet or be only the humble master of a trawler gunnery is but an added virtue the discipline and craftsmanship are there already the fleet out here and by fleet i mean every conceivable kind of vessel had mainly been switched on from gallipoli and from lighter to battleship was full of stories and escapes that now are history the transports interested me more than the fighting units they came and went so pluckily with but the slightest means of defence hardly one that had not its tale of a submarine and often of several here and there one met the submarined now serving on another vessel out again they would go making strange courses running through the darkest nights without a light coming here i had ten days of similar expectancy enough to last me a lifetime these seamen take such journeyings as the normal with loads of responsibility and possible boards of inquiry that may cost them their career as an added burden more seriously interesting than personal fancies is the active quality of the entente which one discovers in salonica in france the two armies were separated here they mingle on the western front the belgians held their section of the line then came the british and below them was the great french section one hardly met a belgian or a french soldier except by accident here in macedonia we mingle freely in fact are arriving at friendships that must survive the war and the ridiculous thing out here is the way we go discovering one another from a hundred british mouths i have heard that what a wonderful army is that of our ally and that if we were one-tenth part as efficient and so forth and so forth and again from my french friends i hear how wonderfully organized is the army of great britain and if theirs were one-tenth part as well equipped and found and so forth and so forth both parties are quite sincere in some points each army takes the lead and it is on a few such points that we fasten nor must it be forgotten that the art of war is essentially a french art and that in the mathematical side of war as exemplified let us say by gunnery and fortification 
the world has never known their betters this scientific intensity of the good french soldier has rather surprised us of the new armies as it must surprise any other body of amateurs be they british chinese or american in aviation to the frenchmen when our unstinted admiration partly because they have taken over the whole of that side of our common effort and partly on account of the splendid human material which they employ in this heroic arm it interested me vastly to discover that many of the french observers were young painters in normal times and really far more preoccupied with art than with aerial duels young boutet de montval for instance is such an one he has accounted for two taubes and will i hope account for more this was shortly after the naval gunners had brought down the zeppelin i assisted at that strange spectacle and have since lost all faith in such engines of terror it is rather tempting providence to say so for while i write the anti-aircraft guns on the other side of the hill are popping away at herr taub who may take a fancy to the half-mile of infantry going by on the road in column of four bands playing and totally indifferent to the hovering pursuer the zeppelin however is a different proposition the first time it came we all stood by helpless and gasped the second time we were ready and then all we had to do was to blind it with a sun of searchlights that stabbed it straight in the eye to tell the truth the salonica campaign always barring the retreat is child's play to what most of us underwent in france what we actually have done and that in itself is a notable feat has been to turn a wilderness into a country fit for settlement and permanent occupation every day now i ride out on new-made roads planned by the allied engineers and made by the allied infantry the villages i pass are tragic with ruined houses and the desolation wrought by turk and kamataji there are villages made dead by massacre and fire and others half standing and half destroyed in some new houses have been built since the greeks took over and in almost all at this season you see that great bird the stork sitting on her huge nest really once the mountains overpassed it is a beautiful country fine in climate rich in soil the splendid pasturages and now so full of good roads new light railways and other connections as to be within easy access of the town and sea End of section thirty nine section forty of the world war read for librivox dot org by devora allen the world war part six the war in asia and africa historical note the war in the far east began early in august nineteen fourteen with the successful campaign of the japanese against the germans and the capture of kiao chow the Japanese fleet also aided the Allies in the pursuit of German raiders and the protection of the seas in the Far East. Another phase of the war in Asia began with fighting between the Russians and Turks in Armenia, and later in Persia. Still another campaign started with the landing of British troops in Basra province, November 15th, and the occupation of Turba Arabia by troops from India. A prolonged campaign in the vicinity of Kut el Amara led at last to British success, and eventually to the fall of Baghdad. Turkish plans for the conquest of the Suez Canal and Egypt met with defeat, and in due time the British were in a position to begin a successful campaign in the Holy Land. When the war began, the German colonial possessions in Africa amounted to more than a million square miles, including Togo, Cameroon, Southwest Africa, and East Africa. In August 1914, the French and British forces joined in attacking Togo, which lies between French and English colonies, and on August 26, their occupation was complete. Thus, 33,000 square miles passed out of Germany's hands. Cameroon, about ten times as large as Togo, and lying in the elbow of the Gulf of Guinea, was the next to be attacked. The French victories began in January 1915. Molundu was captured by the Allies March 19th, and the Germans in a general retreat were forced to leave the plateau in the center of the colony. The British and French forces continued winning minor victories throughout 1915. Meanwhile, the war had extended into East Africa. The Germans began the campaign by trying to seize Mombasa, the commercial capital of British East Africa. 
Shirati, on Lake Victoria Nyanza, was attacked and taken by the British in January 1915. And the fighting in the lake region continued until June 25th, when the British successfully assailed Bukoba, a fortified German port. End of section 40. This recording is in the public domain. Section 41 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brittany Bogle. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War, edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 41, The Attack on Tsingtao, 1914, by Jefferson Jones. The campaign in the Far East began with the proclamation by the Japanese government that Japan would prepare for war in behalf of England, August 4th. Two days later, the Germans began to fortify Qingtao, and the next day, Japanese warships appeared off the coast. On the 16th, Japan sent an ultimatum to Germany, demanding the withdrawal of the German fleet in far eastern waters and the giving up of Kiaochao. Germany rejected Japan's demands, and the Kaiser ordered resistance at Kiaochao, August 22nd. Japan declared war on Germany the following day, and the Germans began action on the 24th by blowing up bridges to halt the Japanese invasion. The first Japanese troops were landed on the 30th. Two islands were occupied the next day, and seven more on September 3rd. After several minor actions, Qingtao was invested September 29th. The city was in flames November 1st. The Japanese captured German guns and prisoners on the 4th, and November 6th, the fortress was surrendered by the Germans. The following account of the attack is by a correspondent of the Minneapolis Journal and the Japan Advertiser, the editor. Japanese Headquarters, Shantung, November 2nd. I have seen war from a grandstand seat. I never before heard of the possibility of witnessing a modern battle the attack of warships, the fire of infantry and artillery, the maneuvering of airships over the enemy's lines, the rolling up from the rear of reinforcements and supplies, all at one sweep of the eye. Yet after watching for three days the siege of Qingtao from a position on Prince Heinrich Berg, 1,000 feet above the sea level and but three miles from the beleaguered city, I am sure that there is actually such a thing as a theater of war. On October 31st, the date of the anniversary of the birth of the Emperor of Japan, the actual bombardment of Qingtao began. All of the residents of the little Chinese village of Chengsun, where was fixed on that day the acting staff headquarters of the Japanese troops, had been awakened early in the morning by the roar of a German aeroplane over the village. Everyone quickly dressed and after a hasty breakfast went out to the southern edge of the village to gaze towards Qingtao. A great black column of smoke was arising from the city and hung like a pall over the besieged. At first glance, it seemed that one of the neighboring hills had turned into an active volcano and was emitting this column of smoke, but it was soon learned that the oil tanks in Qingtao were on fire. As the bombardment was scheduled to start late in the morning, we were invited to accompany members of the staff of the Japanese and British Expeditionary Forces on a trip to Prince Heinrich Berg, there to watch the investment of the city. It was about a three-mile journey to this mountain, which had been the scene of some severe fighting between the German and Japanese troops earlier in the month. When we arrived at the summit, there was the theater of war laid out before us like a map. To the left were the Japanese and British cruisers in the Yellow Sea, preparing for the bombardment. Below was the Japanese battery stationed near the Meeker House, which the Germans had burned in their retreat from the mountains. Directly ahead was the city of Qingtao, with the Austrian cruiser Kaiser and Elizabeth steaming about in the harbor, while to the right one could see the Kiaochao coast and central forts and redoubts and the entrenched Japanese and British camps. We had just couched ourselves comfortably between some large jagged rocks where we felt sure we were not in a direct line with the enemy's guns, when suddenly there was a flash as if someone had turned a large golden mirror in the field down below to the right. A little column of black smoke drifted away from one of the Japanese trenches, and a minute later those of us on the peak of Prince Heinrich heard the sharp report of a field gun. 
Gentlemen, the show has started, said the British captain as he removed his cap and started adjusting his opera glass. No sooner had he said this than the reports of guns came from all directions with a continuous rumble as if a giant bowling alley were in use. Everywhere, the valley at the rear of Qingtao was alive with golden flashes from discharging guns and at the same time great clouds of bluish-white smoke would suddenly spring up around the German batteries where some Japanese shell had burst. Over near the greater harbor of Qingtao, we could see flames licking up the Standard Oil Company's large tanks. We afterwards learned that these had been set on fire by the Germans and not by the bursting shell. And then the warships in the Yellow Sea opened fire on Iltis Fort, and for three hours we continually played our glasses on the field, on Qingtao, and on the warships. With glasses on the central redoubt of the Germans, we watched the effects of the Japanese fire until the boom of guns from the German Fort A on a little peninsula jutting out from the Kiaochao Bay toward the east attracted our attention there. We could see the big siege gun on this fort rise up over the bunker, aim at a warship, fire, and then quickly go down again. And then we would turn our eyes toward the warships in time to see a fountain of water 200 yards from a vessel where the shell had struck. We scanned the city of Qingtao, the 150-ton crane in the greater harbor, which we had seen earlier in the day, and which was said to be the largest crane in the world, had disappeared, and only its base remained standing. A Japanese shell had carried away the crane. But this first day's firing of the Japanese investing troops was mainly to test the range of the different batteries. The attempt also was made to silence the line of forts extending in the east from Iltis Hill near the wireless and signal stations at the rear of Qingtao to the coast fort near the burning oil tank on the west. In this, they were partly successful, two guns at Iltis Fort being silenced by the guns at sea. On November 1st, the second day of the bombardment, we again stationed ourselves on the peak of Prince Heinrich Berg. From the earliest hours of morning, the Japanese and British forces had kept up a continuous fire on the German redoubts in front of the Iltis, Moltke, and Bismarck forts. And when we arrived at our seats, it seemed as though the shells were dropping around the German trenches every minute. Particularly on the redoubt of Taichung Chen was the Japanese fire heavy. And by early afternoon, through field glasses, this German redoubt appeared to have had an attack of smallpox. So pitted was it from the holes made by bursting Japanese shells. By nightfall, many parts of the German redoubts had been destroyed, together with some machine guns. The result was the advancing of the Japanese line several hundred yards from the bottom of the hills where they had rested earlier in the day. It was not until the third day of the bombardment that those of us stationed on Prince Heinrich observed that our theater of war had a curtain, a real asbestos one, that screened the fire in the drops directly ahead of us from our eyes. We had learned that the theater was equipped with pits, drops, a gallery for onlookers, exits, and an orchestra of booming cannon and rippling, roaring pom-poms, but that nature had provided it with a curtain. That was something new to us. We had reached the summit of the mountain about 11 a.m., just as some heavy clouds, evidently disturbed by the bombardment during the previous night, were dropping down into Litsen Valley and in front of Qingtao. For three hours we sat on the peak, shivering in a blast from the sea, and all the while wondering just what was being enacted beyond the curtain. The firing had suddenly ceased, and with the filmy haze before our eyes we conjured up pictures of the Japanese troops making the general attack upon Iltis Fort evidently the key to Qingtao, while the curtain of the theater of war was down. By early afternoon the clouds lifted, and with glasses we were able to distinguish fresh sappings of the Japanese infantry near to the German redoubts. The Japanese guns, which the day before were stationed below us to the left, near the Meeker house, had advanced half a mile and were on the road just outside the village of Taiyao. Turning our glasses on Kiao Chao Bay, we discovered that the Kaiser and Elizabeth was missing, nor did a search of the shoreline reveal her. Whether she was blown up by the Germans or had hidden behind one of the islands, I do not know. All the guns were silent now, and the British captain said, Well, chaps, shall we take advantage of the intermission? A half hour later, we were down the mountain and riding homeward toward Shangtun. To understand fully the operations of the Japanese troops in Shantung during the present Far Eastern War, one must be acquainted with the topography of this peninsula, as well as with the conditions that exist for the successful movements of the troops. 
Since the disembarkation of the Japanese army on September 2nd, everything had seemingly favored the Germans. The country, which is unusually mountainous, offering natural strongholds for resisting the invading army, is practically devoid of roads in the hinterland. To add to this difficulty, the last two months in Shantung have seen heavy rains and floods, which have really aided in holding off the ultimate fall of Kiao Chao. One had only to see the road from Lanshan over Makung Pass, on which the Japanese troops were forced to rely for their supplies, partly to understand the reason for the German garrison at Xingtao still holding out. The road, especially near the base, is nothing but a sea of clay, in which the military carts sink up to their hubs. Frequent rains every week keep the roadway softened up and thus render it necessary for the Japanese infantry to rebuild it and to construct drainage ditches in order that there may be no delay in getting supplies and ammunition to the troops at the front. The physical characteristics of Kiao Chao make it an ideal fortress. The entrance of the bay is nearly two miles wide and is commanded by hills rising 600 feet directly in the rear of Qingtao. The ring of hills that surrounds the city does not extend back into the hinterland, and thus there is no screen behind which the Japanese forces can quickly invest the city. Germany has utilized the semicircle of hills in the construction of large concrete forts equipped with Krupp guns of 14 and 16 inch caliber, which for four or five miles back into the peninsula command all approaches to the city. The Japanese army in approaching Qingtao has had to do so practically in the open. The troops found no hills behind which they could, with safety, mount heavy siege guns without detection by the German garrison. In fact, the strategic plan for the capture of the town has been much like the plan adopted by the Japanese forces at Port Arthur. They have forced their approach by sappings. While this is a gradual method, it is certain of victory in the end and results in very little loss of life. The natural elevations of the Iltis, Bismarck, and Moltke forts at the rear of Qingtao have another advantage in that they are so situated that they are commanded by at least two other forts. All of the guns have been placed so that they can be turned on their neighbor if the occasion arises. A Japanese aeroplane soaring over Qingtao on October 30th scattered thousands of paper handbills on which was printed the following announcement in German from the staff headquarters. To the honored officers and men in the fortress, it is against the will of God as well as the principles of humanity to destroy and render useless arms, ships of war, merchantmen, and other works and constructions not in obedience to the necessity of war, but merely out of spite, lest they fall into the hands of the enemy. Trusting as we do that as you hold dear the honor of civilization, you will not be betrayed into such base conduct. We beg you, however, to announce to us your own view as mentioned above. End of section 41. This recording is in the public domain. Section 42 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 42. Campaigning under Botha. 1915 by Cyril Campbell. General Botha's campaign in Southwest Africa began September 27, 1914, when troops of the Union of South Africa entered German territory. On December 25th, Walfish Bay was occupied, and January 14, 1915, Swakopmund fell into Botha's hands. Oss, an important trading station, was next to fall, April 1st. Then Warmbad, April 6th. Windhoek, the capital, May 12th, and July 9th. General Botha accepted from Governor Seitz the surrender of all forces in Southwest Africa. Hostilities then ceased and the campaign came to a close. The Editor It is not surprising that the magnitude of the operations in both the European theaters of war should overshadow the campaign which is at present in progress of the German colony of Southwest Africa. Nevertheless, the task which lies before General Botha's troops is no light one. It is no petty colonial expedition as can be judged from the fact with the exception of a Rhodesian contingent and a few frontiersmen, South Africa has sent practically no troops to the help of the mother country. This has been made the subject of malicious comment by a few short-sighted English critics, whereas it really bears out the fact that the Union troops need every man they can place in the field to complete their own share of the work, which the British Empire is engaged. To reduce a country of an area of 320,000 square miles in itself is a big undertaking. But when, in addition, that country is protected, 
not only by trained white troops, but by every natural and artificial barrier, to say nothing of an infernal climate, the difficulties of that undertaking are magnified tenfold. It was a dull morning with streaks of low-lying cloud, and we were stretched out for an after-breakfast smoke, when we heard that a peculiar buzzing, humming noise which heralds the approach of a high-powered aeroplane. We could see nothing for the clouds, and though we should have reasoned that it was equally impossible for the pilot to see us through that opaque mass, the presence of that invisible foe overhead made our hearts beat in a very irregular fashion. Unluckily, we had no high-elevation guns at the time, and so we all knew that as long as he kept out of rifle fire, we were absolutely at his mercy. It was a most unpleasant experience. Suddenly, a little puff of wind made a big rift in the cloud, and there right above us, at about 5,000 feet, was the Tauba monoplane, exactly like a monstrous bird. For a second or so, we all stared as if fascinated by this grim, ominous thing. Then realization came to us, and I saw men who had never blenched at shrapnel or the murderous hail of machine guns turn pale and lick dry lips with an even drier tongue. Even as I gazed, I saw a tiny object fall from its underside, and to my horror, I could have sworn that it was falling straight on me. Though I learned afterwards from a man hundred yards away, that they had precisely the same idea themselves. The round thing shot down, gradually increasing in size, until it fell about 20 yards from our little group, bursting with a loud report and covering us with sand. One man was killed and three wounded, and then rage somehow mastered our terror. Rage which was only intensified by our knowledge of our own pitiful helplessness. Rifles went off, but it was useless. In quick succession, three other bombs fell. Luckily, only one exploded, wounding two more men and killing a mule. Curiously enough, the horses stood the noose of a tractor without showing any signs of stampeding. Then the machine wheeled round, went off at a great pace, and was soon lost to the sight over the distant hills. It was a trying experience, and though it is quite true that one soon gets callous to ordinary shell fire and rifle fire, I don't believe that I shall ever view a bombardment from the air with equanimity. Certainly there is less danger than one would expect if one lies flat, but the feeling of the machine lurking above keeps one's terror alive. Next morning, about the same time, the lookout on the observation tank called out. Aeroplane just coming over the neck, the narrow cut in the hills. And as we looked eastward, there sure enough it was, a tiny speck in the sky. During the night, we had hurried up a heavy field piece, and the officer in charge ordered it up in position. When it had come within range, the gunners let the pilot have it with shrapnel, and the first shell was aimed beautifully. But alas, the fuse had been timed a second too late, and burst when it had passed some 50 yards beyond. Even that distance, I could see the machine rock and sway dizzily, owing to the air concussion. The next second it dropped dead like a stone, probably owing to an air hole caused by the explosion. And I began to realize that fighting in the air must be as terrifying a job for the pilot as it is for the men below on whom the airmen rain bombs. With great skill, the pilot steadied the machine and at once rose to a great height, just missing two shells, which had been nicely timed, but were aimed too low for his rapid ascent. His narrow escape seemed to have embittered him, for, after making a wide swoop, he came over our camp from the rear and went directly overhead, a position which rendered our field guns useless. He dropped five bombs, three of which exploded, killing as many men and wounding six more. These last two days had shown the Union troops how sadly handicapped they were from the lack of even one aeroplane. In another week, we were to learn that we needed another item of war equipment if our advance was to be pushed on appreciably. It was decided that a station some miles away should be occupied, since from there it would be easy to send out some reconnaissance parties and gain an idea of the defenses of Aus. The place was seized next day by a strong party, but owing to the lack of water, it was decided that the main body should retire on 51 kilometer station and that the new post be held at a small party, who should be relieved every other day, the traveling being done mainly by night. On the third day of our occupation, however, a strong reconnaissance force left 81 km station and advanced toward the pass through the hills on the farther side, which lies Aus, standing on the extreme edge of fertile land of the hinterland. We were greeted by a smart fire by some machine guns, but after a brisk engagement, we drove their outposts back and the Germans retired on Aus. For an hour, we scanned the place through field glasses and perceived certain ominous but insignificant looking mounds of earth close to the town, which looked suspiciously like modern fortifications. Our surmise soon received direct proof, as a minute or two later the guns, a far heavier caliber than we had given the enemy credit for possessing, spoke, and a shell or two exploded uncomfortably near. 
Further evidence of the remarkable thoroughness of the German military preparations was shown by a great cloud of dust coming up to Aus from the interior, plainly raised by a column of troops along one of the military roads mentioned earlier in the article. It was quite obvious that the outpost with which we had been in contact was connected with headquarters by telephone, and no time had been lost in demanding reinforcements from Kebab or some other port. The proof of these defenses in Aus came as a most unwelcome surprise, as we had no guns capable of demolishing the fortifications and silencing their guns. Their existence, moreover, is only more convincing evidence of the ultimate aim to which the German occupation of this colony tended. Any argument that were constructed for defense against the natives is too absurd, since fortifications equal to any demand against natives could have been constructed at a tenth of the cost and labor necessary to erect these. This discovery, moreover, leads to another and most disconcerting conclusion. If the Germans have taken the trouble to equip in such an elaborate manner aus, which in itself is not strategically important save as regards its entrance to the fertile Hinchelin, it is impossible to avoid the deduction of the Keetmanshoop, which is the strategical key of the railways and Winhoek. The capital and wireless installation center are even more heavily fortified. After being present at this check on our advance against Aus, I returned to Ludertsbucht and went up in a transport to Walfish Bay, where arrangements were being made for the first attack on Swakopmund, though little real resistance was expected, since it was believed that the town had been evacuated. We set out in the evening, and after a march of some 16 miles, found ourselves on the outskirts of town, we then advanced cautiously. On reaching the main square, we halted, halted suspiciously, for each one of us had an uneasy feeling of imminent danger. Suddenly, the officer in charge cried, Down on your faces, lads! and flung himself flat. And a few seconds later, a hundred yards in front of us, earth heaved up in one awful convulsion. There was a deafening roar and blinding flash, and at the moment each of us, lying flat though he was, felt as if he had received a stunning blow in the face and on the shoulders. It was the air shock caused by the explosion. Luckily, no one was hurt, and we soon scrambled up and were congratulating ourselves on a narrow escape. I asked the captain in charge of our detachment what had led him to suspect the existence of a landmine, but he could only explain that he felt something was close. At the moment, we thought it had been time to go off at a certain minute, which by sheer luck coincided with our arrival, and it was only the next day we discovered that the wires leading to it and to a second mine, which also exploded harmlessly, came from a little hut three miles inland, from which the Germans must have watched our progress, throwing us again. The two railway lines from Swakopmund, which are linked together by a cross line before the lower one swerves down toward Windhoek, were both destroyed as systematically as the one starting from Luderitzburg toward Aus, and a reconnaissance patrol which had been sent out reported that the same damage was visible as far as they dared advance. Therefore, any progressive movement from this place must be extremely slow, while well, it was almost certain that the invasion would be held up by the fortification and big guns of Windhoek. In this case, the certainty of a similar deadlock along the southern line of advance, that is, from Ludert's booked to Aus, would mean that both columns would be faced with a siege, although handicapped by the absence of an even pretense of a siege train. The situation was therefore critical, especially as there was always the danger that the remnants of the rebel commandos under Maritz might burst into sporadic activity along the southeastern frontier. Fortunately, this danger was lessened by the complete failure of the rebel attack on Uppington and the subsequent surrender of Kemp. Moreover, it was ascertained from the prisoners taken there that Maritz was not on good terms with German leaders, and that his surrender might be expected shortly. The raids of the rebels, however, had given the general staff an object lesson. Even if they were acquainted with all the water holes in the German frontier, still the distance from the border to Uppington was greater than that which would have to be accomplished if a flying column were dispatched from Schweet Drift or to Raymond's Drift, to seize Warmbid. For such an expedition, Port Nolith would be exceedingly useful as a base of operations on the one side, since supplies could be landed there and then pushed forward to Steinkopf, which is only about 20 miles from Raymond's Drift. In fact, from Steinkopf to Warmbad is only 60 to 70 miles, which could easily be covered by a flying column in two days. From the interior, the concentration of supplies and men is not so easy, and it would entail a lot of trouble to collect enough material at Uppington, once it would have to be transferred to Schwit Drift. 17 miles from there is a place named Noose, where good water can be found, and another flying column should manage the 65-mile rush on Warmbad from there easily enough. Once Warmbad is occupied, supplies could be transferred there without much difficulty, and then a gradual advance could be made towards Seeheim, thus cutting the railway communication between Aus and Keetmanshoop and the interior. 
As the name suggests, Ormbed has some natural springs, so that the water problem which has proved great difficulty in the campaign would have no further terrors. It is certainly true that the military roads inside the Great Railway Loop would still be available for reinforcements and supplies, but with the enormous numerical superiority of the Union troops, it would be a simple matter merely to invest Aus. Since the occupation of Seeheim, any westward advance on the part of invading force would be through the fertile pastures which form a startling contrast to the grim and sterile exterior. The split between German leaders and Kemp, Maritz, and the remainder of the rebels, which has already led to the surrender of Kemp, will certainly facilitate the progress of operations, but the ultimate reduction of the country will be, nevertheless, a tedious business. The object of the campaign is not one of territorial aggrandizement, though the acquisition of the country will bring some material reward, since it is not wholly composed of sand and desert, as is popularly believed. Every man, however, who takes part in the work will have the higher satisfaction of knowing that his reward is the accomplishment of duty to humanity. End of section 42. This recording is in the public domain. Read by Kuya Carrot, May 13th. Section 43 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War, edited by Horatio W. Dresser. Section 43, General Smuts's Campaign in German East Africa, 1914-1915, by Cyril Campbell the history of operations in east africa during nineteen fourteen and nineteen fifteen affords little but a meagre record of sporadic raids isolated bush fights and attacks on blockhouses the result on the whole being in favor of the germans who at the beginning of this year still occupied a small section of british territory as regards naval warfare they had less cause for self-congratulation as their surprise of the pegasus in zanzibar had been completely offset by the bombardment of dar es salaam and the bottling up and destruction of the kernensburg in the rufji river it was plain however that the germans would not be left for long in enjoyment of their partial success and the conclusion of the campaign in southwest africa left the union free to assist the mother country in another theatre the imperial government first invited the enrollment of an overseas contingent and it was only when this had been dispatched to europe that attention was concentrated on german east africa a detachment of home troops under general smith dorian was sent out and those south africans who for various reasons had been unable to volunteer for europe were delighted at the prospect of serving under one of the heroes of mons but this was not to be on landing at cape town smith dorian's health became impaired and by the time he had reached johannesburg to confer with smuts who had already offered his services he fell seriously ill and was unable to take up his command in selecting a substitute the imperial government was happily inspired for smuts was at once offered the appointment with the rank of full general in the british army this further mark of confidence in the dutch was hailed enthusiastically throughout the country and it was confidently hoped that he would accomplish his arduous task as brilliantly as his colleague botha had done in germany's sister colony the physical character of the country to be attacked to say nothing of its evil reputation as the haunt of the tsetse fly that dread enemy of horses and cattle had persuaded the military authorities in the beginning to employ only infantry but at the eleventh hour it was felt that the innate genius of the south african for mounted tactics should at least be given a trial and the first batch of troops had hardly been landed at kilindini the port of mombasa when a mounted brigade was raised and taken up anything more different from the campaign in which most of the south african troops had taken part a few months previously than the one on which they were now embarked could not be imagined instead of the arid sandy tracts of german southwest africa they found a country covered with thick bush while on the southern horizon kilimanjaro within a few degrees of the equator raised its snow-capped peak nearly 
twenty thousand feet above sea level the first march was to mbayuni where a light railway was already in process of construction from maktau to be continued up to the german frontier the advance guard waited for the arrival of the other arms and a reconnaissance in force was directed against salaita hill which revealed the enemy in great strength upon the eastern slopes of kilimanjaro the terrain was very difficult and the men deployed against the german position received a severe grueling from pom-poms and mountain guns which were admirably placed and difficult to locate shortly after this general smuts arrived in person and at once decided to employ the traditional tactics of south africa used in the first instance by tchaka the lion of the zulus who based his idea on the horns of a bull and enveloped his enemy by a double outflanking movement before driving home the impis stationed in his centre acting on this principle smuts directed the mounted brigade based north of kilimanjaro to sweep along the western foothills of the mountain and concentrated his forces for a thrust at moshi the terminus of the tonga kilimanjaro railway the second position taken up by the germans in their retirement was as formidable as nature could produce lying behind the lumi they were protected in front by seven miles of dense bush on the right by the para mountains and the swamps of the ruwu and on the left by the dangerous broken spurs of kilimanjaro by a very arduous night march through the bush the south african troops secured the passage of the lumi and a dash made by some mounted men resulted in the occupation of chala hill and other positions dominating taveta and salaita as the enemy were found to hold their line in great strength the infantry brigades on march eleventh were ordered to attack the precipitous bush-clad hills of riata and latima which formed the main position the ground at this point was covered with a thick thorny scrub which rendered an advance difficult and afforded little shelter from the rain of projectiles poured forth from guns of all calibers from the tiny pom-pom to naval guns salved from the konensberg what endless toil and labor their transport and emplacement must have cost the germans and their native auxiliaries the swamps and forest alone can tell a base camp had been formed at Kajiado, about forty-five miles south of nairobi on the branch line from magadi junction and from there on march ninth the mechanical transport started on his way the cars had all travelled down to their base by road through the masai district the paradise of the big game hunter wildebeest buffalo zebras giraffes kongoni thompson gazelles reed buck and steinbach were to be seen in thousands at first roads were practically non-existent the modern motor-car however is not to be stopped by the ordinary difficulties of belt travel though a series of very bad sluits necessitated the rescue of some cars stalled through carburetor and magneto trouble the third stage from x to y led through great forests and black swamps of evil reputation to cross which a corduroy road of logs was constructed from the abundant timber of the neighbourhood the advance guard was composed of cavalry a sprinkling of infantry and a mountain battery it was the boast of this latter that it could bring a gun into action within forty-five seconds and find its range by the third shot the men are recruited from a particular district of india the regiment is very proud of its record and jealousy resents the enlistment of outsiders entrance to the ranks being an hereditary privilege after this advance guard came the general staff and the main body guarding the principal convoy the rear guard composed mainly of colored troops was preceded by a second convoy the ammunition supply and the motor-car section attached to the artillery the duty of which was to keep the guns provided with shells the actual advance into moshi was preceded by heavy bombardment of five hours but no resistance was offered when the troops entered as the place had been evacuated once however the invaders were fairly established in the town the germans who had taken up new positions on hills commanding the station opened up with their artillery early in the morning another engagement ensued which secured moshi though not without heavy losses the enemy were now in a somewhat precarious situation their line of retreat toward tonga was no longer safe since at any moment they might be headed off by the mounted brigade occupying moshi but any doubt as to the course of action which they ought to pursue was settled by smuts's next move detaching a force to his left rear along the tonga railway to prevent the germans breaking back on to british soil he concentrated his main body which had been employed in the thrust in moshi and dispatched von der venter the hero of the lightning cavalry raid across the deserts of german southwest africa to make a dash dead west 
on arusha a junction commanding the caravan roads to moshi dar es salam and nairobi the germans had now split up into small bands making for their main rail artery from tanganyika to the coast and one scattered unit taking advantage of a prepared position tried to bar van der venter's way after a brief engagement they broke leaving one of the guns of the ill-fated konensberg in british hands and van der venter occupied arusha without further hindrance in this way smuts's tactics had proved completely successful and one cannot do better than quote the concluding passage of his own dispatch during these operations the enemy has been severely defeated and has been flung south of the ruru river we have cleared him finally out of british territory and we are now in occupation of the healthiest and most valuable settled parts of german east africa comprising the kilimanjaro and meru areas meanwhile the cordon is being drawn closer and closer to west and southwest they are barred by the chain drawn through rhodesia to the belgian congo while the entry of portugal into the war has not only closed the one remaining frontier but has put an end to the surreptitious smuggling of supplies landed at byra in soi-disant neutral bottoms moreover the prospects of a guerrilla warfare can scarcely be said to be inviting since the germans would be pitted against men who are past masters of that game and the prussian school of war with its doctrine of iron discipline and suppression of all initiative is the last training likely to turn out soldiers who can maintain dashing operations and unconventional tactics within a few weeks general smuts has completely altered the whole aspect of this minor campaign and the whole secret of his success is mobility a study of the two african colonial campaigns affords a striking similarity despite the difference of the physical characteristics of the two countries in this campaign mobility has neutralized all the elaborately prepared defensive positions of the enemy which became untenable owing to the menace on flank and rear it was a maxim of stonewall jackson's that mobility and secrecy were the two essentials of successful strategy and he acted up to his words by attacking his enemy where he was least expected aerial reconnaissance has robbed the modern general of much of his chances of secrecy but smuts has shown that speed and mobility properly applied can still play a most important part in modern war the success of his operations was facilitated by the accuracy of the information obtained by his intelligence department and air scouts and in all his movements he gave evidence that peace and politics have not blunted the skill which he displayed a decade and a half ago when he led a cavalry raid through the cape province until his burghers rode their horses down to the beaches of the atlantic a final word as to the composition of the victorious army not since the days of the roman empire has a force of such diverse peoples creeds and castes been gathered together under one standard but whereas saxon and gaul scythian and iberian dacian and numidian follow the eagles through compulsion or in hope of loot the various types under smuts englishmen and dutchmen canadian australian south african indian and hausa are fighting for liberty and history teaches us that in the long run the defender of liberty wins the day the fighting in east africa did not come to an end with general smuts's campaign but continued intermittently an official report from london november twenty one nineteen seventeen reported the sustained pursuit of the remaining german forces during which nearly one thousand prisoners were captured important positions occupied and the last heavy gun remaining in german possession in the colony taken intact the report indicated that the remainder of the enemy was being driven into the kitangari valley december fourth it was announced in london that east africa had been completely cleared of the enemy four thousand four hundred and three prisoners have been taken prisoners end of section forty three